we uh, start this um, meeting, uh, members know this, but anybody who might be watching, uh, this is the uh, work session that the council does every year after the committees have finished with their markups of the budgets. Uh, so we're nearing the uh, final stages with regard to, or we are in the final stages with regard to uh, consideration of the fiscal year 2015 budget. That's the uh, fiscal year starts October 1st. Um, I want to, uh, and, and this meeting is uh, being televised, as members know, anybody who's here, I guess anybody who's watching knows that it's televised as well. I want to remind members that although I'm told that the control room will only have the mic on that is the person who's speaking, we should just be careful that conversations that we love to have amongst ourselves, there might be a live mic, and we should be mindful of that. Um, no dirty jokes, Councilmember Wells. Uh, yes, dirty jokes, Councilmember Che. Um, the uh, lunch will be available, I believe, at 12:30, and it will be in the ante room to the chamber. And I guess anybody who's in this room knows that uh, everybody's coming in just to kind of maximize seating, uh, coming in through the ante room <coughs> rather than the door directly into the hallway. Um, we may complete this work session today, uh, but I'd ask if members would have tomorrow available as well, and we'll decide that as a group at the end of today's meeting. I expect we will spend most of our time, if not all of it, going through the uh, recommendations of the committees. The uh, uh, Jen Budoff, the budget director, will uh, begin the presentation in a minute, but then as we get to the committees, um, I expect that the chair of the committee will make a presentation. If uh, the budget office has anything to add, they will do that. If there's a member who's not present, and I realize that several members came in last night or early this morning from the uh, retail convention in Nevada, um, if somebody's not here uh, and I have a sense they're coming in later, we'll just kind of put, the, put that off, that committee off, uh, re reorder things. Otherwise, the um, committee director or committee clerk will make the presentation unless they are shy and bashful, in which case uh, Jen Budoff will make the uh, presentation. Um, the, uh, what else do I want to mention here? Um, when we're done going through the committee uh, presentations, uh, other, you know, the floor will be open to other uh, issues that members want to discuss. So why don't we uh, begin with uh, the uh, presentation, Jen? Sure. Uh, real briefly, an overview of the uh, FY15 budget thus Oh. <laughs> an overview of the FY15 budget thus far. The uh, Council Budget Office sent out our standard budget questions to the um, agency fiscal officers uh, two or three weeks before we received the budget from the mayor. The mayor transmitted the budget on April 3rd. We had about a month of, a month of hearings. All committees held two to five hearings each. Uh, those concluded on May 9th. We had our committee markups last week. Uh, and uh, today we are having our work session. The vote will be on May 28th. We will circulate uh, at a minimum 24, about 24 hours beforehand. So on the 27th, as you know, May 26th is, is Memorial Day, so we don't really assume that people will be um, looking for the budget on that day. And. Uh, so May 28th will be the first vote on the BRA and the BSA. June 11th is uh, the scheduled second vote on the budget. And do you want to? Well, let me just say with regard to that, uh, we're, we're, I'm working with general counsel who's working with our um, attorneys with regard to the second vote, and that may be just to protect ourselves in terms of the litigation. Uh, but. Um, Dave sent out an email a day or two ago. I can't remember what day this is. I think he sent it out on Monday that indicated that um, we should plan on um, May 28th being um, the, f the first and final vote on the uh, Budget Request Act, uh, at least as we're reading the uh, court order. But we are actually seeking a clarification of that. So at any event, um, for sure May 28th, 
and members should look at that as being the final vote, uh, but there may be a second vote uh, depending upon advice of council. So we have really two items on the agenda today. Uh, each committee will go over the uh, actions that they made to the agencies under their purview and at the end of the meeting a review and discussion of our collective priorities. Now these are the same ground rules that we've always had so uh, to limit each discussion to 30 minutes and uh, also just to remind council members that if there were BSA subtitles that were included in their committee reports that did not have funding associated with them, they're not being included in the BSA. We're not doing anything s subject to appropriations in an Appropriations Act. And uh, when we talk about funds throughout the day, just assume that they're local funds unless we state otherwise. In terms of certification, uh, you know, the CFO has to certify the mayor's budget before it's sent to the council, and the CFO also has to certify our budget um, before we pass it. Um, while they do certify the budget, the CFO's office does certify the budget, uh, their role is to certify the numbers and not to uh, make uh, policy judgments on any of the actions that the council may or may not make. Uh, there still are a few minor certification issues um, and every council member and staff that has a certification issue is, is, is aware of that and we're continuing to work with the CFO to resolve them before the 28th and the ones that we have left are, are, are very, very minor. Um, so I think everyone did a good job this year with that. Just real briefly, our, the FY15 budget, the gross funds budget is, is $12.6 billion, of which 6.8 are local funds. Uh, we have uh, $270 million of dedicated taxes, $590 million of special purpose revenue, though it's a lot of, you know, uh, fines and fees. We have 3.1 million of, 3.1 billion, excuse me, of federal funds, uh, the majority of which is our Medicaid match and a very small amount of private funds. Um, our enterprise agencies like, you know, uh, DC Water and the, the um, Convention Authority get another 1.8 billion for a total gross funds of 12.6, which is roughly 3.6 percent more than the 14 budget. Uh, the budget that the mayor sent us uh, for 15 of the 6.8 billion of local expenditures about the vast majority around 6.2 billion comes from taxes and one point, excuse me, 105 million that's a fund balance use and those are the funds that are being pushed forward from 14 to 15 via the um, supplemental budget. And then we are on to the Committee on Finance and Revenue, which we put first because we know that Mr. Evans is always one of the first people to come to meetings. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, you can see by the slide in front of you, the committee approved the mayor's proposed budget with the following changes to the agencies under the jurisdiction. We redirected $150,000 to the Committee on Economic Development for an EITC education grant to be issued by uh, Department of Economic Development, and we recommended changes to the mayor's proposed BSA including the following, and these are the only two that are funded. We had a number of other recommendations, which I'll talk about as well. Uh, the first is to add emerging business district demonstration project subtitle. What that is is the idea of the bids uh, in 
in uh, first started out in Ward 7 and 8, now it's across the city, that are help uh, partly funded or entirely funded by the um, D.C. government to give them a chance to get up and running, and then hopefully uh, we'll phase in the private sector after a period of time. And then the IPW fund establishment subtitle creates a non-lapsing fund to support Destination D.C. plan for the IPW conference, which is in 2017, and I believe uh, uh, that's been funded as well. Um, beyond that, what the committee recommended, and I'll just walk through these quickly. Um, for the Arts Commission, we recommend a uh, increase in the budget of the Arts Commission from 16 to $20 million. Uh, $20 million and above is essentially what uh, the Council uh, has recommended for that commission for a number of years. Um, and we also put in, if you remember last year, a uh, dedicated funding source based on the uh, sales tax. Uh, the Mayor repealed that in his budget. Um, and I'm recommending that we repeal his repeal and put it back in again. And I think it's uh, critically important that the Arts Commission have a dedicated funding source. Uh, every year, every mayor plays with that money, uses it for his or her own purpose, and, uh, and the Arts Commission gets uh, shortchanged. Since we're talking about a relatively small amount of money, 20-some million dollars, uh, I recommend we restore that. Um, I'm sorry? Well, I, I'm just identifying things. I didn't move money from anywhere. I mean, to, to take a longer view of this budget, uh, if you look at the FY14 budget, I've said this several times, and you put in the automatic increases that are mandated by law, salary increases, et cetera, you come up with a baseline of 2015. Given the revenue that we have, uh, the mayor had $159 million to play with, and he spent it all, as he should. So when it comes to the council, there's no money at all. But there's $159 million that the mayor spent on whatever he wanted to spend it on. And we as a council can take all $159 million back and spend it on what we want to. The problem always is it was spent, and whoever committee got the money is not going to want to cough it back up again. And so my committee, Fine Centers and Revenue, doesn't get any extra money, so we don't have any extra money to allocate to what I think are very worthy causes. And I think we as a council need to look at the $159 million. Where did it get spent? Largely education and human services are the two beneficiaries of that. Should it be spent there? And is there extra money that can be spent, taken away from those committees, and spent in areas, uh, other areas? Um, that's the painful part of this uh, budget process. The uh, third thing that uh, we focused on, and I'll pass this out, uh, are the recommendations of the Tax Review Commission. Um, I'm disappointed that the mayor um, funded so little, so I prepared a chart of what, what my recommendations, the committee's recommendations are, versus what the mayor did. And if we fully funded the nine uh, items that, um, that I believe we should, and it, it, it crosses the whole spectrum. It talks about the estate tax, the income tax, the business taxes, talks about the standard deduction, the personal exemption, uh, EITC. You know, these are all great things, and depending on where you lie on the political spectrum, you support some, you don't support others. But the total package is $264 million. And I recognize we can't implement that all in one year. And what my proposal would be that we look like we did with the Tax Parity Act, which Council Member Catani and I did many, many years ago, that implemented something over a three, four year period with a trigger. Uh, the mayor funded, you know, very little of the Tax Review Commission, which is disappointing because he had made a commitment when we set this up that he was going to implement this stuff, and he, he didn't do it. And so you can see the, uh, uh, the amount he funded versus what, we, what really needs to be funded. Um, and then at the bottom, I was asked by Council Member Bowser to calculate if we, um, uh, instead of going from 40,000 to 60,000, if we went from 40 to 80 or 40 to 100 on that middle income tax bracket, how much money that would cost. So that gives you an idea of what we can do in taxes, either do it or not do it. But I recommend, since the council was very vocal as well, saying to Mayor Williams, if you do this and come back, we're going to act on it and not just put it on the shelf, that we at least entertain doing some of this over a period of time. And then finally on page, uh, nobody has my report probably, but on page 38 of my report, we have 21 subtitles that we have added in as well. None of them funded, but all of them 
Uh, are some of them refunded? Oh, they're, they're all important to somebody. Um, and they include the American Academy of Achievement, Meridian International, the Scottish Rights, American Association of Medical College, Kelsey Gardens, underpayment of the estate tax, tax transparency, the grocery store initiative, uh, trash compactor bill, social impact uh, pilot program, low income housing tax credit, disabled veterans, organs, donors, save lives, um, the uh, um, community investment quarters, retirement parity, and the historic cultural music institution. So these are all, again, items that are important to different council members in different degrees that are not funded. And uh, when we decide who's going to get funded, we should be looking at these as, uh, as uh, items that uh, could or should be funded as we go forward. And so that's the sum and substance of what we did. And um, um, I look forward to working with everybody as we uh, put this all together at the end of the day and decide how uh, we're going to prepare this budget. And for people's information, if they want copies, I asked the CFO, and it's kind of interesting information to prepare, and maybe I'll just make copies and distribute that. Two documents. This is a document. I asked the CFO to start with fiscal year 2000, go to 2013, and you know the seven categories we always have, government direction, economic development, public safety, public education, human support, public works, and financing, and to, and to put the budget numbers year after year after year and the increases that we've done in each of those categories. And it's, it's a little bit hard doing apples to apples because we've changed various different things within it. But it just gives you a thumbnail sketch. To give you an example, in fiscal year 2000, the total budget of the District of Columbia on local level was $3.1 billion. And as Jen just pointed out, on 13 years later, our budget is $6.8 billion. So we've more than 100% increased our local budget spending. And it all went somewhere. And it all went to somebody. Always remember, when we spend money, at the end of the day, somebody gets the money. It's not a corporation. It's not anything else. It's just somebody gets the money. So here's a huge amount of money. And then the other chart that I'll pass out is um, what I explained earlier um, with the mayor's uh, budget, 2014, 2015, and where the mayor spent $159 million. It gives you an idea where it is. And, if anybody wants to move it in order to fund other things that the council might want to. Okay? That's all I got. Uh, so you don't get copies of those yeah. to us. Yeah, it's just interesting stuff. Okay. Can you? Um, Jack, thanks for this information. Um, I wanted to, to ask about uh, the recommendations that you make, which uh, is a recommendation made by the Tax Provision Commission. Uh, number five on the sheet you handed out adds a new middle class tax bracket at 6.5% in the cost is six, $65.7 million? Yes. Uh, at the bottom, <clears throat> you say uh, you have two alternatives. And alternative one would raise it from 40 to 80, as opposed to 40 to 60, which the mayor does um, in, in the BSA. Would that $41.6 million be added to the six? $65.7 million? No, no. It would be instead. And you see it's at 7.5% instead of 6.5, which is why it's lower. But, yeah, gotcha. it would be okay. instead of, yeah. Okay. So it'd be, it would be at 7.5, which the mayor does, but it would be take it from 40 to between 40 and 80. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Thanks. Um, one, one thing that should be noted on this is that the, uh, the cost of lowering the rate in any of these brackets, these lower brackets, is the cost is broader than just for that bracket. If you if you, if we create this new bracket, um, and I'm certainly receptive to that, and uh, have the uh, in effect lowering the rate, anybody who earns more than that is getting that benefit as well. Maybe I should restate that. If I earn two hundred thousand dollars a year, and you lower, let's say you just lower to zero the rate on the lowest bracket. Uh, from I think it's four percent to zero percent, I I benefit from that as well because that's the tax on the first ten thousand twenty thousand dollars of my income. All that's to say that even though this focuses on creating a new middle class tax bracket, it benefits not just those who are in that bracket but everybody above that bracket. Tommy. Well, uh, if anybody has anything else to say about that, I'm going in a different direction. If you if y'all want to continue that, I have a quick question. Mm. Jack, you know how much? Maybe Jim knows. 
Can I ask a question? Uh, yeah. okay. how, how, much, how much does it cost to do what the mayor put in the BSA, um, which is reduce the marginal tax rate from uh, between 40 and 60 to 7.5? Does anybody know how much that costs? Yeah, that was, so uh, Councilmember Evans actually has a chart on here uh, that the, in the mayor's proposed budget, he provided about $49 million of tax relief, um, and he did a number of things to raise revenue. He did the single weighted sales apportionment factor. He, um, he unified taxation on tobacco products, but he also repealed the sunset on the top rate, and that's an additional $18 million. So when you add that, so it's actually $27 million of revenue plus an additional eighteen. million. Um, so, so that's how he balanced it out. Uh, if there's nothing else on, on the tax commission, uh, Tommy? Yeah, Jack, um, I've got staff trying to pull it together, but I only heard about this yesterday, and I should have caught it earlier, but there's, a, I think, a $5 million TIF on 8th Street, and the purpose of that TIF is to be sure we get retail along the street because, you know, residents' concern is all restaurants and bars. And so it generates a TIF, and, we, and, it, and it's been working pretty well. And I realize there's some complication about um, what's all of it spent, that sort of thing. But I think that the mayor then takes it and says, let's just disperse this across the city to Great Streets programs across the city which concerns me because it really was a dedicated TIF for the street that still needs retail. And um, I want to see what, what your thoughts were about that. Well, I, I agree with you. I think Ruth tells me it's in the Economic Development yeah, Committee. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. yeah, it is. So it's not ours, but I, but I, I agree with you what you're saying. Because the TIF was established for that purpose. and. I don't know why he did what he did. And in fact, it's a, it's a non-lapsing fund that they've created specifically for the H Street retail area, um, and they're in the process of getting those funds out the door, and this would take and disperse it around the city, which is not a bad policy idea because essentially more retail areas could get up and running, but it is taking it from the location where that actual TIF income and the work's not done yet. And the work's not done because he's going all the way out to the bridge on Benning Road and up, you know, so there's a lot to do with that money, and I believe we should ultimately reverse that yeah. decision this, by the mayor. Yeah, he can now, so we expanded that. Uh, last year's budget. Oh, and we took our year? Yes. Yeah. 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 Now you can spend that all the way out there, like you and I were talking about, all the way out to the yeah. so now it's been taken. Okay. But that money's been dispersed around the city, which yeah, I think we need to reverse. We need to bring it back. He could, he could go beyond A Street, though. No, he is. I talked to him the other day. Yeah. Well, we will be discussing that on okay. the Economic right. Development Report, as I recall. Um, uh, and you know, yeah, I just want to, just for clarification, are you saying that this tip that was A Street now goes all the way out to the road? That's correct. Okay. And up front. Okay, so it's beginning to do what... That's we right. all want, and that is right. to sort of spread the wealth, if we can call it that. If we don't so take it, yeah, exactly. So we have to make sure we restore that. That's right. Yeah. Uh, anything else with regard to the Finance and Revenue Committee Thank recommendations? Jack, did you have anything else? Well, I could tell you. Okay, you thank you. Sure. Um, on number seven, um, raise the standard deduction to the federal level. At the federal level, is is that the, from three to six? Sixty-one hundred. Sixty-one hundred. Okay. Um, you know, I had some desire to try and raise it to uh, uh, twelve thousand for individuals, so that a person who actually makes uh, less than twenty-five thousand would end up paying a tax, a total uh, annual tax of about $107. So in other words, most of their income would stay with them, in fact, almost all of it, and they could therefore you know, raise their standard of living. Um, 
but the um, tax revision commission did not look at it from that perspective. But right. there's, there's a desire to do that to help. Um, I mean, we can't help some people get an increase in wages, but we can certainly help them keep more of the dollars that they earn so that they are lifted up. Well, there's an earned income tax credit on wage earners. Uh, are entitled to. They have to file, and it's a credit. That's so the and schedule H? No, 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 no. It's EITC. So it's actually a refundable credit, yes. which means that not only is their tax obligation brought down to zero, but they actually get money back. Okay. So okay. it's like, you know, when you hear people talking about making work pay, right. we do that through the Earned Income Tax Credit, and right. the Tax Revision Commission recommended an expansion of the EITC for single people. So right now it's mostly used for fam, you know, for families. But they recommended that we expand it for individuals. So in your case, yeah, that, they, can, that would they can get the that would definitely credit. work. That's the intention is to really put money back in people's pockets mm -hmm. so that they can mm -hmm. afford to live in DC. Mm -hmm. All right. <coughs> Thank you. And um, I'd like to see if it's possible that we could expand the EITC consistent with what the Tax Revision Commission recommended. But again, the bottom line here is that even though the tax tables for the individual income tax show that income up to, I think it's 20000 maybe it's 10000 is taxed at a 4% rate, the reality is because of the earned income tax credit, if they're working, they actually will receive a payment. They won't pay a tax. They won't have a zero tax. They'll receive a payment. And um, so that's better than raising the deduction. All the raising yeah. the deduction does is to um, possibly re reduce the tax, but it doesn't create a, okay. a credit, and right. the EITC does. So it does what we really want, and that yeah. is to put money in the yeah. hands of those who need it the most. Yeah, and we've looked at uh, some tables, and the Tax Revision Commission did this, uh, with regard to what the effective rate is uh, for taxpayers. And uh, except for a little bump in the middle income, which is actually more the working income category, um, our income tax is pretty progressive. Yeah, and I the know. effective top rate is uh, more like 6%. If there's nothing else on taxes, we'll turn to the next item, which is uh, Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. Mr. Wells? Thank you very much. Um, I'll just go over what you already know about the committee, but also to inform our viewing public that the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety oversees more than 20 agencies, which in the Mayor's proposed budget for fiscal year 2015 comprises a total of more than $1.2 billion in gross funds. The vast majority of these funds are allocated to personnel services, representing more than 9,300 full-time employees in the public safety cluster. The committee moved a budget report that supported nearly all of the mayor's proposals for fiscal year 15, but it did include some changes in the operating budget to support the reintegration of our returning citizens. The committee identified $163,000 in savings by eliminating one attorney advisor at OAG and $278,000 by eliminating three vacant FTEs at FEMS and directed those funds to the Office of Human Rights. The committee is um, moving forward with the Fair Criminal Record Screening Act next week, which is ban the box. And the budget report recommendations reflect the staff additions at OHR to implement the bill. So it will not be subject to appropriations. It will be fully funded. The recommendations also include additional funding through the Justice Grants Administration to provide transportation assistance to our returning citizens as well as an allocation to help the men and women obtain their birth certificates. They're modest changes, but they'll have a considerable and I think meaningful impact for our returning citizens. The committee supported the three subtitles sub submitted by the, the Mayor's Budget, um, Budget Support Act, the Elected Attorney General Implementation and Legal Service Establishment Technical Amendment Act, which essentially aligns the fact that since we're not going to elect an Attorney General for at least four years, it um, realigns or kind of takes away the reorganization that we had done, and that will happen when we elect. Second subtitle, Police Escort Reimbursement Act 2014. It allows MPD to charge for when we move hazardous materials, things like that, through the city. It allows MPD to charge for the cost of that. Then the last subtitle, the State Safety Oversight Agency Establishment Amendment Act. That has to do with um, fire and EMS 
and the, safe, the requirement of the Federal Transit Administration for having a um, safety oversight agency for the movement of rail, in particular streetcar, through the city. Then we made minor technical clarification, or clarifying amendments to each subtitle, and we ended up with um, the new inclusion of a BSA subtitle that would amend Access to Justice Administrative or Initiative Establishment Act to increase the percentage of funding the DC Bar Foundation can use for reasonable administrative expenses, which includes running the Civil Legal Services Grant Program and the Poverty Lawyer Loan Repayment Assistance Program. So that's basically it. It goes to um, to the Justice Grants Administration. Yes. Yes, there's an organization that the offices of um, citizens Attorney returning citizens affairs um, does that as well. That this is what they do. That they um, they already receive funds to do this. And what they said was that they're short funds for for transportation and for birth certificates. It's what's it called? It's called Voices for a Second Chance. Well, I just got to say, stunningly, the head of that, of the Returning Citizens Agency, said that having funds for birth certificates was not a problem. So we went to the providers that actually do it, and they said this is a major problem. So again, on, on record, the director of the Office of Returning Citizens just didn't see it as a problem. And while I appreciate the, um, that build capacity there, they do get some additional funds for an FT FTE in there. But um, they say that they see, I don't know, 4,000 returning citizens a year, but only 125 through their efforts got jobs. We're really perplexed in terms of what their capacity is in terms of their mission to actually provide services rather than just being a referral agency. Um, if you look at our report, if you get a chance, Kenyon, we'll get that to you. No, I did look at it, and I do appreciate all the work you all done. And I don't want to take up too much time because I think you put a lot of thought into your report, but I would love to just chat with you outside of this, just about some thoughts that I have about the, the, the office and, and some of the things perhaps it could be doing. Um, I just think for some time it, it, it really hasn't received funding. And whatever the reason is, I don't know, but to be able to do, to broaden its scope, um, you know, we have thousands of returning citizens coming back each year. I know there are a lot of organizations in the community that work with this population, but I think if we have an office that whose mission it is to, to, to work with this population, we should support, support that office. Just, I was just a little surprised that it didn't seem, I asked them whether they saw themselves as a service, direct service agency or administrative referral agency. It seems like they're more of an administrative referral agency. So if there's more money for returning citizens, it may need to go directly to the organizations that provide the jobs for returning citizens rather than to an organization that sees themselves as referring people to those jobs. Okay. Uh, um, Mary, Mary's next. Mary's next. Tommy, I just have one question, and I appreciate how you've uh, put together uh, help for people who are returning and Important. The only question I have relates to the elimination of the three FTEs at FEMS. Um, yep. Because we're so concerned about whether FEMS is properly resourced, I'm just curious where these folks are being taken from. Mm -hmm. Did it include the communications? communications. And what was their salary? One of the of those three positions, one of them is their communications.
person who's and it's not filled, but they had been making 130,000, and that's an office that has how many people in it? They, have four other people. they already have four other public relations people in there. Another is another administrative position. Only one firefighter position eliminated, and the chief has not shown a willingness to fully fill these positions. These are empty positions, and they keep cutting their vacant positions and trimming the force down. And so um, it's only one firefighter position. It's not filled, and we're not confident that the chief intends to fill it. But otherwise, it's a $130,000 position for communications. I appreciate it. I'm happy about that one. But, um, you know, in a sense, we reward the chief for under-resourcing the department by um, acknowledging that this, these are vacancies that won't go filled. We should be insisting that they be filled. Right, and as you know, they're never going to be at 100% FTEs, right. so taking out one position is going to be the, the slippage anyway. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And, it's, and that position is a single role position provider, not a dual role provider, not an all hazards position. So it's firefighter only, not firefighter par paramedic. So that is only a single role provider position. So it's, so it's not an all hazards position. About 90. Is that 90 total in the agency or 90 firefighter positions? I think it's total. Fire and EMS. We, we can get that, but it's, we believe that's, that's total for the agency. Um, Mary, did you have anything else? No, thank you. Uh, Anita? Uh, I wanted to uh, just go back to the returning citizen um, and just put on the record yes. that um, it seemed to me that their concern is, as staff, that they perhaps didn't have the capacity to actually service the um, returning citizen. Um, the issue, as you have described it, that they seem to be more of a referral agency seems to be correct. However, um, I, the fact that they were able to tie their work to 129 actual you know, positions where folk are working, I think, is very significant. And it just seems to me if perhaps they are going to be a functioning office, you know, operations, then we want to make sure that they have um, the bodies to um, do that kind of work. Um, having done some work in the past myself with uh, CSOSA, Department of Justice, I can tell you it's very difficult to get uh, returning citizens employment. And so if you have individuals who relate to the population um, directly, I think it would be to our advantage to make sure that we um, uh, increase the number of personnel there so that they can get the work done. But I, I would agree with you. One of the things was that they would have to make it clear that they see it as their mission to case manage people yes. to employment. That when I asked about that, they said, you know, it's a, it's 120 some that they got jobs, right? But they, we have 8,000 returning every year. Right. For, they saw, I believe, around 4,000. Yeah. And pushed back saying, you know, that their job is not really a case management. That there's too many. Yeah. That they see um, about 400 per month. Right. And so if we decide that they are a case management organization, we would have to redefine their whole staffing to be able, like, what would the caseload be? Would it be 100 returning citizens per year uh, per case manager right. or 200? They would need a whole new staffing pattern to have that expectation. So more importantly is DOES. That is the department that gets people to work. And so I'm nervous about beefing up this agency when it's DOES that they refer to they just simply refer the folks to DOES to get them these folks jobs for the most part. Well, um, if I could just continue. So we have to be sure that we're putting the money in the right place who could really help our returning citizens. Well, that office is the one office that is, in fact, helping the returning citizen at this time. And I think so we need DOES. to look. All right, well, I think we need to look closer at the capacity for that office given the clientele that they have to work with. We all know that DOES um, struggles, and it has been struggling for years. 
to really you know, get done what its so-called mission is. And it just seems to me if we can diversify so that we can get results, that should be one of the goals of our government because the returning citizens, as you say, they come back every month. You know, every month there's another group that comes back and they go into this pool of the unemployed in the District of Columbia. And if we can um, give some specialized attention to them, I think that we should. Well, again, Mr. Thornton did not come in saying that he needed I agree. a bunch of new resources. I agree. They had no plan of what they'd do with new resources. And just as an antidote, I was stunned when he said we don't need additional funds for birth certificates. We went to the private agency that receives our funds to get them and said, absolutely, this would make a difference for our returning citizens. So there's a disconnect, but in that disconnect with, you know, I think the council has a role in trying to really clarify what the expectations are of this organization, but the administration has a role to be able to tell us what they expect to accomplish with this. I, I, I agree 100 percent, and, um, and my church is one of those agencies that does that kind of right. work, and um, I have heard from them, and we collect money every Sunday to um, take, uh, you know, we take up a collection for the $23 that's required, you know, per person that we serve, so I, I know what you're, what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Sure. Uh, you know, let me just weigh in on that point. Um, I think, Tommy, your instinct is correct on this. Um, I'm, I'm recollecting that one of the barriers for uh, returning citizens in getting jobs and even housing is identification. So the birth certificate is important and transportation is another barrier. Um, I mean, these are little things for most of us and a very big uh, problem for returning citizens. And it seems to me that your instinct with regard to the Office of Returning Citizens is correct as well. I, I see that office as being an advocate for the returning citizens. And so that office would be the advocate with DOES, rather than it duplicating the expertise and the training and the personnel for job placement, they would be the advocate for the returning citizen. I did have some questions for you. The attorney-client advisor at OAG that you're eliminating, where is that? Is it a vacant position and where is it? One of the new vacancies they're creating, or the new positions they're creating, is currently vacant, and it's from the new positions for um, one of the, the many, but new cr positions mm -hmm. for Office of Contracting and Procurement that they're adding in. So it's a, con a contractor position. No, um, it's, um, contracting, it's Office of Contracting right. and Procurement. It's and part of the Mayor's Office of Contracting and Procurement initiative. But this is an OAG person. Yep. Um, and I had another question, and that was on the Access to Justice Initiative. Uh, where did the idea for raising the administrative fee from 5% to 10% come from? Came from them, the, um, the bar folks and their advisors from Peter Edelman and, and, um, and, and I mean, the BSA subtitle does two things. One is it allows uh, administrative expenses for the um, loan repayment, attorney loan repayment program, LRAP. Mm -hmm. I think that's what it's called. Right. Um, and I guess there is not an administrative fee for that now. So I think that makes sense. But uh, I, um, I'm hesitant about going up to 10 percent. And um, as you know, those folks talk to me sometimes. I had not heard anything about raising it to 10 percent. I'd be more comfortable with a, uh, a, a lower figure. Uh, the um, Innovation Fund, when we set that up, that uh, has an administrative fee of 6 percent. Um, one of the things about it is that it, the, the set amount gives them leverage to bring in more private dollars. This is not something that's fully funded by us. But that speaks to the total amount of the grant. Right. I'm talking about the administrative fee. The, the chunk that's right now is for access to justice for administrative fees covers a lot of training issues for the attorneys that we don't raise. We can't have them. And we cut into those $200 for administrative fees. One of the administrative expenses that um, counts as administrative expenses is training. And so mm -hmm. it probably would just mean that they would um, have to cut out, you know, a bit of, that it's a one-for-one. It's um, it 
it's a set pie. They would lose money for that they use for training. Training's administrative expense, and so they would have to cut out training, <coughs> or cut back training. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe we'll talk about it some more. Okay. Uh, anything else on judiciary? Yes, uh, Jim. I didn't see you wanted to be on the list. Are you okay if you come after Mr. Yam? Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I share your concern about employment because jobs is the key to all of this. And you know, in addition to the issues of birth certificate, et cetera, which I'm sure are important, you know, we're also dealing with issues here of literacy, substance abuse, mental health, you know, a whole raft of obstacles to employment, which are very, very difficult to overcome. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm experiencing a similar situation in the human services area because with similar obstacles, and, you know, we've got a very active uh, employment program there, but absent the subsidies that pay for people's employment for a period of months, I don't think we'd have any jobs at all to speak of. Are those subsidies operating in the area of, uh, of uh, uh, and I like, the, I like the term ex-offender, and, uh, and excuse me, I like the term returning citizen and returning resident, because we do have permanent residents who are returning to the District of Columbia, which is their home and they're not citizens. But on that aside, do you have subsidized employment programs in, in this area? Are there subsidized employment programs for returning citizens? Right. There are a lot of them. I believe Councilmember Che directs some funds for is it green teams? Well, or? I heard you say, the reason why I'm asking you is I heard you say there are only 154 jobs generated or something. No, like what that. I said was is that this particular office in their performance report only took advantage, only said they were accountable for about 120 some uh -huh. jobs that people were placed into. Not that they provided the jobs, not that they subsidized the jobs, it's just successful referrals. Oh, well, successful referrals. I'm sorry, but I know that's the answer you got from me. I, 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 I'm just interested in knowing a little bit more about that. I, I've worked with that office before, and I know they place individuals that I have referred to them. And I wonder if the 150 number are the, the, the folks who directly came to them and they placed somewhere working with them. Because they refer thousands of other people to other agencies. Right. Uh, but DODS, I like to look at Project Empowerment, quite frankly, and see who's doing a better job. Part of the problem is we've got way too many agencies doing workforce development. That's you know, right. we've got about 12 right. agencies doing workforce development, but yet there's no measure or standards across the board to see who's doing the best job. We don't know whether or not the city's getting a return on this investment, whether, you know, through the Office of Aging, Return of Citizens Affairs, DOES. And on that point, real quick. Sure. And that's why we're putting a, a FTE over at the Workforce Investment Council to do a, and one study this year on all those services so that we can combine them and really get the biggest bang for our buck. Because you're right, it's spread out all over the place and we don't know what's out there. And I haven't seen anything comprehensive on it since about 2012, since DC Fiscal Policy Institute looked right. into it. So I think and the WIC is the place to do that now that they're yeah. really up to speed and, uh, well, and we'll see results next I, year. I think the sooner we get that information, well, the better. I, I think the point, Mr. Chairman, the point I want to make is that the fact of the matter is that our programs are producing very few jobs. And we're not even asking the question whether they're full-time, part-time, at what wage. You know, many of these are part-time jobs at, at a very low wage. We're not producing very many jobs. And the question thereafter is, is it because our programs are not effective? Is it because of the obstacles and barriers to employment that these particular individuals are experiencing? And I think it's probably a combination of both. Well, it's also probably that uh, many of these folks are difficult to employ. That's what I said, barriers to, uh, 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 well, they, barriers they, to employment. Barriers are prejudice. No, no, no. I mean barriers to mean mental health, substance abuse, literacy, mental health, you know, all of those types of issues, which make it difficult for many of these people have never had a job. And, and the same is true with TANF as is, is true with the, uh, the, the returning citizen program. And so it's, it's, an enormous, it's an enormous barriers here of one kind or another. But I think for my part, my experience with this also shows that we're not really having effective communication or connections to the big employers in the District of Columbia. And they're not taking enough of our folks and giving them a break and giving them a chance. And so I think it's a combination of things. But the bottom line is that we're ending up with very few jobs created. 
of any kind, and that some of the, a lot of these again are part-time jobs that don't produce the ability to survive really without food stamps and everything else that we're doing. Uh, Jack, yeah, Tommy, I just wanted to ask you about the funding for police officers. How much is it budget to fund how many officers? We're fully funded for four thousand officers, but there's a problem. The problem is um, is that we're funded at a replacement of the attrition rate, the current attrition rate, so that if there is a bump in the number of officers that retire, we're not, we don't have the bench to, um, to, to deal with that. And we've got a retirement bubble coming, as you know, right. over the next um, two to Well, I, yes and no. Well, they're funded, they need to actually hire greater than what they are um, yeah, greater than 4,000 in order to be able to have enough folks to backfill the positions. Correct. And they have that flexibility. They through don't the, have that flexibility. Through salary lapse and through um, the, um, it says, I think it's called the safety fund. Because um, that was an issue that we looked at. That. Well, that may be the, it, it, what they're telling you today. But the, the problem with the retirement bubble is that to hire carefully, that is to avoid the binge hiring where you relax the standards and then you get a lot of corrupt cops, uh, they're good for training about hiring about 300 officers a year. That's right. And the retirement bubble is potentially greater than that. That's not a funding issue. That's a capacity issue. Both. One of the, um... Jack, the replacement rate currently is about 190 per year. Phil is exactly right. The capacity for hiring qualified folks and getting them trained is the capacity is at, at 300. One way to deal with outstripping the 300 is that they have a number of positions that can be, quote, civilianized. And these are police that are duly trained, certified, whatever, can go out onto the street and can go out there, but they would have to hire civilian positions. To civilianize 100 positions, which is a reasonable amount, according to the chief, that would take an additional $6 million to where you hire the civilians and then you can keep up beyond the 300 capacity to meet the retirement bubble. That would be one strategy. But the administration did not ask for the $6 million, but that's what it would cost. They've got about 200 positions currently they can civilianize. So that's about 200 officers that they can put out there, you know, it's a one-time shot, but they could put out there during the retirement bubble hitting. So that would be part of the strategy. And that's <coughs> possible. Is there a, I mean, you hear this all the time, the idea that the city's growing, population's growing, more people are coming here, and we're, we have a staff force of 4,000. Is there any planning or thought process about expanding the force of, say, 4,500? Well, Chief Lanier testified that while the force of 4,000 sworn officers is sufficient to meet the public safety needs of the city today, it may not be enough, as you could imagine, Jack, in the coming years. But let me also say that the Chief is doing a lot of um, data analysis that shows us where our staffing needs are and how we prevent it having to be a one-for-one -one new businesses new people, more police officers needed. She showed, and you may have seen this, when you go from nine liquor licenses on a block to ten, the staffing or resource requirements quadruple up to four. So if you see these blocks where that's happening, you can actually intervene more quickly to create a culture of safety and control <laughs> to prevent that spike. But there are ways to manage this. The other thing is, is that better use of technology, including camera deployment, and other things are called police multipliers. It's not always just a one-for-one -one growth compared to some percentage increase in the population. We can still police smarter in a way that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have a, a bigger force. But uh, ultimately, we're going to need a bigger force. OK. Uh, any other questions uh, regarding the uh, judiciary report? Uh, thank you, Tommy. Thank you. Government operation.
much. We got two. The Committee uh, on Government Operations approved the Mayor's proposed budget with the following modifications. Uh, we directed $500,000 in one-time funds from the Office of Risk Management to provide uh, $100,000 to the Office of the Secretary for the Statehood Delegation, $120,000 to the Office of Asian Pacific Islander Affairs for Domestic Violence Prevention and other programs, $25,000 to the Public Employees Relations Board for workshops and district-wide training. We identified $738,000 in savings at Octo, DCHR, DGS, and the Captive Insurance Agency and directed the funds as follows. $195,000 to the Executive Office for the Mayor, for the Commissioner of Fathers, Men and Boys. $208,000 to the Executive Office of the Mayor for the Commissioner of Women. $59,000 for the Office of African Affairs. And $200,000 to the Committee on Business, Consumer and Regulatory Affairs for the A Street Main Street under the uh, DSLBD. 70000 to the Committee on Education to waive fees for community-based organizations to use DCPS facilities after hours, which is a huge problem. Uh, we accept the transfer of $250,000 from the Committee to hold to ship Emancipation Day activities from the Council to the Executive Office of the Mayor. We accept the transfer of $186,000 from the Committee on Transportation and the Environment to fund the Smoking Restriction Amendment Act of 2014. We also approved the mayor's capital budget with the following uh, changes to the agencies under the committee's jurisdiction. We transferred 19.8 million in 15 and 16 funds of the archives project uh, to the Committee on Transportation and Environment uh, and received 14.4 million for FY17. We recommended changes to the mayor's proposed BSA uh, to include the following. Uh, we worked with Councilmember Goss and others and the mayor on the district government family leave program amendment subtitle. Uh, and we extended what the mayor had sent down. Uh, we extended the paid leave benefit for birth or adoption event from six weeks to eight weeks. Uh, we add Office of the Secretary limited grant making authority subtitle, which authorizes the office to issue grants to provide assistance to the statehood delegation. We added the renewable energy portfolio standards amendment subtitle, which postpones the date for the annual report on the supplier's compliance with RPS uh, in accordance to testimony we got from um, the commission. We added a residential essential services subsidies stabilization amendment subtitle, uh, which returns management of the residential essential services program from the Department of Environment to the Public Service Commission. Uh, we added the Commission of Fathers, Men and Boys establishment subtitle, as well as the workplace wellness subtitle. Um, but as far as the workplace wellness subtitle goes, we're still waiting on the Fiscal impact statement. I'm done. All right, are there questions for uh, Ken? Can you, yes, sure. Can I have some explanation of the archives? What is the, what is the, the purpose in the community of the transportation? For? Uh, it's for a transfer. 14 point, actually it's 19.8 between FY15 and 16. Uh, the 15 money is for the recreation center over at Andrewwood, which was previously in uh, past budgets, uh, but the money was spent elsewhere. So that would create a recreation center over at Edgewood. And the rationale behind using the archives money, uh, which I support quite frankly, I've been there to visit and seen all the, uh, the important historic documents that we have. But what was clear from the testimony in the performance oversight, as well as the budget oversight hearings that we had, is that the uh, Office of the Secretary of the Department of General Services are not quite yet in a position uh, to spend the money that they currently have in the budget. Uh, and that it would be more prudent to have the money in 15 and 6, I'm sorry, 16 and 17, so that the planning can occur uh, at the end of this year and 15. Uh, they have over $4 million in the 14 budget, and heretofore have only spent uh, approximately $250,000. Uh, so uh, I've talked to a number of the advocates. Again, I'm a huge supporter of the archives. I know a number of members of the council I've talked to. Uh, we genuinely want to see it built, uh, but we want to see the planning that goes into it uh, to make sure it happens correctly. Uh, there have been suggestions about co-locating the archives and they're okay. There have also been concerns about that type of proposal. There have been suggestions to, uh, from the administration to relocate the archives in the old Court of Deeds building at 6 and uh, E. And then there have been concerns about uh, witnesses who testify with, with putting it there. It's a beautiful building. It's a historic building. 
but perhaps it doesn't have the space that's necessary to locate the archives there. So I think we need to have a more robust conversation and that the planning needs to be more meaningful so that it can take place. Could I just ask, how about, if this, these are memos that you're transferring for 15 and 16, uh, the total being 19.8 million. Is that 19.8 million for both fiscal years or, 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 or one same fiscal year? Or what's it about? And how much money would be left in this budget for this purpose after this transfer? 1.52 million is left in 1.925 million is left in 15. And 18 million is left in 16. And we're giving the 14.4 for 17. So, so there's still a substantial amount of money left for oh, absolutely. both uh, for 15 and 16 if it was properly used. Well, 16 to 17, yes. Well, well what's in 15? I thought you said 15 and 1.925. Right, so that's... Planning money, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's very good money to begin to, to do design and so forth. Yes. Considering the fact that they've spent only a fraction of the $4 million that they have this year, if I followed you correctly. That's correct. Thank you. You're welcome. If I may pick up on that, I think that the... Um, enthusiasm on the executive side toward the archives has been uh, lacking and uh, Kenyon and I have talked about this and so even though we're, um, the effect of this action would be to delay the uh, archives and a new facility um, the commitment is there that we will we will not continue to put this off and I'm totally committed to that and this is within the secretary's office of there, right? This is That's correct. under the secretary of the archives. Uh, other questions? Uh, I have a few. Um, the $738,000 in savings at Octo, DCHR, DGS, is that just um, going into those agencies looking at operating dollars, or is that going into some special funds? <coughs> There's uh, $115,000 mm -hmm. in PS funds, which the uh, Chief Technology Officer identified for us as not being vital to the mission. There are um, $50,000 in NPS funds for, for the Department of Human Resources, uh, which the committee believes DCHR can absorb. There is $172,749 uh, over at DGS by cutting three FTEs and $150,000 in NPS funds, which the committee believes DGS can absorb. Uh, and at the capital, there's $250,000 and what the committee believes is overfunding given the projected cost of fiscal year 2015. Um, and uh, the, um, the family leave program, the mayor proposed six weeks. Is there a fiscal impact to expanding it to eight weeks? There actually is no fiscal impact to expanding it to eight weeks. Because essentially it's... No, there's no fiscal impact. Uh, because the number of employees is probably small and it can be absorbed by each agency? I, I don't even... Oh. oh, yes, that's correct. The um, renewable energy portfolio standard? Yes. Uh, you're postponing a date? Can oh, you for the annual report. Yeah, so the date currently is in April, which uh, April 1st is which they're supposed to issue a report. The problem is they don't get the information that they need from... <coughs> from other utilities until around that time, which doesn't give them enough time to actually issue the report in a timely manner. So we're pushing it back one month uh, to afford them the opportunity to get the data from the utilities and incorporate that into the report. So this isn't substantive in terms of trying to meet the RPS standard. This is simply um, giving them uh, an additional month to file a report. Rather than have it be late every year, just yeah. to give them an additional month so it can be timely. Okay, are there any other questions from members regarding? Sure. Yes, uh, Jim. One more minister will definitely mention Trump's this question. Is the recorder of deeds building, which is several years involved with years ago, has historic African American murals in it? Frederick Douglass was a recorder of deeds for the district of Columbia. Uh, do, we have, do we have money sufficient in the DGS budget to make sure that that building has been properly upkept and maintained? Because the, the murals are in jeopardy the last time I checked, and I want to make sure that we have funding sufficient in the budget to preserve and protect those murals. 
which were done in the 30s, were covered in the And the Christo and the lines of the war, I, I suspect there still are, but I believe the building may be empty at this I have to. I would have to ask the agency to, to specifically get you an answer on that. But and if there's a need to preserve those murals, because they were done in the 1930s or 1920s, and sure. they're important to the history of the district. Probably. Which is one reason I think the administration is looking at, at that as a potential location because of the historic nature of the building. It's a question of whether or not the building um, um, can meet the needs of a new archive. So. Uh, that is one of the buildings that they're looking at. So. Of course, you could always have a warehouse somewhere else. Yeah, that's one of the things. We're not dealing with so many aspect of this building. It's very, very important to see. I agree. So, if, if you can give me some kind of a program in the state of the world. We will look into it for you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. If there is nothing else with regard to government operations, uh, we'll turn to the next committee, which I believe is education. David? Start by thanking uh, my staff, Mr. Chairman, for all of their work uh, as a part of this budget. Um, I think uh, you know the evidence. Hopefully, will suggest, uh, based on the committee members' support, that this was a well thought out plan. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was particularly proud. Last Saturday, we celebrated uh, the 60th anniversary of Brown v. Board, and it has taken us until this budget to recognize that children are at risk. Uh, in our city based on certain uh, uh, positions, whether they be homeless or foster care children or SNAP, which are food stamps, or TANF, which uh, is welfare, or kids who are one year older than their peers in high school. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this budget moves $79.8 million in additional resources for those children and will have a dramatic impact, I think, in improving our matter of right neighborhood schools. Uh, as well as our charter schools. So, Mr. Chairman, first, with respect to DCPS, uh, the committee reallocated $2.8 million to provide even more funding for at-risk students. Uh, it was, uh, it was uh, to make sure that uh, in this initial allocation of at-risk funds that schools uh, across the city received uh, enough at-risk funding to cover at least half of the kids identified in their schools. Um, there are net increases in the proposed CIP uh, thanks in part to a transfer from the Committee on Transportation and the Environment. And we, we have, Mr. Chairman, for those who are interested, we can show you how the dollars were, were essentially um, uh, prioritized. With respect to the public charter schools, we were able to add $1.4 million above the Mayor's recommendation to make up for certain losses uh, as it related to summer school weight so that there's no decrease in summer school opportunities within our charter schools. Um, next, within OSI, we provided $2.3 million in additional slots for early child care subsidies. Uh, we did, uh, along with $500,000 transferred from the Committee on Economic Development, continue the community schools program. We added $473,000 and four FTEs to the new youth re-engagement center, uh, added $340,000 to provide learning disability assessments and diagnoses for adult learners. Uh, we added $200,000 and two FTEs to support homeless student outreach and intervention programs. And I think this is a very important investment, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we were uh, fortunate enough to have more resources sent by the Committee on Transportation and the Environment. I thank Councilmember Che. And these will include um, resources to support the following. $1.5 million for the study of the relationship between health and student achievement. $3.3 million to implement the Healthy Tots Act and $63,000 to fund the school-based food pantry programs in wards four and seven as a trial program uh, to provide the kids in need with meals over the weekend. Uh, with respect to DC Public Library, again, thanks to a transfer of capital funds from the Committee on Transportation, uh, we were able to increase uh, the amount of funds available for the Cleveland Park Library. Uh, we were able to proceed with the Palisades Library uh, on time as opposed to what it was originally proposed for 2000 or, or, or re-proposed, I should say, for 1920, 1920, and we were able to add additional resources for Capitol View Library and Board 7. Uh, many of the initiatives that uh, were discussed, especially as it relates, relates to at-risk funding uh, and other increases came uh, through savings associated with uh, a decrease in non-public tuition identified by the committee. 
Uh, we added 222,002 FTEs to, to implement the Office of the Student Advocate and additional resources for the Office of the Ombudsman. Uh, and finally, again, thanks to transfer of PAYGO capital from the from, um, Committee on Transportation, we're able to provide $4 million in grants uh, for facility planning associated with two of our most successful charter schools. Uh, so with that, Mr. Chairman, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Are there questions concerning uh, education? <laughs> Mr. Graham. I noticed that there's uh, quite a lot of transfer from the Union of Transportation. The capital funds, I think it's all capital funds, isn't it? That's right. Uh -huh. That's um, correct? Yes, yeah. we have capital funds. What, what is the total amount of capital fund transfer from the Committee on Transportation to the Committee on Education? Bear with me, Mr. Graham. We're going to be exact number. I don't want to give you a, a wrong answer. Do you want to wait? Do you want to wait? It's just a We're consulting with Councilmember Chase, Committee Director. We want to get the number right. Just bear with us. Graham, are you interested in DCPS or in total amount transfer? Well, I, uh, perhaps, I mean, the, perhaps this question really goes to Council Member Chair, but I was just wondering if you have a factual total from you, but perhaps she has a factual total. But we're we're, 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 we're going to staff consult this, so if you bear with us one second, we'll get you the uh, full. I'm just wondering that sometimes when we take money from one purpose to another, the original purpose is affected, and it's just going to be the original. Sometimes, yes. But we don't allow for the exceptional situation. Uh, Mr. Graham, eight million in capital. I apologize. It took us a while to, to get. Well, we're not fourteen, but I see here fourteen million. It's it's some of it is a swap, Mr. Graham. I'm sorry. Some of it is a swap. A swap. Yes. Mm -hmm. Between PAYGO and regular capital, there was a swap. But I see fourteen million for merch. I saw. Um, yeah. uh, these are swaps over uh, uh, over fiscal years, Mr. Grant. It's not exactly new dollars. It's just swaps over fiscal years. So not, uh, a swap suggests that you're transferring money to her, or excuse me, to the Committee on Transportation, and they're transferring it back to you. There is some of that, and there is also over different years. So, for example, let's say the Wilson Village is supposed to get renovated for $100 million this year. Right. Or supposed to be renovated for next year. To move all up to this year, move this year. So it's a, so so there is a swap. So it's a rush. In it terms of case. You know, but, but it's their case that I'm asking about. Well the numbers may not be even. Right. But I mean it's a rush in terms of the both committees end up with ex with about the same as they had previously after all of this occurs. Are you directing that to me? Not not necessarily. I have uh, uh, what you might regard as swaps, but not necessarily straightforwardly from transportation um, to education. I have some other issues as well. Um, I have 39.6 million from the South Capitol Street Bridge because um, the need for a span, an opening, uh, has been uh, taken care of, so that was put into that. So that would be 39 million. That wasn't a swap. It was just covered. Um, 31.8 million from streetcars um, in 15 because they're flush with money and they don't need it in 15. That's a move ahead. Um, so that's 70, that's 70 million if I'm adding to that. Yeah, no, I, I, I'm supporting the wealth around. Education got some and others got some. But you, uh, do you want this now? Is that what we're doing now? Um, 18 million from the Traffic Operations Center at the Reeves Center. They um, are not in any position uh, to prepare that at this time. They had uh, money for design that they can't use and they're not using, and so we're pushing that ahead. That's also a timing issue. Uh, 13 million from the circulator bus garage. They're not anywhere near ready to do that in 15 either. 
five million from parking meters. Uh, we've given them millions and millions, and they haven't spent it even yet. And then five million on top of that for 15 is completely unnecessary. Um, and that's from uh, the capital budget out of transportation. There may be some other shifts. For example, out of DPW, we recovered two million dollars because, although that may have been operating. I'm trying, oh, that was operating. Never mind. Um, and all of those, all, all of those monies were transferred to the Committee on Education, the ones that you just said? No. Oh. No. But you asked me. Right. So. But they were, they were transferred out of the Committee on Transportation somewhere else. Just, 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 just or moved. Moved. And, and then the move uh, was that we would push it up and allow a project in another area to go forward now and then proceed with what we're doing a year later. Do, do you end up uh, as a rush between the two committees? No, or? not necessarily, because some of the money we recovered, for example, like the, the bridge span, right. was money. It was money. Okay, and so we have to figure the transfer between these committees is $7.5 million over six years. Well, I don't know. In capital, I don't know. I was counting a higher amount when I was following the presentation in seven million, but uh, over six years. So, well, this doesn't indicate over what period of time. Uh, but starting with the fourteen billion dollars for Watkins and Merch, that's that's more than seven million. Watkins gets paid back sixteen. That's one of those swaps. Ah, so, so the money, the capital comes back from education, back to transportation. Are you, any other questions, Mr. Graham? Other questions concerning the community on education? Yes. Mr. Grasso. Can you just go through a little bit more of uh, an explanation around the at-risk funding? You increased it by... 2.8 million over the mayor's mark. What was the mayor's mark, and where does that put us with funding that priority in the committee? So, um, the let me start by saying I appreciate the mayor's investment uh, in in the fair funding bill. It didn't go as far as perhaps some of us might have liked. It means about $2,200 for every student in traditional uh, DCPS and also charter schools. Um, the the legislation, as you may recall had for DCPS, the dollars had to follow the students. So if a student had, if a, if a school had 100 kids, they would get 100 times the at-risk weight. Um, within DCPS, it didn't exactly work out that way. Um, the funds were uh, more or less following the children or students, but didn't in fact turn out that way. And the chancellor claims that because we were so late in the budget process when the bill passed, it wasn't possible to actually have the bill uh, implemented as we had passed it, which is the money would go to the schools, the principals, the faculty would decide which interventions are best for that school, longer school day, longer school year, et cetera. And so she used her judgment as to how the funds should be distributed and tried to, do, tried to approximate how many kids were in the schools that had the, had the at-risk status. In our review of the schools, we wanted to make sure that there was at least as much money for approximately half of the kids. And so there were schools where there were, there were you know, only 40% of the kids were receiving the at-risk weight. So what we try to do across the board is to make sure that no school got less than 50%. In fact, what happened is many schools were, were received more money than they had at-risk. And this was concentrated around high schools, for instance. And so we'll have middle schools that are receiving as much as a 25 to 30% increase in their budgets uh, next year to, to try to improve them in the short run. Uh, so what we try to do is, across the board, uh, make sure that no school received less than 50 percent. And, and so that, 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 that explains the additional 2.8. So DCPS started with uh, 45.5 million in at-risk funding. By moving it up to 2.8, the final number was uh, 47.3 million. Charters received 32.5 for a total uh, committee recommendation of 79.8 million. And again, this is, a, this is a down payment on what it's going to take to purchase the interventions that we, we believe uh, will, will lead to better neighborhood schools. Excellent. Thank you. I was just curious how that worked out in the end, and uh, I think that's a good plan. Thank you. Do you have anything else, 
Any other questions? I have a couple. Um, sure. Could you, it's, on, under OSSI, what is the Youth Reengagement Center? Um, Mr. Chairman, Youth Reengagement Center is a long promised uh, entity that is intended to focus on kids who are 16 to 24 who have dropped out. Uh, and what we have across the city are kids who, are, who, who have dropped out and there is really no door for, for them to enter to get, as the name implies, re-engaged in education. And so uh, the re-engagement center is a partnership between OSSI and, the de and, and with some support from the Department of Employment Services uh, to, to create just that institution for kids to be able to have a place to go uh, and to work with the rest of the government to, uh, to get them on track, uh, you know, back for credit recovery for graduation purposes. So there, that, that um, initiative exists, but it's somewhat anemic, and this is adding resources. So we're creating it, Mr. We're Chairman. We're creating it. We're creating it. You know, there was some trepidation, and I apologize uh, for interrupting, there was some trepidation by members of the committee about having it be a partnership with the Department of Employment Services. Uh, the administration insisted that, given the location of the Department of Employment Services, that this partnership made sense by virtue of space already available and its location. Uh, and what we're doing is adding, we're adding additional resources to help it get off the ground because we thought the number that had been recommended would simply be insufficient given the, you know, and the six to 12,000 kids were trying to re-engage. Now this, I don't want to give the impression that this is a be-all, end-all. This is actually a, another down payment on trying to reach out to these kids. Ultimately, we're going to have to fund, uh, you know, the engagement. This is establishing the architecture for finding the kids. But what we haven't funded in this budget, and it's important to remember, is we haven't actually funded once we have the kids, making sure there are the resources to educate them. And so I, I don't want to oversell this, but it's an important first step and it's an important plan, and that's what these resources are intended to do. So did the mayor propose this in the BSA, and you're, you're making it more robust? That's right. Uh, the, 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 the program in Boston, after which it is uh, modeled, is significantly larger in terms of resources. And so we thought, the committee thought that what the mayor proposed, while a good first step, didn't go as far as we could or should go. Uh, the early child care subsidy slots, uh, how many more slots is that? It's an increase for an increase. Uh, I'm told, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, it's about 200 slots, and these were slots that were promised in the past, so it's simply funding what has already been promised. Now, last year, my recollection is the Council added something like $9 million for early child care. Um, I didn't look, but I assume that was maintained in the budget, and this would be in addition to that? In addition. Do you know offhand the total amount then for... Because uh, this, this has been an important initiative of the Council's. Chairman, if you'll bear with us, we're going to we'll sure. that number up for you. Just one second. Mr. Chairman, are you asking how much we spend today or what the total increase is? Um, maybe both. The total I'm increase is about sense. 3 million total on top of it. Let me get you the exact number. One second. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you bear with us, we'll get you this number. Just one sec. Okay. Uh, it's 80, the total amount is 83, Mr. Chairman. And so uh, the number goes, Mr. Chairman, from 80.9 to 83.8. So the net increase is about 2.9 million. That's eight for the early, early child care subsidy is going to be 83, 83 million dollars. 83 point, uh, 8, 8, 
Right. And then you have the 2.3 on top of that. Okay. I had one other question. The, um, there's a study, I'm looking on page 13 at the bottom, a study on the relationship between health and student achievement. How did we determine 1.5 million was the right amount? These were funds, uh, Mr. Chairman, that were transferred from the Committee on Transportation. And so this is, uh, this is part of uh, OSSI's uh, um, recommendation. I'll let, if you're interested in where the money is coming from, uh, it came from trans transportation and the environment, but this is an OSSI recommendation. Uh, do members have any other questions? Dr. Educational Center is included in the modernization funding. Uh, how much is committed to Mary Reed in FY15? In FY15, Mr. Graham, it's uh, 15951000 So that should be a good, solid first phase uh, modernization. That's right. And, and, and it's followed up, uh, Mr. Graham, by for FY16 of 19,549,000. Uh, and the following year, uh, 8.5 million. Okay. Uh, it's, a, it's a total project uh, valued at 44 million. Okay, I, I, I really I welcome that funding. And I, I do want to say that the community or the AMC or others are very much concerned about the strategy and the approach to be taken to the movie, there's a lot of thinking about how that might be more than just a straightforward modernization, but this financial commitment is extremely important to that discussion, whatever its outcome may be. But let me also mention, if I may, uh, uh, Bruce Valera Park Road, we were anxious to see some additional monies. There's no funding for Bruce Valera Park. And by the way, this is the only funding for Red Run Schools. Uh, in this budget, so I'm very pleased to see it from the new but uh, this will really help you really need some additional funding. And of course, Garrison Elementary was so, so ready, you know, and, and that money, the argument is that handicap rehabilitation. Um, Mr. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I have this copy. One year, and I'm trying to follow you in the other yeah, side. So, so so you you no, I, I appreciate knowing what your question is. My question is I'm pressing for funds for Garrison Elementary, which is across the street from Melbourne, and 40% of its enrollment comes from Melbourne, and also for Bruce Hill Parkview. I'd like to see some additional funding, some kind of. We discussed the notion of a special project from Bruce Hill Parkview, which has already had its first stage, but there's still some very significant projects that need to be done there to make the elementary school function properly. So I'm just wondering if those two schools is an issue. So, Mr. Graham, I just uh, Bruce Monroe has uh, will be getting its ADA compliance or its ADA modification in this fiscal year, and so that's that's starting. Uh, with respect to Garrison, Garrison, uh, which does serve a number of residents from Ward One, is going to get 16 million dollars in 15, followed by 22 million in FY16. This is an acceleration of Garrison's modernization. Uh, and you know, I don't. Uh, I know ward members are very conscientious about what is going on in their particular ward, but it's also important to remember that you know a good many of our kids come from out of boundaries, and so I, I would encourage folks not to be too parochial in terms of whether or not something is physically happening in their ward, because often kids are coming from different communities. So when there's some discussion about whether or not a Watkins or a Hine receives, Ellie Hine receives funding. Uh, keep in mind that you know plurality of the students, especially from Hine, are coming from communities outside. So that's all I'm asking for people. We, the committee went through a very meticulous process to make sure the funds were distributed across the city, pursuant to the master facility plan priorities listed accordingly. And it is a bit of a jigsaw puzzle where you pull here, you you know you do create situations elsewhere. Um, I, I think that we were able to fund the priorities that were presented to the committee. And Councilman McDuffie, for instance, fought very, uh, and I commend him for fighting very hard on an important project in his ward, Brown. And we were able to fund, it starting in 15, Mr. Chairman, um, planning dollars, followed by FY16 dollars for the modernization of Brown. Uh, similarly, Mr. Berry uh, was very interested in the acceleration of Johnson. And so we were able to do that. Now, to your point, um, Modernizing Marie Reed 
is as important as modernizing Lafayette and modernizing Orr. These are three schools which still function over the, the open floor plan, which if any of you have visited a school with an open floor plan, it might have been a good idea a long time ago, but it certainly isn't now. It's never a good idea. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll say that I'm trying to, you know, be... I'm trying to be respectful of the people who thought it was a good idea, um, but in reality, it makes it makes you know uh, it makes it very a very difficult learning environment. So the committee really did try to make sure that all three of the remaining open floor plan schools, uh, one in Ward Eight, one in uh, one in uh, Ward uh, uh, Four, and one in Ward One, were all funded. Yes, but Lafayette is Lafayette is open floor plan, as is Marie Reed, as is Orr. Anyone who wants to see for themselves how disruptive it is, I invite you to attend any of them, and you'll see for yourselves. And so, move a microphone. There weren't, Ms. Bowser. What I was suggesting was, just as we are modernizing Lafayette, which is an open floor, you know, there were there were some efforts uh, behind the scenes to weaken the efforts to modernize, which the committee is prioritizing and moving forward other open floor plan schools, including Marie Reed and including Orr. Um, I just want to say that uh, thank you for that. And there's no question about it. It's a disastrous learning environment. We have two other schools which fortunately both were demolished, which were open classrooms, which was Bruce Monroe, the old Bruce Monroe School, and Gary Jackington, both of which are now parks and well used as parks. But uh, again, uh, uh, let's hope that uh, if you could, could open your, uh, be open to the notion of some additional funding for Bruce Monroe Parkview, you know, some kind of special projects. There are specific things that the school needs to have done that are very important beyond the ADA compliance, which you're right, is being done this summer. So I know I'm representing everybody who goes to Parkview, which is largely a neighborhood school uh, in Red Room, in the Parkview neighborhood, that uh, we, we try to do something there. Mr. Chairman, I could just quickly respond. I, I appreciate that, Mr. Graham. And if, if you uh, have specific items in mind, please bring them to us between now and when we mark up the whole budget. Uh, we have done our best to try to accommodate many competing interests. And this, you know, what, one of the things the committee is trying to do is to, to keep the settled expectations that we have communicated in the past. It's about confidence. And so very often we get budgets that have reconfigured and reshuffled the deck, which is very disruptive to parental confidence. So we try to keep the promises, try to look at the master facility plan, try to distribute the funds fairly across the city. Uh, you know, and, and, and I, before we, you know, I, I do want to, you know, there are some members who aren't here that have incredible uh, uh, projects that are not being funded. I can think of Aton not being funded, Houston not being funded, you know, there are others that have yet to have a level one, which, of course, Bruce Monroe has had. And so I, 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 I'm not suggesting that any school is entitled to more, but we have many who have had none. And that's where the committee is going following the master facility plan in terms of, of high need and very high need. But, but I'm open to additional conversations, Mr. Graham. Thank you. Uh, if there's nothing else with regard to education, I'll return to... Um, Command transportation. Thank you. Thank you both. Appreciate it. The committee uh, approved the mayor's budget but made changes uh, to the various agencies under its jurisdiction. Uh, and as you may know, the agencies include the major agencies, the Department of Transportation, the Department of uh, Public Works, uh, the Department of um, Motor Vehicles, uh, the De Department of the Environment, and added uh, a, while, a little while back, the Department of Parks and Rec. There are a number of other uh, entities, but those are the main ones. In any event, the committee approved the mayor's budget, uh, but made the following changes. With respect to DDOT, added $500,000 in one-time funds for a comprehensive rail plan. We don't have such a thing and we need such a thing if we're going to have an integrated comprehensive um, transportation uh, scheme. And even though these uh, railway um, 
uh, forms of travel are not necessarily under our control. We need to have a plan, and that's what this is about. Uh, added $1.45 million to freeze the circulator fare at $1. Added $294,000 in five FTEs uh, for, uh, for five FTE traffic control officers. Reduced $2.4 million across various programs to fund committee priorities. Converted $1.3 million to PAYGO capital funding for the Ward 8 streetscape project. In DPW, we added 715,000 and six FTEs to create the Office of Waste Diversion. Added $150,000 in one-time funds for the Recycling Education Program. Added $200,000 in one-time funds for the public space can replacement. These are not the cans, the residential cans that have occupied a lot of attention recently. These are public space uh, cans. Reduced 3.5 million, uh, including two million in super can funding to fund committee priorities. There was two million dollars uh, that the mayor um, perhaps did not notice. Uh, as you may know, the, um, the committee last year provided for replacement of residential trash cans over five years, 20 percent a year, uh, and two million a year. And there was still the two million in the budget uh, for that, but as you know, the cans have been replaced in one fell swoop uh, from some other source of funding. In, in, D, in the DMV, we've added 559,000 and six FTEs to implement the Traffic Adjudication Act. In DDOE, we've added 293,000 and two FTEs to create the Office of Electronic Waste Recycling. We've added 165,000 dollars and one FTE for the implementation of the Air Quality Amendment Act added 525,000 and 7.2 FTEs to restore the lead and healthy housing program. The mayor uh, cut that, and that's a vital program for the health and safety of children. Uh, added $50,000 to provide a grant for recycling education in public housing. Directed $200,000 in O-type funds from the pesticide fund to support the transfer of that money to the wildlife rehabilitation program uh, at, at DOH. And I would just say, so that there's no concern that this other fund is being depleted, we are more than double, perhaps, the money that we have uh, gotten for the pesticide fund beyond what we need by virtue of registration fees, and so that's where we got that money. In DPR, we've added $75,000 to the Summer Food Service Program. We've accepted transfer of $250,000 from the Committee on Health Thank you, Councilmember Alexander, for upgrades at the Kenilworth Parkside Community Park. Intercommittee transfers include the following. Transferred $731,000 uh, to WMATA to provide free transportation for the start of the Summer Youth Employment Program. As you know, uh, for the first three weeks of that program, they do not have any money, and so this will enable them to travel uh, to their positions uh, uh, free. Transferred $4 million to the Deputy Mayor for Education to provide operating grants to public charter schools. Transferred $4.9 million to OSSI to support the study on children's health and wellness and academic achievement. Uh, the Healthy Tots Act implementation, $3.3 million. The school-based pantry program, and I know uh, Councilmember Catania went over those as well, but here's where they are coming from. Transferred $186,000 to DGS to implement the Smoking Restriction Amendment Act. Councilmember McDuffie made reference to this. Transferred $250,000 to the Office on Aging for Senior Transportation Services. Transferred $1.3 million to uh, DHS to support an increase of the monthly SNAP benefits uh, to $30. Um, and the notion here, the fiscal impact of this initiative is unclear. I know that there were some last minute, late minute uh, issues about what that is, but uh, we didn't change anything uh, because until there is clarity, I don't want to lose any money from this program because I want these uh, benefits to be increased. Um, transferred $500,000 to the non-departmental account to support the Transportation Reorganization Act. And basically what that means, we're, we're preparing ourselves. If there is a reorganization, we have the uh, 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 act um, supported by well over a majority of the members of the council moving forward. If we do move forward, we're going to need this money to begin implementation. The committee approved the mayor's capital budget with the following changes uh, to the agencies. Converted 9.9 .9 million of PAYGO capital to operating funds. 
Reductions to project budgets include the following, the $39.6 million, and here the, the list that I was reading to Councilmember Graham earlier, from the capital, South Capitol Street Bridge, and that's because we're going to save money from not having to do the span, the open span, $31.8 million from the streetcar in 15. This is simply a moving up. Streetcar is well funded. It has a surplus. It will continue to have a surplus. Uh, the $31.8 million is a movement of money. It's not a, a reduction of money. $18 million from the Traffic Operations Center at the Reeves Center, $13 million from the Circulator Bus Garage, and $5 million from Parking Meters. In each of those cases, as I mentioned, none of those projects is, is ready to go at any time uh, in 15, and so we've moved them up uh, for the purpose of allowing funding for other projects that are ready to go. Uh, we shifted uh, $31.8 million in streetcar project funding from fiscal 15 to 18, 19, and 20. We accepted the following from the Committee on Government Operations, but this is a swap, too. We're, we're taking money, but we're giving it back. $14.4 million for the DPR Edgewood Recreation Center, $1.9 million for the DPR Ivy, Center, Com Ivy City Community Center, $1.5 million uh, for the DDOE Inspections Compliant and Enforcement Database, database and we're going to return the $14.4 million to the Committee on Government Operations and Capital Funds in Fiscal uh, uh, 17. We accepted the following from the Committee on Health for DPR projects, $3 million for the Fort Davis Recreation Center, $1.5 million for the Therapeutic Recreation Center. There will be more money for that, but this is a tiny, uh, not tiny, but this is a, a smaller piece of that from um, uh, from another committee, uh, one million one million dollars uh, for the Hillcrest Recreation Center, and two hundred fifty thousand dollars for Kelly Miller tennis courts. We've added the following to the DDOT capital budget: fourteen point five million for the Eleventh Street Bridge Park, and we expect um, almost half of that again to come from private donations uh, for the for the total amount for the park. Three point one million for local streets, uh, which is in addition to the other money that was budgeted, and that will be split uh, fairly across all wards. Ten million for alley rehabilitation advanced from fiscal 16 to fiscal 15. 5.2 million for ward 8 streetscapes. One million for Ivy City streetscapes. We transferred the following to the Committee on Education for DCPS projects, as uh, Councilmember Catania made reference to. 3.5 million for Merch Elementary School. That's moving that up. 14.3 million for Watkins Elementary, uh, also moving that up with the monies to be uh, returned. Committee on Transportation and the Environment also added the following to the DPR capital budget. 8 million for the Chevy Chase Community Center, 7 million for Hearst Park, 5 million for a Ward 3 outdoor pool, $500,000 for Franklin Square Park, 7 million for Ivy City Community Center, 6.5 million, and that's the uh, a larger share of that, as I mentioned before, for the Therapeutic Recreation Center. We only have one Therapeutic Recreation Center in the entire district. I visited there. It's desperately in need of um, rehabilitation. $500,000 for Square 238 Planning, uh, $500,000 for Urban Agriculture, $500,000 for General Athletic Field and Park Improvements. We transferred the following to the Committee on Education for um, uh, DCPL projects, $3 million for the Cleveland Park Library, $1 million for the Capitol View Vlo Library, $21.7 million for the Palisades Library to be returned in fiscal 19 and 20. And that's the uh, report from my committee. Is that is a section um, in Ward 1 on S Street, I believe. 1300 block. The 1300 block of S Street. It's a DPR parking lot at the moment, and, and there have been, there's been a, an awful lot of development in that area, and very few amenities uh, for the people in that area, and there's uh, in, an interest in looking at how that property can be um, used and to design it for that use. Now, Councilmember Graham had some issue about whether uh, the interest in it is largely about creating uh, recreation space, our, the information that we've gotten is that it is, but in any event, it's to look at it and then to uh, design a project uh, uh, after there's consensus about what should happen there. All right, questions or questions from members? Uh, Jack? Jack was first. Okay. Yeah, Mary, um, 
One of the biggest complaints I get, as, as everyone I'm sure does, is the roads in the city are a mess. And then the second biggest complaint I get are the alleys are a mess. And whenever we inquire from, from DDOT or DPW, they say they never have enough money. When I'm trying to get alleys fixed in the ward, they get pushed back year after year because there's never enough funding. And so when all of a sudden we have $39 million available from the 11th Street Bridge or whatever didn't get done, and, and most of it goes to education, which is always a worthy cause, the, the, my constituents are going to jump up and down and say, well, why is not, if only, because I think you mentioned only $3 million more is going to street repair when the streets across the city are just a disaster, and $10 million to alley repair when the alleys are a disaster and, and are never funded. Why not take the $39 million and put it into street repair and alley repair? Well, uh, you know, there, there are needs uh, of a whole variety of kind. The, the $3.1 million is uh, in addition to the budget for the streets, so we, we've increased that. And we've uh, moved up the uh, $10 million for alley repair. And it went from 2 to $12 million yeah, for alleys. But it clearly can't be enough money because I can't get any money to get the alleys fixed. So it's just an observation that that it's transportation, you know, 39 million is transportation money, and in my view, should stay with transportation as opposed to going to education. That that, re that received education received 78 million of the 150 million dollars in increases, and now they're getting a whole bunch of more money. Well, only seven and a half million is going to education. And uh, that's less than the money that's remaining to increase these funds. But I'm happy to, to work with you to look for additional funds in, right. in the budget. The, uh, the other thing was uh, DMV. Uh, you know, I'm the car, I drive, take my car down and get it inspected. And I think I shared this with you um, just last week. And, and three of the eight lanes are, are closed. And so the traffic's backed up forever. And I think last year we talked about, as I said to Lucinda, I will give you whatever you need to keep your eight lanes open all day long. And this was at 11 o'clock in the morning to have three lanes closed on a Tuesday, which is the busiest day they could have. And so if, if there's DMV where you get your car inspected at Half Street. Yeah, and, and it's just, as I've said many times, the DMV is sometimes the only point of contact between our residents and the D.C. government. And to have to go and wait in line, which I did, an hour to get my car inspected, only to find that three of the eight bays are closed, I find to be frustrating for me personally. But for everybody else who's in line there, just why, why can't they operate all eight bays at the same time? And it can't be because people are on lunch or taking different shifts. Because last year, when we had this conversation, I said, well, we'll give you as much money as you need to keep those eight bays open all day long so people don't have to wait in line and find that the bays are closed. And so I, I bring that up. If they need more money, there, there's got to be a reason that three of the eight bays were closed on the day I showed up. I don't know the reason on that day, but I just want to point something out in terms of their resources. Their FTEs went from 191 in 13 to 263 for 15. Uh, there was no uh, uh, indication from DMV that they needed more than this increase to 263. Um, so we based their putting together the budget on that. Okay. Well, maybe you guys can make an inquiry as to what's going on or make a site visit on occasions mm -hmm. just to see, you know, why are, they clo why are the bays closed? And, and what can we do to get them open so that people mm -hmm. can have a, a positive experience rather than a total negative experience? Well, I don't think it's ever positive over there, but uh, we no. can make it less. It can be, though. Right? Right. I mean, other yes. jurisdictions like in Maryland, Maryland has a law. Now, they privatize their system. Right. But we haven't Maryland, done that. If, if, if your car is not inspected in 15 minutes, the person operating that has to pay a fine. And so you, they get you through like that because a no, private you can sector go to, You can go to, you know, an entity that's... Uh, I'm not suggesting we do that, but an hour is much different than 15 minutes. I think it's just customer service is not their motto. Hmm? I think customer service is not their motto. Well, but it should be. But, Phil, my, my more important point is if you have eight bays I mean, open versus five bays open. Traffic tickets? Did you try to fix DMV? 
No, there's a reason why we don't do the uh, air quality inspection privately. And that has to do with uh, integrity of the um, air, air monitoring. But, but again, my, my argument is not, once I got there, they got me through pretty fast. Everybody got, but it's, it's getting to the place to get it done. And when five or three of your eight bays are closed, it takes a, an hour to get there. So it's not whether they're doing the inspection on the exhaust or not. That's not the point. The point is, if you have all eight bays open, you're going to move faster than if you have five in, of the eight. I, I'm only, I don't want to belabor this. My only point was we had this discussion last year, made a commitment to get it done, and then two weeks ago, we haven't, it hasn't improved at all. Can you it's just crazy that? that that happens. I will. So anyway, those are my comments. Uh, you had nothing else? Yeah. Uh, uh, Jim? We'll be discussing the same yeah, thing <laughs> next year. When I come. In terms of the 1300 uh, S Street uh, property, uh, in Ward 1, uh, you made a comment about lacking amenities. We've we've just restored and renovated Harrison Park. We have a brand new state-of-the-art YMCA at, at at 14th and W. Uh, we have uh, we, this this council uh, a, a year or two ago bought the Boys and Girls Club at, at 14th and Clifton. I mean, there's in fact in that immediate area in Ward 1. A fair amount of amenities. I mean, we can't have amenities in every block, but we do have within within a close circumference uh, a lot going on. I just wanted to mention that. I, I hadn't heard anything. I, I was once chairman of this committee, and I remember very well the 11th Street Bridge project. I remember it was a huge project that uh, was completed, but I don't remember anything about a park that's going to cost 27 million dollars for a park. It's a very impressive park. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it's fourteen million. And make that a park. The old space. Yeah. Right. Oh, this and this is. Jutes out into the water now. Jutes, jutes, jutes. Yeah. Well, you know, it's kind of like juting out there. You know, concrete on pillows. It's very impressive, at really. Oh, so oh, but the vine is very impressive. But it's, it it's at a cost to the Navy Yard. And so we're going to take a span of the bridge and make it a park? The old bridge. Yeah, the old bridge. Yeah. The old bridge. And that's going to cost, and there's $13 million in private donations available for this? Yes. For maybe? Yeah. Oh my God, I'm not in danger. The total to the government is to build the project. But Twenty-five million, and we're doing twelve and a half. Well, I'm. Do you people who live in the park? Or? Okay. Well, this How is the cost of the bridge. Well, huh? one side is red, the other side is yellow. It really is. It's a really expensive. And it's going to be named one side better than the other for the first time in a long time. We're going to we're going to we're going to show you a picture more here. Okay, I just I just was uh, wondering. Well, the project now um, is um, concrete. The bridge is there. Yep. Um, this is an opportunity to um, add flowers, floral, trees, and make it um, a delightful um, stop along the way. <laughs> that's what this would do. Uh, at least that's the plan that was presented to me some time ago by the gentleman who conceived the idea with um, uh, Harriet Tregoman. Um, that's how it was presented to me. So um, it's a great idea. Just so everybody can see it, I've asked uh, to have them bring up the uh, um, rendering. Re rendering of it. Yeah, it, it's a great idea. And um, as we, I think, become more park friendly, it's a wonderful idea, but I think, too, that there are still, I mean, I'm an advocate for the poor in the city, and with uh, poverty increasing, I'd like to see more allocation going in that direction, if you don't mind. And that's my appeal to my colleagues. Uh, David? Yeah, I, was, um, I was going to comment on the um, transportation against the schools. And, mm -hmm. Note that a quarter of actually 24% of all the capital funding for schools this particular year happens to be going uh, to or two. So 
I, I wish Mr. Evans were here for that point, but the single largest, biggest project we have for capital funding in 15 will be the rebuilding of Ellington, which we are all really excited about. I have a cost of three million. Then we have a big project with Garrison, and we have a school, we have a, we have a increase in funding for um, Francis Stevens. So I just didn't want to leave the impression that uh, these dollars aren't exactly going around. They are. And Mr. Evans might not want to advocate too hard against uh, against these moves because uh, some of the funds are actually coming this way. Um, Tom. Yeah, the, um, the, um, the outdoor or public space fees, there's two things. One is um, for restaurants that the, the mayor's budget proposes increasing the public space fees for restaurants. I don't, I, I do get it for when it's enclosed because you're kind of taking it over for your private use on more of a permanent basis. But in terms of the public space fees, the, where it's not enclosed, it really can add to a lot of different neighborhoods to get more people to create a life there. I remember years ago in Pennsylvania Avenue um, on the Capitol Hill area, it was dangerous. And getting restaurants to put tables out there is something we asked them to do in order to create a sense of safety. And so I'm wondering um, if you would work, if we worked with you at least on the outdoor spaces for restaurants that are not enclosed to try to bring those fees back down because it's a public amenity for more even than the restaurant. In addition, I believe that the mayor proposes putting these fees under the administration. I think because it's so important as a public relationship that it stay under the council and not be um, put under the mayor. If I could respond to that, um, this has also been uh, referred to the Committee of the Whole, and uh, I assume that uh, the chairman may have something to say about this. This doesn't generate a lot of money, about a million dollars, I believe. Am I right about that? Yeah, yeah about a million dollars. Um, but I do want to put it in perspective. I'm quite happy to find the money uh, to uh, illuminate this. I'm quite happy to do that. But, but to put it in perspective for one moment, um, the, the permit is an annual fee of $5 a square foot for a year. Mm -hmm. Okay? I mean, so we're not talking about a lot of money here. And $10 for, per square foot if it's an enclosed uh, space per year. Mm -hmm. Now, what, and it hasn't changed in decades, but just because something hasn't changed in decades of itself is not determinative. Well, but well, it does mean that um, there are uh, opportunity costs about how that those sidewalks may otherwise be used. And it does also mean that there are some um, costs associated with uh, attending to those spaces. But at the end of the day, as I said, I'm happy to to look at that. I, I find it a little bit difficult to believe, though, that increasing it from $5 uh, to $8.30 per square foot per year and from $10 to sixteen sixty per square foot for, per year is a serious uh, issue about whether we're going to maintain these uh, spaces for outdoor cafes. For enclosed spaces that people really take as their own permanent use, I, I would agree with you. But for unclosed spaces, we just had a, a ration instance along George Avenue where places were being robbed and restaurants moved off George Avenue. The degree to which you have outdoor restaurants so that 10 people, 20 people, witness who the robbers are decreases the likelihood of there being the robbery. It's a, it's a public safety issue in some of the, the corridors of increasing a greater sense of safety. But I, may I, watched, I say, so I watched even the, if that's true, are you saying that increasing from $5 to $10 yes. per square foot per year is the determining factor about whether these sidewalk cafes will exist? The, the margins for some of these new restaurants that we're looking to go into some of the neighborhoods, whether it be Anacostia or, you know, Minnesota Avenue and Benning Road, the margins are that tight. And so, you know, we've seen where a restaurant will miss just one or two days of business, and they don't know if they have to take a loan out to go forward. The margins are that tight. And we do want 
You know, I know that when we first had five guys open down by the baseball stadium, they were the only ones out there. And we wanted them, because of the amount of muggings and such around the Navy Yard Metro stop, we wanted them to put tables out front so that people would sit out front and create a sense of safety. I, I agree completely. Here, but again, all I'm saying is this was a proposal by the mayor. I'm quite happy to find the money to replace it. It also goes to the Committee of the Whole, and, and we can do that. It's only about a million dollars. Would it be less even if we're not talking about the enclosed spaces? Yes, I don't. I haven't. I didn't break it down. The, uh, these uh, rates have not changed since 1992. So prior to 1992, the um, the fee was uh, in proportion to the value of the adjacent property, and the theory was that um, you're using public space. The public space has a value. The value correlates to the value of the private property that's adjacent to it. Uh, and that makes a lot of sense. And uh, there was really very little complaint about that. So pick a restaurant on 8th Street. The value of land on 8th Street is very different than the value of land on, let's say, Wisconsin Avenue. So the fee would vary. And that's how it was structured. The problem was that there were restaurants downtown, Jack would remember this, uh, rumors was the infamous one, where their uh, fee was went because of the adjacent office building. The fee for the restaurant went up to I think it was sixty thousand dollars. So, John Wilson, who then chaired finance and revenue and had this, um, looked at having a flat fee, and there was a lot of debate in the council, and these numbers were arrived at, but they have not changed since 1992, and it makes some sense to change those values. Closed space. I get But that's beside the point. Whether they have enclosed or unenclosed, the, they were the poster child of why strictly tying the value of the public space to the value of the adjacent pro private property could have an unintended consequence of a fee that was so high that there was no restaurant that would pay that. If you want to create a downtown but, zone, but, that may make sense. But um, the fact is, is that the, the public space for a restaurant is space for which the restaurant otherwise is not paying rent. They don't pay rent to their landlord for the sidewalk. This is free to them unless we have a fee. But it, but it, and it not, should not be critical to their business because their business is dependent upon the space that they are leasing. I, I get the theory behind it, Phil, in terms of, of how, who should pay for what. But for some neighborhoods, and again, you, we all read about the restaurants that have left Georgia Avenue because of feeling, because it was seen as, as um, dangerous. And they've moved off of Georgia Avenue. Where you, I have seen first Pennsylvania Avenue, then Barracks Row, then H Street, by getting outdoor seating, it creates a sense of safety and it's economic development, you know, it, it works. It's an investment by us with the public space that promotes businesses that are amenities and well, neighborhoods. That may be, but that's, you know, the strategy toward public safety is not to encourage re outdoor restaurants. And I think that the outdoor restaurants on 8th Street are a product of other dynamics that are work on 8th Street, not just simply uh, that, uh, you know. It's the, true that it all works together. I mean, certainly lighting up the streets makes a big difference. It all works together, but I will say again that um, that there are restaurants in neighborhoods that the margins are very close, mm -hmm. and this does make a difference to whether they're operating ability. And it also makes a difference to the neighborhoods that it's a public amenity. But I will say also, downtown is different. Enclosed space is different, but Again, this is a tool that we have that doesn't cost us a lot of money to encourage restaurants to open in Anacostia, to encourage restaurants to open up George Avenue. And I, and I, I can't say enough about how close the margins are that the return on the investment that the city makes by making the public space available is big. Mr. Chairman, yeah, I, I'm not convinced on that, but uh, David? On this, on this point, can I just ask a question? I think. I'm not totally convinced about the change in the fee structure, but I think the penalties are pretty extreme in this, and I wonder if they're still in the recommendation. You know, you have, I think, a $1,000 fine or imprisonment, and 
frankly, for me, throwing people in jail for this is just unacceptable. And I'm hoping that we can at least take that provision out. Um, you know, they could get, I think, up to 10 days for each day of the violation. Uh, and that's a huge penalty for uh, not getting the proper license for your outdoor patio. Yeah, that, that was in the mayor's uh, language, and I'm, I'm quite happy to, to change that. That would be great. If we could reduce the fee back to what it I mean, the fine, I think, was $500 previously. Um, and obviously no jail time, that would be great. I, I think that's ridiculous as well. Great, thank you. Uh, but that brings up another issue, and that is enforcement. Um, I, I've always had the impression that the enforcement is lousy with regard to this. It's a rent per square foot. And I don't think that uh, the um, government uh, really takes seriously ensuring that we're being paid per square foot. How much better? Office of public space in DDOT is functioning much, much better. But you're right. I mean, years past, it was really kind of so much malarkey in terms of actual yeah, I get a permit for 500 square feet, and I put yeah. out the uh, chairs for 1,000 square feet. But that's changed. It really has changed. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it's a lot better. Interesting. Um, Okay. Uh, other discussion on this one? It's, it's, it's such a small amount that um, I'm not sure. It's almost like are we raising it just to make a point, but since it's such a small amount to the budget, it um, seems to me that the benefit outweighs the, the benefit of removing that for the outdoor space, not the enclosed space, seems to outweigh the value to the government to raise whether it be 700000 or less. Uh, I just have this bit of information, so we should just either remove it or not remove it. But only 30 of the cafes of about 650 total um, are enclosed. So really, the bulk of this is for out So if it's still less than a million, or a million or less, that does not seem to be a major factor for benefit to the district to our revenue that if it's and it will be less than a million if you started at a million when you, when you include the enclosed so to the greater public good of what happens especially on restaurants have such narrow operating business the district by getting an extra 750,000 to a million does not outweigh what it um, can cost to the businesses to increase this I don't see how we're better off unless it's just a principle that they should be charged more on principle. Well, I think you're trivializing. I mean, we ought to charge, we ought to charge a fair market rent for the private commercial use of our space. That's a fundamental principle. And I think you're way overstating the value to public safety by encouraging um, outdoor restaurants, outdoor seating. Well, I think you're absolutely wrong on it. I just think that, as I said before, you can point to a, a commercial corridor like 8th Street, but 8th Street that, that has not been changing because of outdoor cafes. It's been changing because of other dynamics that are at work. And the outdoor cafes reflect that. They don't cause it. They reflect that. I'm sorry. I think both right in a way. Um, is that we're just sending the signal that we're raising fees for the sake of raising fees. And that's, that's kind of what I've heard, that we haven't changed it since 1992, so let's just change it. But, but, but this, is my, this is my point. So I think that we're kind of saying if it's a small amount, let's see how we can make it up because it's very hard, period, for restaurants to open. Um, and this cafe fee, and it's not an issue on Georgia Avenue, by the way. People who want to get sidewalk cafes are getting them. Um, and so that, I think that we need to continue wherever we can to send a signal that we're not going to make it more difficult for a restaurant to open and stay in business. So if, if there's just another reason for raising it. I don't know where the mayor came from. Okay. I that that closely. I will say this, though, that, you know, walking in the door, People want more money for homeless. People want more money for the Housing Production Trust Fund. Uh, there are a whole lot of needs. And uh, at the moment, it doesn't look like there are a whole lot of dollars. So I'm not sure we really want to just give up a million dollars. But if I, could... I, can, I can tell you that when this compromise was put in place in 1992, the reason why it was half the rent 
for the outdoor cafes was because they're only open half the year. Okay. And the reality is that that's not what happens at all. They're open much longer than that. Okay. And so, and in terms of their business model, the fact is, is that their expenses are based on, their business model is going to be based on the space that they rent, the inside the building. And, and in fact, my, my general observation, which is not empirical, is that in the summer, when the restaurant has its cafe, the customers aren't inside, they're all outside. Um, so it may create more ambiance for that restaurant, but in terms of improving their, um, I mean, somehow you're saying that they're, they're operating on the margin and this is what makes the difference. I, I think that's overstating it. I but really I, I don't think what we cannot overstate is that we have a lot of burdens on these small businesses in some cases. Now, I'm talking, you know, I know but that... But this in is a not one of them. That's I, my point. Well, this is not it, one it's, of them. it's part of it. It's part of a whole series of burdens that we place. And then people hear us say, well, we're going to raise it because we haven't raised it since 1992. That's no reason to raise fees. Can I say, Phil? Yes, sir. Uh, but the risk of beating a dead horse. I did, <laughs> it. I did hear Mary say that she was open to uh, finding the money somewhere else. Um, and I would support that as well. Take um, it from Jack's ward. Oh. I support. Oh, he's not here. <laughs> I was going to say, I support that as well. I'm kidding. I'm just joking as well. Um, but no, seriously, I mean, I, whether or not it feels right to say that that this doesn't overburden these businesses or Muriel's right to say that, <clears throat> make the point that she's making. I, I do know that I, I've worked really hard over the past couple of years to uh, encourage investment on Main Streets and Ward 5, places like Rhode Island Avenue, North Capitol Street, Bladensburg Road, where I want businesses to come, uh, you know, around First Street, where we have these large sidewalks, uh, Mumbo Market, where we want people to come out uh, open up businesses so we can sit outside and, and patronize those businesses. Um, I think you said it more than once, actually, Mary, so I'm going to work with you if, if, if it's necessary to try to find the money somewhere else. So thank you. I guess what's bothering me about this, if I may say this, you want to I haven't it looked at this that close. And it, it may very well be that this doesn't survive on Tuesday, but I think what bothers me about this conversation is that too often I think that what we do is we, we, we think we have identified a problem that we do not, um, we don't know empirically, and we're doing it really by the gut. And I think that's what we're doing here. Okay. The, the Committee of the Whole had a hearing on the Budget Support Act. Not one business, not one restaurant, not one restaurant organization, not one chamber of commerce, nobody testified against this. And I was there in the thick of it in 1992, and I know how many restaurants can get upset over what this fee is. I, what we're doing here, and, and this is, I'm just explaining why I'm um, speaking rather forcefully on this issue, is that what we're doing here and what we often do is we look anecdotally at a problem or we look, uh, how do I want to put it, um, from the gut at a problem rather than looking at it empirically. And, and that's what we're doing here in my view. But that cuts both ways, though, Phil. Looking at it viscerally. Looking at it viscerally. But that, thank you, Professor. That cuts both ways, though. I mean, to say that we, we haven't looked at it empirically to say whether you Raising it will have a negative impact or material impact on those businesses. So to say that it wouldn't without any empirical data I'll get, I'll get isn't fair either. Well. There's evidence, there's empirical evidence that having people outside on the sidewalk, like a um, outdoor restaurant, reduces crime. And the yes. Restaurant Association did weigh in on this. As well as the Chamber of Commerce. And the Chamber. As well as the Chamber of Commerce. So. I think what we're talking, you know, let's just be clear here. If we're raising the outdoor from eight, from five dollars to eight thirty, and you have an outdoor cafe of two thousand square feet, which I think is large, you're talking about six hundred dollars more in rent, and that's going to no a year, a year. I mean, that's true for a lot of things. That it just looks too low, so we should raise it. I think um, Muriel's point is exactly on point that. Um, that's not a reason to raise it. I think we want to continue to encourage the growth of our restaurant industry. When you look at the um, tax returns that we get, $443 million tax from 
alcohol and a lot of alcohol is sold at our restaurants. I think we want to continue to encourage um, that and it just seems to me um, the more we speak to the issue of uh, things that um, ways in which we can um, tax or recover um, revenue from the business community, the more likely we are to be damaging ourselves in the long run. And this is a small amount of money, and I think if small in the, in the grand scheme of things, and I think if we can um, find another way to, to, to do this, it would be easier for us in the long run. That would were, be my recommendation. Were there uh, any other comments from members on the uh, transportation? Yes, Jim. Uh, there's five hundred thousand dollars in this budget for Franklin Square Park. Isn't isn't that a federal park? Yes. Were you taking these questions? Really? No, when I had the same oversight, I was the first one to appropriate dollars for planning for it. But can you transfer money to the federal government? It's not to the federal government. <laughs> Oh. Okay. Yes, but DPR has a use agreement with the federal government to help develop and administer it. So just this park? Just this park oh, that I know of. But we also have these kind of arrangements, though, elsewhere. Like I think um, RFK. Um, I think I think Fort Reno is the same thing. Um, so that's, okay, we'll they have technical it. ownership, but in effect, we, we run it. Okay. Not yet, but we're going to help develop it and make it something nice. Good. That's impossible with MPS involved. No, no, but we're, we're going to do it. Okay. No, I just wondered about that. Did other members have anything? No, I was just going to say, I think it's a, um, we had the opportunity to have to make some investments in Sherman Circle, for example, which is also a National Park Service, and it is definitely um, in our best interest to um, to do those things. But I think ultimately, if, if we're going to continue to do that, we need to figure out a way to actually get control of the park. Well, we do it by agreement. Yeah. Um, they never give us land. They'll only swap land. I understand. Okay. Um, I have several questions. Uh, one of them has to do with um, the $525,000 to restore the lead and healthy housing program. Mm -hmm. What's the story behind that? Did the mayor cut an existing yes. program? Yes. This is an existing program um, that the mayor cut, and we're restoring the money. Uh, and I assume this deals with the uh, high incidence of lead-based paint and um, exactly, fire over and the testing stock. and the remediation. And uh, the $200,000 from pesticide to a wildlife rehabilitation, mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of members probably got emails regarding um, helping wildlife. Does this That's what satisfy, this, is about. Mm -hmm. this satisfies what right. that concern is? Yes, city wildlife. Mm -hmm. Can you say more about what that program is? It's not through the Humane Society, right? No, it's different. It takes uh, injured uh, wildlife and helps rehabilitate them and allows them to be released into the um, back into the wild. wild. I, I mean, it's hard to use that word here, but uh, into the what we have as wild. They actually made referred cases from the Humane Society as part of the Animal Control Service that can be rehabilitated and re readapted back to the wild. Right. Um, and this was a service before they came along or before we did this in the budget last year. This was a service that was done in Gaithersburg or Yeah, something? we used to have to cart the animal off to a, uh, a rehabilitation center outside of the district. Uh, and in your oversight, it's working well? Yes. And this money, as I said, comes from the pesticide, uh, an O-type fund that we have for, uh, which we had... Uh, way more than we expected in that balance because of registration fees and more than we need to administer the program. The um, money to DGS for the Smoking Restriction Amendment Act. Largely signs. Does this uh, eliminate the fiscal impact on the bill? Yes. Meaning it 
we can add it to the section where we're repealing subject to appropriation? Yes. And you're doing that with several bills? I think so, yes. And you're notifying uh, the uh, general counsel or the budget director? I'm looking so at my legislative director, and the yes. answer is yes. So that we get them added to the list? Yes. Um, the money to Kenilworth <coughs> Parkside. Uh, the I'm sorry, for, the money where? To Kenilworth Parkside. The um, mayor's folks talked with me yesterday. They uh, went through their concerns about the budget, most of which I've not mentioned. Uh, but this was one because they say that the developer, uh, I know who the developer is, but I don't know what he developed, uh, had an agreement to um, upgrade the park. So this would be additional to the developer's commitment. Do you know about this, David? Uh, yes. Uh, this is... Uh you might use the mic microphone. Oh. Uh, is this specifically the $250,000 for the Parkside uh, Park? Yes. So city interest, which has uh, already gone through several PUDs for the development of the Parkside uh, Mayfair community, uh, has itself uh, you know, invested millions of dollars, not only in, in a bridge between the uh, Minnesota Avenue Metro Station across 295, but they're also investing their own funds in this park as well, and this was a commitment uh, that I believe Ms. Alexander made that is necessary, uh, you know, to uh, to leverage the private investment. It is a, it, the whole notion behind the new communities is a public-private partnership, and this is the city investing in part uh, to leverage the the the, uh, the private funds. But that doesn't speak specifically to the issue. As I understand it, and it may not be, I may not be accurate, but this is what I was told, that part of the development process, the developer committed to restore Kenilworth Parkside Community Park. The developer has that obligation. And so, as was explained to me, this 250 takes him off the hook for 250 that he's already promised to provide. You know, uh, I don't believe that that is exactly uh, the understanding that Mr. Novak has with respect to this project. This is an incredibly important project uh, where the developer has already invested, uh, I think, um, a good portion of $3 million alone of his own money into the bridge over 295. This is, yeah. this is, these are addition, these are, he himself has not particularly, I don't believe, committed to funding everything. These are resources in a partnership, the public-private partnership, to help facilitate perhaps what the community is more interested in than, you know, a bare minimum. Well, we will push back on the mayor, but if if the developer agreed to pay this... Is the mayor suggesting that the $250,000 are not necessary? He's suggesting that the developer already committed to that. You know, you point out the, the bridge, and I don't know the details, and I don't know the cost, but let's just say that the bridge costs $3 million. If the developer committed to the bridge and the park for a total of, turns out to be $3.25 million, um, then why are we getting them off the hook? If the developer committed to, let's say, $3 million and the two costs three point two five, then sure, we should pay the difference. And uh, that's what I don't know. Uh, Mr. Chairman, could we put a pin in this and come back? Yes. Un unrelated to this particular project, I just happened to have a conversation this morning about the progress being made uh, with this new communities initiative. And it is very exciting. And the developer has himself invested millions of dollars of his own money, unrelated to P PUD, unrelated to anything that is required. Uh, I, I think this is very much a case of a gift horse, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is a company that has made a lot of money in the city and I believe is looking to give back having, you know, having made a, a good bit of money on a number of projects in the city. Uh, Mr. Novak, uh, I'll let him speak for himself, strikes me as a genuine person who's looking to not only, he's looking for some city skin in the game, but he is putting his money first. That it's, in my understanding, is unrelated to any requirements that he might have. Okay, well, uh, could, could we get the answer and perhaps come back? Because this is an important part of the whole amenities for the whole yeah. uh, park side. No, community. I get that this is important. And uh, to me, the issue, because this comes to me from the mayor, is if the developer agreed to pay for this, we shouldn't pay for the developer. If the developer didn't agree to pay for this, then it's legitimate that we would uh, pony up. Yeah. Um, Mr. Chairman, yeah. I'll, be happy to talk with Mr. Novak about this issue, or we can let Ms. Alexander speak to it. Uh, Ed Fisher is uh, 
Councilmember Alexander, Chief of Staff, is, is, is looking into it right now with okay. regard to if there is a formal commitment for the developer to pay for 100% right. of the cost of the, the development of the park. And, 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 and I appreciate that. Thank you. But Mr. Chairman, I just want to put on the record, this is a developer who's looking to largely self-fund. Um, you know, in addition to what we talked about earlier, the community re-engagement, he's looking for partnerships for community college and other post-secondary opportunities. So, I mean, he really is trying to create an incredible community with a spectrum of services uh, to meet the needs that exist. This is not a person, uh, I believe, who's looking for something for nothing. Um, I've known Alan for a couple decades, so, um, and I, I don't certainly don't mean any um, anything negative about him. I had one other question for Councilmember Che: the uh, parking meters. You're taking five million from the parking meters. You said they don't need that. What, what is that? And uh, what's they had fifteen million dollars in fiscal fourteen to replace the meters and put in new meters, but they only spent some hundreds of thousands. And so they don't need the money to do this in 15. They may be able to follow through <coughs> on it in subsequent years, but they don't need that. They haven't spent the money and they, they don't need the additional money on top of the unspent money to do the meter replacement. This is capital money? Yes. So we gave them 15 million, or they had 15 million. They've spent a couple hundred thousand, and they're carrying that forward and adding this additional money. And there's just there's no way that they'll be able to do these replacements in fi in 15 that they would need this additional well, money. What if they do them at the same speed as the uh, super cans? Then we're in big trouble because they'll fall off and uh, not generate the revenue we're looking for. Anything else on transportation? I'm told that uh, lunch is in the uh, other room, so why don't we break for lunch? Yay. <clears throat>
that's a Roblin that the uh, engineer did that. Yeah. And he died before it was completed. Sure, sure, sure. Happy to. We're back to order. Mr. Graham, are you ready? Reallocated funding within the Department of Human Services and use $10.2 million to Let me just say, obviously, homelessness has become a matter of great public concern, really international concern in what the District of Columbia is doing. And so you'll see in this budget that we're doing a number of things to address the issue of uh, homeless families. We accepted $500,000 from the Committee on Economic Development to increase the budget for the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. $1 million was transferred from CFSA and $300,000 from DYRS to implement portions of the End Youth Homelessness Act, which is incorporated in the Budget Support Act. 1.8 million from CFSA and $800,000 from DYRS to implement a power exemption from the 60-month TANF, TANF time limit for mothers who had children under the age of six months. Five fifty thousand dollars from CFSA to backfill lost federal jobs to prevent domestic violence. <clears throat> temporarily, we're temporarily holding on accepting a transfer of 1.3 million from the Committee of Transportation. Uh, which is intended to create a locally funded food stamp enhancement for households receiving less than $30 per month. What does that mean temporarily? Well, because we have a report. Uh, do you want me to stop my report and no, answer that question? Before you want. Well, that's what you want me to stop my report. The, um, there are administrative costs, we are advised, associated with this benefit that are not covered in the $1.3 million. And there are substantial administrative costs. Uh, we, we, I don't think we have a precise number, but it is in the vicinity of a million dollars. And so it's not possible to accept this uh, without having to figure all that out. <clears throat> well, and to put into place a system that will, apparently the system is very difficult to do, although I question that because Mr. Yes. Chairman, I questioned that, and I suggested that they might want to go to a jurisdiction which is already doing this. Mm -hmm. And so there's actually a meeting uh, arranged with the people from Vermont who are going to be going over this to show them how they did it, and hopefully it can be done for much less. My, my, I'm optimistic about resolving this issue before final adoption of the budget. Well, you realize that I guess we are stopping on this. Um, I'm sympathetic. But, uh, and I'm a little annoyed at the CFO, but uh, the CFO, not the agency, is saying that it's going to, to administer $1.2 million in benefits is going to, 1.3 in benefits is going to cost uh, 1.3 in administrative costs. And if that's the case, that's not worth doing it. But uh, I can't believe that SNAP, uh, it's SNAP, right? Yes. And, um, well, your reaction is precisely my reaction, and that's why I've explained what steps I've taken to try to work through this. And perhaps the conversations with the state of Vermont, which is known for its frugality. You've got to get this resolved this week, Because Monday's a holiday. <laughs> They're meeting with Vermont tomorrow. So uh, we should have more shortly. The whole state? Uh, well, knowing DHS. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Actually, it's very hard to reach anybody at DHS these days uh, for reasons that are probably going to become increasingly well known to everyone. Uh, should I continue with the report? The committee approved the mayor's proposed budget with the following changes to the agencies under its jurisdiction. We reallocated funding within the Department of Human Services and used the $10.2 million in transferred funds from other agencies and committees. So we're continuing this. Uh, 2.9 million from the D, from DRS for permanent supportive housing for families. Not all families qualify for permanent supportive housing, <coughs> but those families that do, this is a very important benefit. And we received a budget from the mayor that had no increase in permanent supportive housing, and no money at all, I think, for permanent supportive housing for families. 
and so this is an important expenditure. We redirected $5.85 million from the Town of Job Opportunity and Training to delay for one year the proposed 41.7% cut in Town of recipients who had been on the program for more than 60 months. And I have a lot of detail on this particular issue, but I do want to say that uh, a family of four, a family of three, once this 42% cut takes place on October the 1st, a family of three would be having a monthly benefit of $150. Um, in addition to that, the, the, I'm very supportive of the Town of Job Opportunity program, and I've been working very hard with DHS to make sure that's working. But uh, the mayor's budget provides for a more than doubling of the, of the budget for that program, going from $18 million in this year to $40 million next year, which includes $10 million of federal money. So I believe that it's possible to redirect this money in order to spare people the human misery of a 40% cut in what is already a very small payment. We've directed $550,000 in DHS vacancy savings to support a feasibility study to determine the housing and space needs for the population of CCNV. As you know, Mr. Chairman, CCNV is the largest shelter in the District of Columbia, located at 2nd and D. It houses uh, uh, 1,300 people in a single evening. Um, the facility is in very bad condition. We also have been having a task force pursuant to council law, pursuant to DC law, which I authored, that has been meeting for the last seven months and is shortly going to issue its final recommendations. We want to keep the momentum going on this important uh, project relating to CCNV. And I can talk more about that if you'd like. Uh, and then we have $96,000 from CFSA to the Committee on Business and Consumer and Regulatory Affairs to hire an additional attorney advisor at OTA in order to further assist with issues of landlord, of tenant rights, understanding tenant rights, being supported in the exercise of those rights. Uh, I was the author of the uh, creation of the Office of Tenant Advocate, and I'm glad to be able to support it in this case. Uh, that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Are there questions? Are there questions from members? Um, Mr. Berry and then Mr. Catania. Uh, first of all, I'm going to come back. I want to get into that. I'm going to my health first. And everything else second. And so I was uh, doing physical therapy and getting my legs stronger. I apologize for that. In terms of uh, Mr. Graham, he has been, and I've been on his committee, and he's been an outstanding chair. We share similar philosophies, uh, and Ms. Bond joined us this year, I mean last year, and we, that was a good addition. I have a, I, well, a committee, I, well, me, I have a, a very serious problem. Ms. Graham and I agreed we need to put $3.5 million into youth housing. Some people call it disconnected youth and any other name for it. Homelessness. And when we send it down to, uh, we talked to uh, Jennifer about it. We sent it out to Mr. DeWitt. Uh, he wouldn't certify it. And my problem is this. He says to me, you identify where it ought to come from, and I don't know enough about the programs. None of us on the committee know that much. Not all the thing about the program is how do we get 3.8 million. How do we get $3.8 million for these young people. And I just talked to David Sign, Mr. DeWitt's general counsel. Uh, my staff, Shante, met with the CFO staff uh, for two, a couple of hours. Uh, two things are here, always to me, that the CFO staff is, is a weak staff, because they couldn't answer a whole series of questions that I asked them. Uh, how much uh, has been spent so far on certain programs that they didn't know they'd get back. But the whole attitude is not one of solving problems with me. 
and with the committee, but one of them just doing this. So uh, I'm going to still work on it. Still try to, Jennifer, try to find a way to get this money certified. Otherwise, if these young people uh, are going to be left out. Deborah Shaw testified very specifically about the need for homeless youth. She's very persuasive. She and other advocates. And I guess, Mr. Chairman, uh, I just want to report that. I don't know what to do. I'm going to keep working. Maybe I can get your assistance in, in trying to get Mr. DeWitt to uh, change his, his philosophy that council members have to identify where to get the money from. And mine is, it said we need $3.8 million. We did identify a program, but he didn't know the impact of that program. That's his attitude. And so we are left with a hole. Well, the program million. you identified was where? What was it? What agency? DYS. DYRES. And you're comfortable with trying to cut DYRS when we have a continuing problem with juvenile justice? Well, I feel very comfortable. Let me get Say this, Mr. Jim, Mr. Phil. About three years ago, in 12, DYRS had a caseload of a thousand young people. And as of the 14th and proposed for the 15th, they have 500. I cut in half of the caseload, but their budgets have gone up. They had $101 million in 13. Let me turn it, try to turn it off. I got it. I got it. And so logic doesn't make sense. If your caseload has been cut in half, it's not a one for one cut. But there ought to be some reduction in the staff, or some reduction in the cost. They had $26 million for RTCs. And we asked the budget people, what's their spending pattern? Do they, are they spending at the rate that they proposed to? So they didn't know. And so it feel, I feel very comfortable because it doesn't seem logical to me, I'm not surprised to you, that you have a staff of going from $101 million to $109 million being proposed for 15, and yet the caseload, we, we applaud that, is down to 500. Well, so, I know the total caseload can't be down to 500 because a couple of years ago they had 1,500 under DYRS. 550. That's, in, good, in, that's good news. Um, 550 to them. Or total supervision. The total number of committed youth is 550. Committed youth? Yeah. Well, I said it's under supervision. No, not committed youth. It's committed youth. Okay, I mean, 500. But in FY12, if I may, Mr. Chairman, yeah. in FY12, there were 836 committed yeah. youth. Okay, and they had 1,500 under their supervision. Right, I mean, this is, just to be very clear about this, this is good news. It's good news because there are fewer juvenile offenders coming into the system. That means something that appears to be working mm -hmm. just in the same way as foster care has, has really diminished in terms of the number of entries. I'm not arguing against Mr. Barry. Yeah, I'm, I'm exactly simply pushing back the on the conclusion that the money is easily available. And, and, this would be, and this would be my argument. Uh, what, we knew several years ago with DY, what we knew several years ago with DYRS was that they were not supervising the kids very well. And there may be 800 who were committed. But there were 1,500 who were under their supervision. And uh, as much as you, Jim, for example, and others were concerned about uh, uh, kids who in, in DYRS who were going out and reoffending, and that we basically were not taking care of these kids. Um, I, would, a lot of I, think there was a, I think there was a very good argument, maybe not uh, absolutely correct, but a very good argument that uh, they didn't have enough resources for all the kids they had. So now they've reduced the number of kids, <coughs> and that means that their resources might align more, more appropriately with what their demand is. We, we do not want to be, we don't want to go back to where we were in terms of not enough resources for supervision. It's the kids who are not, in, um, not committed 
but who are under supervision, the kids who are on community release, who are the kids who reoffend, the ones who you know, well, shot the bicyclist well, on the Illinois the, Avenue. The, 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 the children and young adults who are in quote community release are, commi are wards of the District of Columbia and are included in the committed number. The, the number that, that you may be referring to is, the, is the, those that are in the Youth Services Center, which is a different, which is an additional number. But those who are actually committed to DYS for care and custody uh, are in fact, have in fact gone from 836 to 550 over a two year period. Well, question, you mm -hmm. uh, DYS is under court order. And Jerry M. 286, Jerry M. The other one I was there. And it's under court order. But only 246 positions, a co the court said this, are needed to carry out the functions, the exit, and begin to exit this Jerry M. case. The other thing we can look at is the refusal of the executive, I had to go to the mail on this the other night, and it didn't make any difference, giving a committed member information about what's happening in that department. I mean, I, I, I believe in surgical cuts, not a hatchet. And so my problem, and Jim and I have talked about this, is how do we get enough information to be able to make an intelligent cut? I'm still working on that. I'm not but so optimistic. But Phil, it was not that they didn't have enough staff prior to now. Otherwise, the courts would have ordered, it, ordered us to add more staff. The court is satisfied with the progress we're making in Jerry M., which is about a 25-year-old case uh, longer. And so I really think that it's clear to me, Phil, that they had enough resources at the beginning. In 2012, they had a budget of a million, I mean, $100 million and one dollars, which is $100,000 per case, per young people. You tell me that there's not enough resources to, to try to take our most troubled youth out of this area over here into something that's more positive? $100,000 a youth? Uh, yeah, I, I would. If your question is, was that enough money several years ago? I would say no, it wasn't. Based on what? But I'm looking at because my staff just handed me this. Uh, you received from uh, Neil Stanley um, last week. Approximately 70% of all DYRS staff are directly linked to the Youth Services Center and the New Beginnings Youth Development Center. DYRS, Cherry M. Plaintiffs Council, and the Office of Special Arbiter recently concluded a two year negotiation on the DYRS facility staffing plan. The court approved the plan on April 8th. Any unilateral alteration of this agreement could result in costly fines levied against the district. Therefore, decreasing DYRS's FTE count increases the likelihood of costly litigation due to violations of the Jerry M. Consent Decree. Approximately 20% of our staff work in critical community-based public safety positions such as social workers, case managers, youth engagement specialists, education advocates, and workforce development specialists. These folks provide intensive supervision during daytime hours and monitor the electronic surveillance around the clock. That's for GPS devices. DYRS has made impressive gains in all significant public safety metrics over the past three years. Lowering our FTE total will jeopardize these gains, which include decrease in the number of youth charged with homicide. From 2012 through 2014, one DYRS youth has been charged with homicide. From 2007 through 2011, 55 DYRS youth were charged with homicide. Decrease in DYRS homicide victims. From 2012 through 2014, one DYRS youth has been a homicide victim. From 2007 through 2011, 30 DYRS youth were victims of homicide. Rearrest rates are down across all major categories comparing 2013 to 2011. Overall arrests are down 40%, violent offenses are down 37%. Youth are where they are supposed to be. Abscondences are consistently between 4% and 5% on a daily basis. In comparison to years past, 10% of our youth were on abscondence during FY10. Recidivism decreased for DYRU use. For FY11, 
for example, the last year for which we have a full cohort of data, our recidivism rate is 15 percent lower than in FY 2008. My only point is we need to be very, very careful when we look at making cuts to DYRS, and I'm not sure you're disagreeing with that, but these numbers, which I'm seeing for the first time, I mean, Tommy, you remember when you had oversight of this committee? Two things. Those numbers are amazing. Two things. They're amazing in their decline. They in, their decline. Decline. in their decline. In their decline. You're exactly right. The investments we made are paying off. You know, as much as we heard all the noise that this wasn't the right way to go, this is the result of what we get. But the irony is this, and, and I know that Marion really gets this irony. The irony is, is that the loss of beds for homeless youth is part of the contracts that Neil Stanley recently cut. And it's true that some of the beds that he was funding, say, at Sasha Bruce, intended, you know, funds from DYRS to, for youth that are in the system. But those beds were also used for youth at risk that were homeless in the community. So he was helping fund a population that he doesn't have a mandate to serve. And so he cut those funds, and those beds are gone. And, and no matter what um, Mary Grace says, he did not replace those beds. So we've got more homeless youth, and p partially because Neil Stanley cut those beds. But the argument can be made that someone else should be paying for those beds through DHS or somewhere else. But they used to be funded through DYRS. And I do see the, the irony of that. And Marion is, is right to, to say, where should this come from? But we have fewer beds for homeless youth because of Neil Stanley. And thus, the need that we're advocating for is real. That's right. The need that we're advocating for is real. And, and I think, by the way, who, who did this document come from? This is from um, <coughs> Neil Stanley to Marion Berry. Oh, because I haven't seen that. Well, none of us have seen In that. that document, it says 70%. Wait a minute. No. Wait a minute. Did we have Phil? Phil. 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 Let me say this. Yes, sir. Is that? Oh, uh, there will be. Wait a minute. The court order. He asked for the next. Phil. We asked for the court order, and we saw it. It specified 286 positions. That's all. Not 70 percent. And they led. Just because somebody says it's true doesn't mean it's true. I think uh, Mr. McDuffie, as a lawyer, can t tell you that. People can say anything. And we want to back up behind that. So it's 286 is, is the minimum staffing to satisfy Jerry M. The court said that. If the issue is, as Tommy put it, that there's a need for these beds, that's one thing. If the issue is we're going to cut DYRS, that's another thing. Sure. No, no. It's the first. It's the first. Hmm? That, that, that's not David. Uh, David Catania has the floor. I've got finished. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sure, I have one minute. In the sense that it's both. More, more beds. We have to keep talking. More beds and also... Where do you get $3.8 million of that crippling anybody? So what I'd like to suggest is that I work with uh, our budget staff to see if they can be of an assistance in making suggestions about where we go anywhere in that, in that cluster. You know, we got over a billion dollars in the DHS human services budget. And the question is, where can we find $3.8 million without injuring anybody? without violating the court order. That's all I'm asking. David? Uh, thank you. Um, Jim, you have uh, an additional $1.5 million for rapid rehousing, uh, and you classify that as an expansion of the service. That's made, maybe the, that's the way it's characterized here, and I don't know if that is the way it is intended to be, but my understanding was we had funding for 600 individuals but the mayor, as part of FY14, in reaction to a failed housing policy, has added another 500 spaces for a total of 1,100. That we have spaces? An additional. The mayor's budget includes 500 additional spaces that are unfunded, that are part of the 14 budget. All right? So, so we had 600 originally plus 500 that were added as part of, you know, this emergency effort to fund folks. So you have 
1,100 people. If I may, I May I finish? Yes, of course. So if you have 1,100 people that are presently uh, either in rapid rehousing or funded for rapid rehousing, given the fact that only about 10 percent of people are leaving rapid rehousing, it isn't as if, you know, even though the program is intended only for a year, if 90 percent are remaining past a year, you needn't, we, we need to be funding the program for the 1,100 minus 10 percent, not five or 600. Do you follow me? Well, let me start over. As part of a failed housing policy, the mayor added 500 additional rapid rehousing spaces in this fiscal year. So you refer to the finance? Yes. But, but if, that's why I wanted to just pause you a minute, because not all of those are rapid rehousing. Some of them are, are, are emergency rental assistance, some of them are permanent supportive housing. And so it's not all rapid rehousing. Nonetheless, they are, they are tethered to a one-year max. Whether we, whatever we call them. No, they're recertified. It's for one year. But they are recertified. Well, I've, I've got to make a factual correct. They're recertified every four months. The, the addition from the Committee on Economic Development is of $1.5 million for rapid rehousing for individuals. I missed that. When you mentioned the 500 families, it distracted me. But this is a, for individuals. So, so we have, we had uh, 600 slots, whether they are for individuals or families, the mayor added 500 no. as part of this FY14. Well, we have different information, Jim. So the 500 is the homeless family. And so you, but there needs to be a budget to fund it. And the rapid rehousing funding, the rapid rehousing budget for 14, for FY14, if I'm not mistaken, is 14 and a half million dollars for FY14. The mayor added additional slots of five or six hundred and added a million dollars. For there's veterans, a, that's for veterans. There is now, there, there is a million and a half that's coming, whether for individuals or housing. So whether they're individuals or for, or for families, you know, we, it, is, it seems to me we need a whole lot more than the money that we have set aside to fund it. It, is, it presupposes that people come and at the end of the year leave. And that's not what's happening. They're staying. So what I'm asking is whether they're single individuals or family individuals, aren't we building a budget pressure in rapid rehousing today? With or without the million and a half? Okay, let me, let me just say, uh, the, the, the money said I think you, there was no increase from the mayor. There was one million dollar increase from the mayor for rapid rehousing, am I right? in his budget. This would add another 1.5 million, but I don't think it's 500, I don't know where the 500 comes from. So, typically, we have funded rapid rehousing for, for families, and you are correct, you know, it's, it's, it's a minimum of four months with recertifications every four months up to a two-year period. Up to a one-year period. One year. One Actually, year. technically, it can go up to two. But they, they, I, I, they I, never, I understand. They never do that. <laughs> Last year, the council funded a five hundred or four hundred thousand dollar pilot to try out rapid rehousing for individuals, um, and because rapid rehousing tends to be much more successful for individuals who don't have a lot of other pressures with 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 children and more expensive apartments and so on and so forth. So, what this one point five million will do will extend the pilot for individuals. There was, there were no funds in the mayor's proposed budget for rapid rehousing for individuals. It was just the money we put in last year. Yes. Those were one-time funds. This 1.5 million will essentially extend that pilot just for individuals. And increase it. So for really families. Exactly. It for enhance for enhance families, it. though, isn't rapid rehousing just another form of, of the Supplemental rent program if they are not leaving the program. Is that what we're, they that what we're creating? <coughs> they do leave the program, and this is one of the problems with DC General because they don't want to enroll in this for fear that they're going to be right back. Well, the evidence, Jim, I have is that only about 10 percent of those eligible to leave when their time expires are in fact leaving. So I wonder whether or not we're creating, you know, by virtue of what is intended to be a temporary program. If because people, for whatever reason, aren't leaving, 
we're creating just another form of a rent supplemental you. program. I hear you, and I think we need to we need to ask a question, which I don't have the answer for right now. But I suspect I know that not none go on more than a year. So, so the people that's pretty much a drop dead date for not only everybody. There may be some extraordinary situation. So so they're not they're not not leaving. They're leaving. They're being put out of that program after a year or less. Well, then maybe, but we can ask the question, how many are extended beyond a year? I don't think we're going to find very many. The evidence that I have seen is that from January of 13 to January of 14, only 10 percent of those in the program exited. Only 10 percent. But had they been in there for a year? I think it's a little more um, complicated than that. I was at um, DHS meeting with the landlords. Uh, talk about rapid rehousing and the way the system really works is that the individual signs the lease but um, in many instances and this was the term that was used in many instances uh, the um, individual will I guess default on the lease and then the government picks up the responsibility while the um, landlord is trying to uh, go through the eviction process. So, in fact, uh, we are guaranteeing that whatever monies are paid out for um, the ultimate cost of the lease do, in fact, uh, are, are extended. Well, on a larger issue, though, for homeless services, if, if I could just, I'm almost finished, Mr. Barry. Um, on a larger issue, we budgeted $111 million for homeless the services in FY15, or FY14. The year we are in, uh, my understanding is that the budget of what we will actually spend is closer to 125 million. Mm -hmm. So we have a 14 million dollar spending pressure in 14. And so, if our budget for all homeless services in 15 is 115.8 million dollars, help me understand why that isn't creating a 10 million dollar spending pressure for 15. That's just. And I, you know, I defer to you, Jim. You're the chairman of the committee. I don't sit on your committee, but it seems to me that if we, it seems to me there's a delta. And so, how will we narrow that gap? Yeah. Well, there's no million dollars in ten of carryover funds that are being used, but I think that for fifteen, the question, yeah, for, no, for fourteen. The, the, the question is on my mind, and we're all aware of the family homelessness crisis that occurred. Is it okay? Is the budget okay? If you have relevant information, I'd like to hear it. You were exactly correct in mentioning the Say nine million. In, in the nine million of, of ten, there is nine million of ten of carryover that's being Into used 14. in fourteen, right. and the agency has indicated to us that they do not believe that they will be able to have access to the same TAN of carryover funds for 15. So that, that jives with what you're saying, that there's, you know, a built-in $10 million spending pressure. Right. Well, what I was saying was Thank that you. there's a, we had a family homelessness crisis. And the question that I have asked is this, the newest program to, to have 500 exits from hotels in D.C. general by July 15th, uh, 500 100 days is called, but by July 15th. The question I've asked is for a detailed budget on how much that's costing, because that's important to understand. It's, it's not $9.4 million. The amount that we will expand. Well, that's the hotels. The, the hotels are not the hotels. hotels will be not the hotels, million. No. Yeah, but I'd like to just finish it because that's for the the number you mentioned is for the hotels. A hotel budget has gone from 3.2 to 9.4, but the process of moving people out of both hotels and DC General to the tune of 500 families is going to have a cost in terms of the subsequent residents and other costs. And what I am trying to figure out and have not been successful, perhaps you have, is getting any detail on this spending from, from, from the mayor's office. So that may be contributing also to this pressure, is what, to answer your question. But absent specific information on what the current initiative is costing us, it's hard to say. And for some reason, I mean, it's, this is money that I don't believe are in the budget, even with the $9 million carryover tariff. There's more involved here. And I, I, I share your concern, actually, that there's a budget pressure here in the future. But 
it's hard to pin it down as to what it is. And the numbers we have show the balance. Yeah, I know. The numbers that we have show a balanced budget, and that's what we're doing. with is a balanced budget, and we go from there. Mr. Chairman, let me finish by saying, Mr. Graham, I'm not trying to indict the work of the Committee on Human Services. I'm just looking at expenditures, what is budgeted, and trying to understand, you know, where that 10 million may come from, and that's all. And that's a fair question. I'm saying it's a fair question. There's no indictment here whatsoever. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Originally, the ERAP doesn't work as well for homeless families as it does for individuals. No, rapid rehousing. Rapid rehousing. And so the, what we're doing is there's not we, the council, but we, the government, or the executive, are misaligning the dollars. Right. And that for the families, it would make more sense that it would make sense for more dollars to be in permanent supportive housing that's, than that's, in that's right. rapid rehousing. No, 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 no not true. Qualify. And not all of them qualify for it. Yes, but the success, the, the, success rate with, 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 the success rate with rapid rehousing is higher with individuals than it is with families, which would suggest that rapid rehousing is better, um, better aligned with individuals, not exclusively. And we know that permanent supportive housing, because that relieves a lot of pressures that stabilize a family, that that may be better for a family. But that's that not. Correct. Correct. And my sense is that not necessarily align with single family. Yes, but, but my sense is that what DHS is doing is trying to get these families out of the hotels. They're just putting them in rapid rehousing, right. because that's a quick fix, and the dollars are there but not necessarily the best fix. And my point is that they, they often go into the rapid rehousing and they don't exit. And we are creating another form of a rent supplement. And so without the stability that comes with a rent supplement. No, I get your point, David, but what I'm saying is they don't have a voucher. So it's not actually mm -hmm. creating that, that uh, unending entitlement because they don't which have a voucher. Which PSA shows. Yeah. Perhaps that's the direction, though, we need to look at. So are, are the dollars aligned appropriately between between rapid rehousing and uh, permanent support? Well, we never used rapid rehousing for individuals until just this pilot program that Jen has, uh, has described. It was always used for families. And so we, we've had a very brief experience with it thus far, which I don't think has been the subject of uh, analysis to see how well it has worked. But you do, we must keep in mind that permanent supportive housing has some very, very high barriers that people must meet in terms of standards. Not every family, not every individual is eligible for permanent supportive housing. In fact, it's just a fraction of those who are homeless in terms of, of families. So I think we've got to use all the tools at our command. And, and, but when you have permanent supportive housing, you have a voucher. And a voucher is good. It's good. Uh, on rapid rehousing, you have a promise of, and I don't think, uh, we can check this, David, but I, I don't think anybody, anybody much is staying beyond a year in rapid rehousing. I'm sorry, what's that? The same thing there, Jim. I, I don't think they do. And in fact, the, the stories out here in my office are more often the case that they're moving out after four months and being forced to move out after four months and that they would like to extend to a year and can't even get to a year. So I don't think there's a, you know, going to be an issue there, but it's something we should keep a close eye on given the fact that this is such a new approach. Anita, do you want to be recognized? I, I, I just really wanted to add to the conversation. It just sounds like the more we talk about the different ways in which we can help people uh, with housing, we're talking about the local uh, rent supplement program and making sure that we have enough uh, revenue in that particular program to meet the needs because it, it seems a little clear from the discussion, if nothing else, that um, our families, which we care deeply about trying to get out of the shelters, are the category of um, individuals that really need the most assistance, um, especially as we look at the, the children that are 
in these situations. And so it seems to me we want to make sure that we have enough funds in a program that we know can assist them. And um, we know that um, not everyone is in who is homeless as a family qualifies for um, public housing, but we certainly can assist them with housing if for the needs of the children, if not for no other reason. So. Yeah, I, I've just told that eight, they've done a survey actually of permanent supportive housing among homeless families. Eight to ten percent qualify. So we're talking about a very small number. Yeah, so you have to have another way in the yeah, local what does supplement that mean eight to 10 program. Qualify. Eight to ten percent actually get on the program. No, actually, eight to ten percent meet the requirements of receiving permanent supportive housing, which includes a voucher. Wow. Mr. Chair, what about the three point eight million dollars for these? It's not just you know, positive. kids. What was the part, of the part of the issue here is whether DS, DHS is assessing people and then placing them in the most effective yeah. program, whether it's rapid rehousing or permanent supportive housing or the local rent, local rent supplement program. Well, I, I, I will assume that to a considerable extent that is happening. That there is being, we have very, very detailed assessments. You know, there are 104 pages and they take three hours. Mary? Yes, Jim, I don't know how this has been worked into the budget, if at all, but if the mayor truly is able to um, get families out of uh, DC General and put them in other housing, that obviously will cost money, but won't we also save money by closing DC General? And are they, is this aligning? The timing of that? Could you just explain how that's well, going to work? Well, I don't think the mayor is incorporating any savings from, from the D.C. general exit. But in fact, when we do close D.C. general, which you know, I hope, will be very soon, uh, because it's just uh, it's just totally unsuccessful uh, in what we want to accomplish, is that we'll save $1.4 million a month in operating. And so with $1.4 million a month, we're able to do quite a lot in terms of smaller appropriate housing for families, housing that has bathrooms and kitchens and bedrooms, not eight people in a hospital room. And so this is what our intentions are. Okay, and then the other thing I wanted to ask you, which may fall outside of your committee, but they probably should be synergistic. As you know, Mayor de Blasio in New York has made a vigorous effort to identify abandoned property uh, or uh, vacant property, you know, just empty space, and either with public-private partnerships or directly with um, um, government money to put up housing so that uh, we have the kind of housing that we need available for people. Is your committee working with whomever, maybe economic development, I don't know, to, to identify how much we think we need for affordable housing and how we're going to get it? Right. I just want to say before uh, Councilmember McDuffie speaks, because it is within his purview, we've talked about this for years and years and years. You know, all of these buildings that we suppose. But I mean, not talking about actually having a plan and doing it. No, I, but you know, we rely on the Department of General Services to, to both identify the buildings that are appropriate and also turn them into usable spaces. And I don't know why, the, my answer to your question is I don't know why there hasn't been a greater concentration of initiative on that. I don't know why. Uh, Mary, the answer is simple. Nobody has done that. The mayor has not done it. Mayor. So we should make them do it. How? Oh. Yes, Muriel? Yes. Can you Direct tell them? them to do it. Um, Give me the secret. I don't know. So DHCD does have a, a, um, a section about vacant property acquisition, like private, not, not government spaces, but vacant unit acquisition, including single family and multifamily. Um, so we have concentrated, and they have an increased budget for that in this year to, so that the government can acquire um, private property that's vacant for any number of reasons, tax liens and other things. What we're likely to need and how we're going to get to what we need. I just have been reminded that this $500,000 in response to my demands for closing the facility, the mayor put $500,000 in the DGS budget in FY14, so it's not before us, that is for that very purpose to identify alternate building sites. Hopefully owned by the D.C. government so we could save some money. 
the chairman of the thing. No. It's the acquisition. No, may I just add uh, to give you the conventions because we've been started with them on this last year, so they responded this year by going from 3.5 million to 6.7 million in that vacant property acquisition. Some of the problems, though, at with with these similar programs is they haven't actually gotten the money out um, the door and they haven't spent it. So this, the coming in the upcoming year, there'll be a focus on that. They also charge too much to the So some of these corporations can't acquire them to do the tellers so affordable housing are necessary to address some of the concerns we're talking about. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, let me wrap this up. My yeah, but you haven't been recognized. <laughs> I mean, Tommy, is, Mr. Berry. I don't think that it should be Totally, the responsibility of Mr. Graham, Ms. Barn, other members of the community, to identify this 3.8. So I'm not putting that money, 3.8, in the hands of our chair and working with your budget staff. I do all of that, but I, I, I advocate for this program. I just talked to Deborah Short this morning about that, and so now it's your, it's yours, Mr. Chairman. So, like some other thing, like Jack put a lot of stuff in here. I'm putting it right in on the table. The need is great. Nobody disagrees with the need. The question is how do we do it? And I can't believe in an $11 billion budget, we can't find $3.8 million to take care of these young people who are homeless and been homeless for some time. So that's where I end up. And the other question is about housing. I think the city has been too mad great, derelict, in, in keeping D.C. Journal open as long as he has, with that squalor out there, you will come in the bathroom. Can you imagine living in a situation where you had to go down the hall, the first way I got to put something on, house coat or something, go to the hall with the bathroom that everybody else uses. It's, it's overcrowded. So that's a serious problem. Graham and I have debated this question with ourselves. Is it better to have hotel rooms than to have nothing? And he and I have come to the conclusion it's better to have hotel rooms. Because when I came in, the mayor, we had 700 families out of Cap City uh, Hotel. We, we closed it. So, so now these $3.8 million I'm bringing to the committee of all for you all to deal with. Thank you very much. <laughs> Mr. Wells. There's really two funding issues. The first one is that up until this administration, we had emptied out D.C. General entirely by spring. Right. And so that there would be no families there, and so the carrying costs would not be as great. So the first thing is the degree to which we're able to get back to, to having all the families housed and D.C. General being essentially vacant by spring. The second issue, of course, is you're always going to have some level of homeless families. That's not a question of affordable housing. That's not a question of those other type scattered buildings, per se. So is there any capital dollars for replacing or a plan for creating an emergency, for creating an emergency facility of some kind, or if there to be more than one for the, the homeless families? But that's, that's really the, the two things, is that do we have the funds invested to be able to get D.C. General to empty? And then the question would be, do we have the capital funds and program plan to get D.C. General closed? Two issues. Tell me, even under the mayor's program of 500 units in 100 days, which I don't think he's going to meet. I mean, I think it's impossible to get 500 units in 100 days, so we'll see what happens. And I'm, as you know, a very good friend and supporter of Mayor Gray, but it has not happened in the past. It's growing. Mr. Mr. Uh, Graham and I, Nita, and other members of the committee have been wrestling with the fact that D.C. General is growing, it's, it's bugging out now as it seems, and when you take out those who are there to make up the 500, you still will have, what, 120 families still there. So that's and, the point. And Tommy, you yeah. know, you've been to D.C. General. So the point is, there's no place to live. The first strategy is, can we get D.C. General emptied out, at least by summer? The next thing, question is, if, I mean, You'll save money by then on the D.C. General cost, but are we going to still continue to use D.C. General for this purpose, but something would have to replace it? And that would have to be a separate budget item with a separate plan other than just housing families. 
My name is Stanley Gattani. Okay. I'm, I'm, my intention is to introduce legislation, which I mentioned to you, you know, which would, which would establish legal benchmarks. When, upon meeting them, we would then close DC General. But we want this, to, we all want this to be done in a very orderly, careful way. I, I, I was very pleased that we no longer emptied DC General at the end of hypothermia. Because we put families out on the street at that time. We had no place to go. We just said this, the building is closed. And so we moved away from that into a more year-round facility. But the fact of the matter is that we can put in place emergency shelter for those families. We can have a hotel budget. And we can have smaller buildings so we don't recreate a large facility such as what we have today, which is producing the relational rods and all the other problems that we have there. So I plan on the next opportunity. Is the next opportunity Wednesday, Mr. Chairman, to introduce legislation? Will we have introductions next Wednesday? Uh, probably not. Because no. Additional meeting. You can introduce it in the office of the secretary any time. Well, I'd like to be able to introduce this because I want to get it started. I don't know. Huh? Will you consider a, a special rule for us to introduce this bill? Because we're, we're working very hard on this. Yeah, June 3rd is... Um, well, can't we just have a quick We do... Um, the reading of the law is done at the Committee of the Whole, which was earlier this week and canceled, or at the, legislative, the regular, administrative, regular legislative meeting. Next week is a um, additional legislative meeting. We don't do introductions at additional meetings. Unless you but you can it. file it in right. the office Unless of the you can permit it. You can file in the office of the secretary. Unless you permit it. You can still file in the office of the secretary. But you can permit it. You are permitted to file in the office of the secretary. I, I got it. Are we done with human services? No, we're not. Oh. Did any other members have anything to say about human or ask about human services? Um, yes, Mr. Graham. What happens? Where where would we where would we put the individuals? If the notion is, and, and, and are we being sensitive to what it means for school years for children? Seriously, I mean, the notion that you're simply sure. going to close this, close the shelter midway through a semester or midway through a school year has a whole other series of complicating effects for how you get kids to and from, who some may be enrolled in the neighborhood elementary pain, some may still be going into the school from the community from which the family is displaced. I, I, I appreciate that you want this DC General closed, but how, how do we make sure we minimize the real impact? Mm -hmm. I, I'm going to answer that question, David, is that we be very careful. And we consider all of that, and we have a very, very careful and deliberate plan that takes into account factors such as that. And that's and we also want to engage the people who live at DC General. Because we don't want them thinking this is an edict from on high saying this is what we're going to do. Uh, it's bad there, but it's better than a stairwell. It's better than a bus that's station. That's my thinking, Mr. Craig. Right. And so that's why I, I moved to I originally thought I could get some BSA language that would do all this. But I uh, abandoned that plan in order to have separate independent legislation where there'd be hearings, there'd be consideration of all those issues as we move forward, including the fact that I plan on holding a hearing again at D.C. General itself. And so you're right. All of that needs to be considered. And it's probably is not going to happen this year, but hopefully we'll build the momentum to have it happen. My fear is that we'll go into hyperthermia season. This will be the only available rooms other than hotels, and we'll just start filling it again. And DHS, in its testimony to my committee, left open that possibility that they just start filling the rooms again. And there'll be terrific humanitarian pressure to do just that, and then we'll be right back in duck soup by next February. So I, uh, I will be here next February, but those of you who will, I'm hoping that we can build a momentum so that it will ultimately be closed next year early on, with consideration of such of the issues that you've mentioned. Mr. Chairman, let me wait one point on top of Jim. What's going to happen, first of all, I don't believe the mayor's going to I get 500 units in 100 days. I, I just don't well, we don't know that. I just don't believe it. And I'm a supporter of Mayor Gray. Also, Mr. Graham is right. When hypothermia season comes, we're required by law to find housing for families. And once we Get, take it down from those who are there. When hypothermia comes, it's going to fill right back up. And we determine we'll be in this situation forever in the sense of going back and forth. 
the closed D.C. Journal is a very complicated situation because there are so many things that are affected by this closing. Not only schools, David, but a whole bunch of other things, uh, health clinics and a lot of other things are affected by that. So I don't want to get our hopes up. I'm, I'm a perennial optimist, but I, I'm a realist, too. I know how difficult it is to get 500 families placed in this housing market uh, in 100 days. Well, we ought to just be ready. That's all. There's 600 children in this um, I had two um, questions. So one is um, there's a $550,000 in uh, DHS vacancy savings to support a feasibility study to determine the housing and space needs of the population of the CCNV individual homeless shelter. When you were presenting this, you made it sound like it was coming from the mayor. But if you're redirecting vacancy savings, that suggests it's coming from you. Why do we need to spend 550000 and how did you come up with that? I want to keep the momentum going in terms of um, really envisioning what CCNV ought to be and using the various property relationships at CCNV to the advantage of homeless individuals who are currently served and will be served in the future by that facility. So this is an effort to keep the momentum of our task force, which you know all about, going into the next fiscal year so that we can... But how do you come up with the dollars? The well, task force is not paid, and uh, this no, is no. just a matter of they're looking at this and... No, no, we need to bring in some expert advice at this point. We need to bring in some expert property advice. We need to bring in some expert uh, assistance in terms of what kind of... to envision what kind of shelter we want. We have some basic recommendations which we're going to be presenting literally within days to you. But you'll see that much more needs to be done. Uh, the other issue is... Um, redirecting um, almost $6 million from job training to um, extending TANF benefits. Mm -hmm. My recollection is the history, first of all, I think the optics of taking money out of training uh, is, is very poor. What? Taking money out of TANF job opportunity and training yeah. to um, fund 100%, um, I believe it's 100% benefits in TANF for another year. So there are two sides to this. One is cutting the job training, which I think the optics of that are horrible, because we want these people, the TANF recipients, to get training. And the reality is that, if I remember correctly, under the federal legislation, TANF recipients have five years. And uh, several years ago, we talked about how they were continued on local dollars beyond the federal five years and had continued for years and years on the local. And um, I remember several council members, and I wasn't one of them, argued that it was time that we showed some tough love here. Mm -hmm. And there was an argument that, well, we can't do that because they haven't been assessed. And if they haven't been assessed, then they can't really help themselves. Well, they've been assessed. And uh, so that obstacle or that rationale for delay was met. They've all been assessed. And uh, so then what my understanding is that the next issue was that there was a step down in the benefits. Rather than losing them 100 percent in one year, it'd be stepped down. And last year we delayed it at your urging. But here we are uh, coming up on that delay, materializing. That is that the, they're going to see a 40 percent, 42 percent cut in their benefits. If we fully fund them, <coughs> which I think is kind of breaking breaking the promise that we made to ourselves a year ago or three years ago, um, then what will happen is next year, that is the year after this, they will lose their benefits entirely. So instead of stepping down, they'll just hit the cliff. And I don't think that's good either. So it's like the issue with TANA, first of all, we shouldn't be taking money out of training. And second of all, we've already delayed and delayed and delayed and uh, now this delay will mean that they hit a cliff in a year and they'll just go from their benefits to zero instead of stepping down and that doesn't seem right either. May, may i respond to that yes absolutely. let me start by well let me start by emphasizing what is for me the most compelling number in this whole situation of those who are going to face this 41 percent cut of those who are going to have monthly benefits drop to 150 dollars a month for a family of three 
11,799 of those people are under the age of 13. 11,799 people are under the age of 13. I believe they will be the real victims of this. Well, Let me finish. You, asked, you, gave me, you, gave, you gave me the opportunity to respond. The premise, the premise of the step down, which we've had several step downs, this is the final cut. The premise of the step down that we would have in place programs that would move people from welfare dependency to self-sufficiency. And I have a great deal of information today as a result of the hearings held by my committee on just what kind of success we've experienced. And I can, can report to you in a general fashion, I can give you all sorts of numbers on this, that our programs are just not that successful. I mentioned this earlier when I responded to Councilmember Wells' comment about uh, returning citizens and how hard it was for them to get jobs. We're producing very, very few jobs of a full-time nature. Very, very, very few jobs where people can sustain themselves without welfare of one kind or another. And so I'm just saying that we're not ready for this huge cut now. Now, those of you who are going to be here next year can talk about whether they, they go over the cliff on October the 1st, 2015. I'm here this year, and I don't think we're prepared to cut a family in this fashion because these families don't have jobs. They don't have jobs. I mean, it's the state of Georgia at the end of the 60 months said, you're finished, goodbye, send a card, send a postcard if you find work. That's what the state of Georgia did. The state of California has not done anything on this like this. The state of New York is doing it in an extremely phased fashion. I want to follow those examples, not Georgia. I want to follow those examples and say, we've, we've got programs in place, they're getting better, but let's get them even better still before we do it. The second point you make is about optics. Optics. The fact of the matter is that the TANF employment program is being increased nearly double what it was, what it is this year, nearly double. And I think a reduction of about $5.8 million in order to save these, the most vulnerable people, the most vulnerable families in this entire city from going to $150 a month as the, as the benefit for a family of three. And we still have plenty of money and we have plenty of increase in the town of employment program. There's a huge increase still there. And then there are also savings that haven't been realized and so on and so forth. I don't th there may be optics about this, but the reality is that this, this is going to be okay. I'm sure. You're cutting the training budget by 10%. I am cutting, no. More I'm than not. 10? But it's being increased by 50% and then we're reducing it by a But period. the training program is the biggest need in order to get these but people we're increasing off of welfare Mr. Chairman, we're increasing it. Yes, Mr. Chairman. This committee, led by Mr. Graham and myself, I'm on, on, joined later by Anita, is that Take whatever help you can get. It, is, it, is, it is difficult for TANF recipients to get a job. We've had almost complete failure in the private sector of getting people jobs. We all believe in self-sufficiency. But if you look at the reality, 95%, 95% of all the TANF recipients, the few that we've had, end up with minimum wage jobs. And the TANF recipients will tell you that if you have to go work at minimum wage and then lose your cash benefits, it's better to stay home because it's make more by staying home than out there. So we ought to look at the reality, Mr. Chairman. In this town, it is very, very difficult, almost impossible, to get a significant number of tenant workers into jobs of any kind. Look at, I don't have the numbers, and Jim has them better than I do, but I think it's wrong to train people and jobs don't exist. It, it is wrong to do that. And so what Jim Graham is talking about, which all of us in the committee support, is if you've got to choose between taking $6 million out of a $20 million increase to keep these babies, and all those 11,000 of them, from suffering, because what happens, these parents, unfortunately, are not going to deprive themselves of a cut. I know. I, I know enough of them. I've been around enough of them. They're going to take it from their kids, and then these kids are going to suffer. And my issue here is very simple. This is not a perfect solution. It's really not a hardly any solution, 
but it's better than what we are talking about. So I don't think you ought to even begin to talk about not restoring these benefits. I've had this debate with Mayor Gray. This is not the way you get people self-sufficient. This is not the way you do it, by training people for jobs that don't exist. I was talking to a lady the other day at UDC who uh, is in the business of trying to place tenants. I was going home, and she stopped me and said, what are we going to do about these private sector employers who will to hire these TANF people, particularly TANF mothers who have records? So they got a double whammy. Uh, they're poor, they have records, and don't have many skills. And then you got a private sector that won't hire them. So I think we ought to be looking at the other side of it. What do we do to get this private sector, there are 300,000 jobs in the private sector. How do we get the private sector entering into partnership with us to get some jobs? Not only just TANF, but unemployment, unemployed people. So what's going on now, addressing the issue that you're making, though, man? Huh? What we're doing now is essentially saying we're going to keep them on the benefits. And I understand the argument that you make to do that. But that's not what the chairman said. The chairman yeah. said, why do we cut, why do, why, why do we keep these people on welfare, it keeps them there forever, as opposed to trying to take increments of training them and, and as opposed to getting the private sector to hire some of these people. That's well, I, I said the point that you're making, though, about getting the private sector to hire some of these people isn't being addressed about what we're doing in the human services budget. And it, and it goes to the point I think the chairman is making. At some point, they're not going to have the benefit. And, and whether there's a short-term goal of trying to keep the benefit so they can stay themselves and their kids, which I understand the case that you're making, um, but then in the same breath, you're taking money away from job training. So, so if you're training them for jobs that don't exist, that goes to the issue of workforce development and why we're doing that. They has been all I have now. Well, we got to address that then. Let's address right. that issue as well. How are you going to address the fact that some of these employees would not hire these people? Well, we train them for the jobs that do exist. They don't have any that exist. Business, business and professional development, right. education, and education health care. Uh, hospitality, uh, they're, they're jobs that are here in this market. We we, we got to make sure we have a sector will hire able-bodied people who don't have these barriers for employment. We won't have them. Okay, I'm finished with David. David, Jim, with the respect to training for um, recipients, what kind of evaluation is done for the recipients before they're put into training, and do they receive a stipend while in training? And the reason I'm asking is that, um, you know, if in, an individual is receiving a stipend but is herself or himself functionally illiterate, there is the incentive to go to training to get the stipend, but you don't get the benefit. Do we know the level? And I, and I think this is something the Workforce Investment Board is presently wrestling with because they have ended the practice of giving training options for people who aren't, from a literacy perspective, able to actually enjoy the benefit of the training. Does that make sense? We need to know, and do we know, Jim, do we assess the individuals prior to going to the training to see if they're actually in a place to, you know, um, benefit from it? The answer is that we have today a very extensive assessment. And along the lines of what you're talking about, I said, I, I wasn't exaggerating. It's something like 104 pages. It takes three hours to, to administer. There's a very thoughtful consideration of that before they're submitted. Of literacy and computation? Of all, of all the barriers. And substance abuse, mental health, um, criminal records, you know, whatever the barriers are. We do have subsidized employment. And we have vendors who are, who are, who are distributing the subsidized employment, which really is a leg up on all of this. But I don't believe that we pay people to actually attend the trainings as such. Well, Mr. Graham, isn't there something we can do about the 100 plus page application process? I mean, that seems like a lot of administrative busy work on a certain level. Well, I'd like you to look at that, if I may refer to you, and, and I'm right. pushing your thoughts, because I, I've experienced the same thing as you're expressing. 
It seems like they have confiscated benefits. They get their cash benefits. Mr. Graham, just asking, Mr. Graham, just bear with me. And then we also have an individualized responsibility plan, an IRP, which they add on to with DHS. Do you know what the tool looks like to assess a person's computation and literacy prior to going into training? I'm, I'm not interested in the gateway questions mm -hmm. so much as, you know, if we're setting people up to succeed, or are question. we setting them up to fail? It's a good question by a chairman of the Education Committee. It's a very good question. I'm serious. No, I'm not being responsibility here. I've been very sincere in responding yeah. to you because it's a very good question. I want to look into that. No, no, he's asking a different, he's asking a specific on the literacy question. If we don't have a careful look at that, if we don't really truly assess the abilities there, are we setting then we're up setting them up, we got it. The, one of the big problems we have in the TEP program, tenant employment program, is no shows. We have 50% of the people who are being referred who simply don't show up for the vendors to do anything with. And I, we found this, I really covered this at our hearing in September. And I have pressed DHS, and we finally got a special outreach program to go to these folks because they, and there, there are a large number of these who are at the 60-month mark, by the way, who have simply not shown up. Now, you can say that's irresponsible, and it is irresponsible, but I remind you of the 11,077 or 99 kids under the age of 13. They've got nothing to do with their parental decision in this regard, and they're the ones who are going to suffer. I'm only asking for a pause of a year. Then those of you who are here next year, Mr. Madison, Mr. No, not pause of a year. It was a pause of a year. Mr. Mr. Chairman, may I just finish my point? Let's finish my point. Mr. Chairman, if I just could finish the point. The point is. We need to be looking more carefully at what, whether or not we're setting people up to succeed for legitimate training. And if on average your training program requires an eighth grade reading level, and let's assume that it does, if, you're, if your customers have a fourth grade reading level or a fourth grade math computation, which is not uncommon because of the legacy of a failed public education system, I don't know how you, you ask a person with a fourth grade level to do eighth grade and expect them to be engaged and to succeed. But I'm just hypothesizing, Mr. Graham. What I want to know is do we have a real assessment of, of the person's literacy and computation prior to them in going into the training to see if they're properly set up? I got it. I think you made a good point. All right, that's all. Not twice. But it's okay, I got it. It's a very good point, and we're going to figure this out. It would help me in your point. position if I knew that. You see what well, I'm saying? I'm also concerned about substance abuse issues, and I'm concerned about mental health issues. I mean, there are other barriers to employment besides literacy. Literacy is one, but these others are as well. And when we have 50% no show, that leads me back to some of these other issues. And it's not that they can't read or write at the eighth grade level, it's because they're maybe too, just too, too high to respond, too indifferent, too sick with one problem or another. And that's what we've got to, you know, what we're doing here is trying to solve poverty. We're trying to solve poverty in the District of Columbia. That's what this is about. We're trying to solve ingrained generational poverty. I ain't got no magic wand, none of us do. And the fact of the matter is we're doing the best thing we can by providing these, these, these trainings and employment opportunities, but they're not just ready yet. No. Yeah, no, I just no. want to, and Phil, I understand your point, and I know that we've had this conversation every um, year, but we're also having a conversation about how we keep people housed. Um, and to the extent that these cash payments um, in one um, way or another are helping people on the very fringe stay in housing. So we can cut these benefits to nothing. We can take this cut now. We can take it next year. But the fact of the matter is we're more than likely going to see that family again in a more expensive situation. So part of our issues with housing and homelessness are how we keep people in their houses to begin with. Um, so I don't know if, if you can tell, Jim, how many folks um, are, you know, what housing situation that they're in um, and what uh, this reduction is doing to their ability to stay housed. But I think that's something that we have to keep in mind because we can take this cut now, we can take it next year, and then we'll be talking about where they're going to be living. It will be a family homelessness crisis such as what we had in February, except worse. Chairman, is the money coming from the right place? 
Mr. Chairman, in terms of Okay. Yeah, but that's that's kind of you know that's my question to you. No, I'm asking to you because I I, I get. I, don't, I think the TANF benefits are so little based on what Jim has said in the past. Whether it's cut to 150 dollars or whether it's uh, what just under 300 dollars for a family of three, that that's not about housing. And I don't know what their housing situation is. I don't know if they're already in public housing Mr. or Chair. whether they're doubling up with a larger family or several families. I don't know what their housing situation or whether they're already homeless. Um, I don't think of, and nobody's ever talked about TANF as being a housing program. No, it's not a, it's, TANF is not, it's, but, you know, to have housing, you have to have money. I and it's an income here, maintenance program. I, I, I think the issue here is, well, for, first of all, I, I, I'm pressing this issue because this is an issue that's important to the mayor, and the council has had this argument every year and uh, we, I, I think, you know, we have to be honest to the public and to ourselves since we have this debate every year, as well as to the yeah. mayor with what we're going to do. Mm -hmm. And every year we talk about one more year, and that's what we're talking about now, <coughs> one more year. And yes, Jim is absolutely right. What we're talking about is poverty here. And uh, I think most of us probably don't agree with the compromise that was struck by the federal government in the 1990s, which was uh, basically welfare to work. But that's what it is. Uh, but, you know, in a sense, that's what this discussion is as well. I think both Marion and Jim have spoken about um, not wanting welfare dependents. But I, I don't see any, I don't, to be honest with you, I don't see any roadmap from either of you to end that welfare dependence. Whereas I do see with the, what the executive has fitfully tried to do, a roadmap, and I say fitfully, because um, they've talked about increasing the job training benefits, which are now being cut. Chairman, and they talked about Chairman, doing the assessments. David. Um, yeah, I'm just curious, though. I mean, it seems to me like with this enormous size of the budget, I mean, why can't we do both these things? And I guess I'm just confused by that. I don't do both. Why can't we have keep the 5.8 million in the job? opportunity and training to keep people moving forward towards lack of dependence and then also delay these cuts in TANF. So uh, where is, I mean, is there, uh, everyone always talks about, and I haven't, I mean, I have honestly have not dug into the human services budget, but everyone always talks about how much money is in there. Um, and maybe a big chunk of it is one thing or another, but it just seems to me like 5.85 um, could be found in some other aspect of this budget. And so why haven't we been able to dig that out? Well, this, is, this has been a difficult process along the very lines that you've described. And uh, this is, uh, Mr. Barry is trying to get 3.5 million. I wanted to join with him in that for youth homelessness. We could not get it certified. We got certified, but we got certified and we went, you know, I figured that a, an area which was getting a $20 million increase could afford a $5 million decrease on the $20 million increase. That you know, and, and these are difficult decisions, but this is what I thought we could live with, because there's still a huge increase, in so far as the optics, there's still a huge increase in terms of the amount of money available for employment. Is okay. there is there some way to uh, go through it? I mean, maybe you already have done this, but and I, like I said, I'm not on the committee, so I'm not sure what what process was taken. But is there some way to go line by line and really identify where the savings can be in other programs, so that we can actually come to a conclusion of how much we have to move around and then as a committee, you know, as a council, try to decide what, what it is we want to spend well, this on. Let's just ask Jim Rudolph. I mean, have we been doing through this process, Jim? Um, I'm going to speak for her. I mean, it's oh. not money. What? It just is not money. There's no money. There's no money in this budget? Mr. Chairman, How much money is in the human services budget? We're about more than something in the community. Uh, I, I am not... I am not aware of margin in the human services budget. And the person who would know better than I is Jim Grant. Well, Mr. Chairman, I'm not recommending that there's necessarily a margin. What I'm saying is maybe we need to start taking an honest look at pitting one priority against another and really prioritizing what our, you know, what our commitments are and where we want to go from there. I mean, this is not necessarily, I'm not necessarily saying you're going to find new money. I'm saying that maybe we need to look closely at other programs and see if they're really what the council priority is and then find the money that way. 
and move from one program to another. I just I'm not a big fan of taking it out of this, you know, opportunity and training, you know, job opportunity and training because I do think that hamstrings the potential for a person to move out of, you know, kind of dependence on on the government in Montana. So but there's still a fifteen million dollar increase, David. There's still a fifteen million dollar increase for next year. So it's not like several times. No, it's it's his committee, and he I hasn't spoken at all. Um, Were you done, David? Yeah. No, I was waiting to hear the response. I thought that David Mr. Graham has, was responding. David still has the floor. I just want to emphasize. I'm afraid David, I agree with you. I agree with you, David. I just want to agree with you, and then I agree with you. This is not where I would like to go, but it's of all the options that we have, this seemed the most attractive. It's not, limited, it's not very attractive, but it was the most palatable because there is a $15 million increase still in this area. So it's not as if they were really, you know, stripping the program. Okay. There's a huge increase coming. There's an additional $10 million of federal money uh, that's coming into this in the mayor's budget. What do those eyes look like? Not. That's what they told us. Uh, yes. You better not um, say well, there are choices, but the choices may not necessarily be within the committee. There are other items yeah. that we're spending money on, and... Uh, I'm well, not going to offer said. up any, but in, in the course of the discussion today, we've talked about a number of initiatives that uh, uh, committees have found funding for. It's still an and, increase. Um, those dollars are available. We can still an increase. Well, I didn't hear, though, sure that people were saying we shouldn't do it. But uh, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm in a way, repeating what you're saying, because it is true that if members really want to find this money um, and not cut the TAN of training, well, maybe there's another committee that has some It means probably cutting something that they've uh, well, we just, well, we just visited transportation and... Uh, yeah, well, all right, Anita? You notice how tremulous I was in even, <laughs> even making the suggestion. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to uh, kind of oh, add yeah, to this yes. because yes. I like um, David Grasso's idea that maybe we need to look at this as a category that we may have to revisit. Uh, we have tomorrow, and maybe we can think about it and figure out how we do both. Um, both are necessary, but I do have, uh, having been on the council a few months now, I have a better understanding of how our so-called training money is used or is not used effectively. And I, I won't speak on it a particular matter at this moment, but I certainly reserve an opportunity to speak on that, um, having learned that there are individuals who will take a job and will work to a certain extent and then will leave the job because they know that they are entitled to certain benefits that they also get. And that's another category of of situation and I think that we have to deal with when we're trying to reduce poverty as, 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 a, as a whole uh, focus. But I think we all agree that we have to have housing for the people who, who live in the District of Columbia. And so it's not an easy task, but likewise for those who have been the dependents um, on society. We want to try to move them out of dependency into the world of work, uh, the world of moving forward in some way or the other. And so I think that's, that's part of our job and a bigger part of the job. I mean, government has to um, assist those who are least able to take care of themselves first and foremost. And um, we have a lot of money in the District of Columbia, and we um, toot our horn about that every day as we talk about, you know, the prosperity of our society here in D.C. And I just think that as we're doing that, we need to figure out how we're going to make some of these small little programs, you know, 15 million, 5 million, 3 million, 1 million, Maybe, you know, it, they're tiny, but um, we've got to figure out how to make it work. Because if we do not have um, the resources for people who are poor, um, something happens to them, and they're no longer part of our society. So then what's the point in building schools? 
uh, what's the point in um, uh, being concerned about our transportation systems? So I, I just say that we need to deal with, with this issue um, and hopefully we will be able to do it in the next day or so. End of my recitation. Thank you. Uh, Muriel, uh, did you have anything else on this issue? Uh, before I go to you, anybody else on this issue? On, on, Mary? Thank you very much. I'm having this discussion. And let me just point out something very, very clearly. This particular problem is not just peculiar to the District of Columbia. Every urban city in America is wrestling with this, wrestling with this. And what I don't like is that some people on this council expect this committee to come up with a perfect solution to solve this problem. What we're talking about is generations of poverty, generations of poverty. The 18,000 families on Tanif here. I suspect when you do an analysis, a significant number of them their mother was on welfare. Their grandmothers were on welfare. And the national government, the local government, had created a sense of dependency. People are dependent, dependent. And it's taken the committee moving heaven and earth to even get the, the people at DHS even talking about self-sufficiency, talking about self-sufficiency. So in terms of the training money, I would hope that I would ask each of you to look at what's been done with the money that we've had. It has ended up with few jobs commensurate with the amount of money we spent, $18 million last year. Very few jobs. The, another point I'd like to make, we can't blame the victims for their victimization. Nobody in this room can decide when you were born where you were born, what color you were born, what circumstances you were born. And a number of these people were born into poverty, not of their own making. A number of the persons here have other kind of barriers. And so we now look as though we're trying to blame the victims on the lack of showing up, the lack of this and lack of that. Until we wrestle with the fact that we got to break this uh, culture that we that we live in and try to break it one person at a time to get people to believe in that now practically I would ask you Mr. Chairman to, to look at the numbers in the training budget and see how many people got in jobs they're not many David they're not many they're not many and so wait a minute and so there's no need to debate where well, we ought to be debating how we make the training programs more effective and how we get people who, because of this terrible education system, David, uh, with some skills. What I suggested to the people at DHS, you ought to pick four or 500 people who don't have the GEDs, get GEDs, and put them on a career development for the next three or four years as opposed to trying to get them out here on this minimum wage job. We need some permanent solutions. And the minimum wage is, is better than anything, I know, for some of you all. But if you look at the persons we're talking about, they have been victimized. They have been made dependent. And so what the committee has tried to do is figure out just some interim things to get it done. I don't have the solution. Nobody at this table have a perfect solution. You may have a partial solution, but I would hope that you would take the time to look at what's been the effectiveness of our training, even because of how good it is, because of how good it is. If the person who come out of it won't be hired by the private sector, it's not their fault. It's the private sector's fault. We know that there are barriers in the private sector. We know that there are 300,000 jobs in the private sector. 70% of those jobs are held by non-DC residents. Only 30% of those 3,000 jobs are held by DC residents. It's hard to find a job with a PhD now 
in some of these societies. So these are the poorest people in the city, income-wise. The average income in Ward 8, $25,000 per family. In Ward 3, $200,000 per family. It's not their fault in Ward 3 that they are prosperous, but it's also not the fault of the people in Ward 8 who are not making any money to, to make it. And so I just urge us to slow down a little bit and stop expecting this committee to have answers that we don't know, I don't know, Jim doesn't know, but we've got a heart. These are poor people. These are people who are struggling to try to live, survive, who got all kind of barriers with them. Have a heart. Have a heart. Have a heart. These are poor people who are not poor because of what they did, but how they were born. The way you get children out of poverty is get their parents out of poverty. And I can't get on this council a majority of you who want to tackle this poverty problem. I can't get it. I've tried. Tried. Jim has tried. And so, in closing, I just want to know, I disagree with you, Phil, not about raising questions about it, but even suggesting that we do that, cut that out. And two, as Jim said, we have had a 50 percent, what is it, 100 percent? 50 percent of training money from 20, 20 million, yeah, from 20 million to 40 million. And my own concern would be, because of how good the programs may or may not be, can we even spend that kind of money? Can we produce those kind of things? The worst thing we can do, we do it every day, is raise people's expectations. If you come to this training program and you do well, you're going to get a job. That's a lie. You're not going to get a job beyond minimum wage. You're not going to. It's been estimated that you need to make at least twenty five or thirty five thousand dollars for one individual to make it in in Washington. Fifty six thousand dollars for a family of four. And that's the truth. That's real. A third of our population is in poverty. Two hundred thousand people are on Medicaid out of six hundred thousand. Two hundred thousand on Medicaid. That will tell you something. So let's focus going forward on how we reduce this poverty, how we close these gaps. And David and the committee have done a good job of trying to close the achievement gap in education. But that's just one part of it. So I just plead with you. No, we don't. In increasing public education spending to Medicaid, to human services. That's not the way you do it, Bob. Yeah. I'm just saying, we spend billions of I dollars every year. Way. Can no, I, I can talk to you about it? Jim, Jim, how much money is in the in the budget for the train of job opportunity training? The local dollars. Yes. $18 million. $18 million. You said there was a $20 million increase? So there's an additional $10 million that we did in federal funds. We have to go back. We're having some discrepancy in the numbers. Okay, so how much? I can so assure you of this. How, how much, there is, how much is local? There's a substantial increase from 14 to 15 in the training dollars. So is, is it your contention that the program is not working the way it should? Well, it's part of it is the program, some of the vendors. Part of it is the obstacles to employment. I mean, so tell so, you, so let me ask you this question, then, Jim. We have, we have 1,079 people who have gotten a job for six months or less, but we don't know how much they were paid. Now, but they're full-time jobs. And there's another 1,200 who got a part-time job for six months or less. So how much local funding are we leaving with this program? I think we've spent about $18 million. Now, how much are we leaving if, if it gets cut by 5.85? We're, we're leaving an increase of at least $5 million. No, what's the remainder? Well, I think it's, uh, it's, it's $5 million less. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so I guess my well, question is, some issues about sh it. should we be leaving 15 if the program isn't working the way it should, or should we not direct that to some well, other program that works I think better? that's, you know, we've had big, very, very vigorous oversight of all of this, let me tell you. We really have. I've had all the vendors before me. I've questioned all of this. I think there are some efficiencies and savings that we can make in the actual training programs themselves. But 
I just think of that, I'm, I'm not being coy, I'm being very sincere when I say, I think about those 1,100 children under the age of 13. Well, I'm thinking about and, 200. And, 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 I, I don't, this is the best money I could come up with, this is the best money. You voted for this budget, I voted for the budget in the committee. And if others have other money, if somebody's got this Jim, money? I, think you, I, I guess I'm trying to get to, to the point of whether the program works. Is it, is it best to take 5.85 for this think, and leave the remainder, or is it to take it all and put it in a program this, that works? I don't think this is just about money. No, it's about, the, it's about, work, it's about job opportunity we, and training. If we have zero or four more vendors, you know, we're still going to have 50% no-shows. 50% no-shows. And in those that are over 60 months, 50% no-shows. We still have that problem. So it's not just about money, it's about how effective the programs are themselves. That's the, that's, that's the point that I'm trying to make, Jim. Jim. That's the point I'm trying to make, Jim, is, is how, how effective is this program? And if it's not effective, should we leave the remainder of the money in there if it's not gonna, if it's not gonna address the need of the, the, the folks who are receiving this benefit? Or should we send them somewhere else to another program that actually trains them for opportunities that are available in this market. That that's that's a dynamite question, and I would say this. I think some of these vendors I would not continue, some of them I would. Some of them I wouldn't continue because their record is too poor in terms of actually delivering real jobs. I think we should go to, to, to people who can really provide jobs, not people who can provide resume writing. So much of this is resume writing, resume writing. You know, it's an interesting exercise to think about your past and all that, but it don't get you a job. Because if you're saying 50% aren't showing up, maybe you really need to double down on the 50% who yeah. are. Mm -hmm. um, and your point to the fact that these six-month training programs are only getting people in minimum wage jobs speaks to the fact that those 50% are motivated and are going to show up. They may need more than six months. Maybe they need two or three years that's going to get them credentialed um, and trained in a sustainable job. Um, so I think that that's, that's kind of where we have to go. Who's showing up? Who's motivated to, to, to do better? And, and double work? down on them. And which programs work? And let's invest in the programs that actually work. Right. As opposed and to it may not. It may not. all these workforce they're not many. investment they're dollars, not these job training here. dollars, and all these different programs. And, and, all and, and I think we all agree to that, but the, the question is what other programs are going well, to We need to figure that out. Yeah. They're not many. Can we well, I think the first step is what we're doing is what Councilman Bowser did in her committee. Um, we sent her the money, but the uh, Workforce Investment Council funding this FTE so we can look at some of these issues. And that's important, but I think we also need to go back and put into these reports some kind of like strict reporting requirements on what's happening with this training money so that they can report back to the council on a regular basis and we can know exactly what's happening without having to wait for a hearing. Do we have that built in? Can we build that in? We, uh, but that's we the could yeah. require the reports, but I don't, that doesn't do it in itself. Well, let's do, let's have some money. Yeah, let's have let's up in the committee. But the 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 committee. Yes, yes, of course. Let's actually have somebody, bring on somebody to actually require the reports and delay the cut. But not just simply report, somebody to look in across the board, all these different that's programs true. that we're funding. Because our workforce is all over the government. At the WIC. I think it's time for us to move on to uh, economic. If there's no objection, we're going to move on to economic. Are you satisfied, Mr. Chairman? No. no. <laughs> uh, but I will have some off the record discussion. Sure. Uh, because I'd be very happy to hear from you. Okay, so um, the committee largely accepted the mayor's proposal. Um, here are the several changes. Uh, accepted from the Committee on Finance and Revenue uh, money to go to DEMPED for a education program uh, related to, e, uh, to the Earned Income Tax Credit. Also, uh, there's funding from transportation that supports um, Kids Ride Free um, for uh, the Kids Ride Free to School has been very successful and this $731,000 would extend that to the first three weeks for kids not in summer school but in um, summer jobs. So that's, that's helpful. Um, the other money comes from, uh, that the committee redirected, comes from unused money at the Office of Cable Television. Uh, it would support uh, other housing programs, including uh, an increase at, uh, of HPAP, 
uh, money sent to DHS for um, emergency rental housing assistance, money sent to education for the balance of what was needed for community schools, um, and $500,000 to business and regulatory affairs for, um, for the Office of Motion Pictures. Um, there were some additional uh, changes that the committee made, including uh, more from the Office of Cable Television to DEMPED to, to fund this position um, at the WIC that would look at um, the money invested across the city um, and workforce training programs. Uh, we made some changes to the Housing Production Trust Fund. Um, we did a committee discuss these changes last year. There were a lot of questions around lid, phase, uh, lid safe. Um, and um, the single family rehab program, which DHCD has underspent over the last several years. So we've redirected those monies to um, more affordable housing programs for seniors and sent $1.5 million to Human Services to add to um, the rapid rehousing um, program that we already discussed. Uh, we uh, received also and accepted from Health uh, money to support new communities at Lincoln Heights. Um, and we increased in HPAP the amount of down payment assistance from forty to fifty thousand um, dollars as well. Now the capital projects are uh, we left those as recommended by the mayor, and those are the the major changes. Are there uh, questions, comments from members, Mary? Yeah, Mary. Thank you. Um, much of this has to do with um, the Committee on Business and Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, but there's an aspect from economic development. At that committee meeting, Business, Consumer and Regulatory Affairs, of which I am a member, uh, there were uh, questions about money being taken from job training and youth employment at DOES for the film uh, Economic Incentive Fund. Uh, we couldn't get it out of the committee's recommendations. It was a two to two and one person present vote. But what was not mentioned at all was $641,000 from DCRA and, and here it is related to economic development, $500,000 from the Committee on Economic Development. I'm a little chagrined by this because A, there was no mention of it, but in any event, when we're talking before about you know, housing and the need for housing and this, that, and the other thing, and we're going to throw in half a million dollars more to this film incentive fund, I'm actually quite surprised. Now, I do hear, oh, no, no, this is an investment. It's going to hire people and do all this other stuff. Well, given what's already being uh, spirited away from job training, youth employment, uh, reductions in DCRA, and now $500,000 from economic development for the for this film uh, fund. I just have to say, I don't know why this wasn't discussed uh, in the committee on which I serve and how this came about, why this was chosen over the other things in economic development. Sure. So uh, let me first address why it wasn't discussed. The committee had actually intended to um, fund the, completely the community schools but Education Committee had already um, funded half of it, what was needed. So the remaining $500,000 was available to be invested someplace else. Um, but so, on housing maybe, but not No, from that film. came from the Office of Cable Television. No, but wherever it came from, $500,000 was mm -hmm. available, and this is where it landed. Well, that's, that's the recommendation. And so mm -hmm. at the time, I think that your committee met, or this, the committee, or that you said, that that what that had been sent, so it actually wasn't um, mm -hmm. accepted by the committee at the time that you voted. So it's actually open five hundred thousand dollars. Is that a second question? Well, that's that's the procedural answer. But substantively, I think it's quite a mistake to take that money from the other needs that we have and put it when already we're taking this one point two million, the three hundred thousand, the six hundred forty one thousand, um, to add up to two point six million dollars to this fund as opposed to many of the other places that I think, I think, just my opinion, it could be better spent. For example, can I throw out an example? I think that you put oh, some money into the HPAT program, which I think is important. <laughs> We've also increased the amount that the down payment money can go to. I think it would be great if we could fund more money in the HPAT program. And rather than put it here, where I think there's some 
there's still discussion up in the air whether or not it actually has any impact. Rather put it there where we know it will have a profound impact on home ownership. Especially since we've yet to return to the 2008 level. Going from 40000 to fifty might sound like a lot, but when it, you know, five years ago it was $70,000, and we, I think we can all appreciate that housing has gotten a lot more expensive. You know, how much assistance 40 or 50 can offer today versus uh, what additional resources? Well, I resources. think we would like to get back to 70. We definitely Well, then why don't we, we, why don't we then commit, because if I am... To, let me just say this. Well, I, I think if we f can find another $2 million, um, then we can do that. Well, why don't we start with the 500000 going to this incentive fund? I'm happy to discuss with people, especially yeah, the committee like members. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, <laughs> if I... It's very, very important. We are Hold on, be okay. Okay, so okay think, yeah. Yeah. These guys are all interrupting and okay. trying to take it back. I, I was on the right. They all interrupt right. the incentive fund. Actually, Jack, you're not represented. David, were you done? Because so many of you are talking now. I was on the right. Just jumping in. So don't keep giving me that. Yes, yes. Jack, I've been watching. Jack. So I'll back it up, but as long as I'm going to be honest. I'm not just married. Shady, David. Okay. Put me down. But David, I want to respond to David's question. Yes. So your question was, should it go? What was what is that? I want to know recitation. Go into HPAP, where I think it has a more direct impact on our community. And, and I just wanted to point out, uh, I think, to both Davids that um, if, if the $2 million would help us get back to the 70000 per loan level, which I think um, would, would be impactful. Well, that, um, isn't that the amount we're proposing for the film? I'm not proposing entirely? any. I'm proposing no, no, five hundred thousand no, dollars for no. I, I, I'm not on the other committee, so I don't know what was proposed. Mary is next. I guess I, I have. So no, I haven't had my chance to speak. I was just working off of her thing. <laughs> we were talking about her issue. We weren't talking about my issue. I have an issue. How can you ask me? Again, my question to Miss Bowser. How much money is presently for 14 in HPAP, and how much will be in for 15? Um, in 14, let me get you the 14 number. 12.7. It was, let me, from 13, it was 13.3. 14, it was 12.7. Um, and the mayor recommended a cut down to 11.2. The committee added back 300,000. It's, it's Wait a minute, David. Mary, I think you're in a real poor position to criticize others for interrupting. I'm just saying. I, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I was, but David jumped in. You know how that is. And so you're, the answer is? Okay, well, I'll tell you what my statement is. If you, if you take the present $40,000 now and take off the administrative costs, Divided by what that twelve? How much was that? Thirteen. How much was it? Twelve point seven. Twelve point seven. It comes to a miserable small number of home purchases. At one point in this city, HBAP had a hundred million dollars. It made a substantial dent in housing. But just mathematically, I'm not going to do it. Divide that by the 40, and then add, add divided by the 50 for next year, you find maybe 30, 35 at the most houses. And I've had this problem with the mayor about this. I, I think we need to put at least $100 million, David, into HPAP. 100 million? I mean, between the two years. Uh, between 50 50. The budget supplement. And here. Right. So, can I just correct that it was 269 in that um, in in 13. Yeah, that's not 30. Well, I don't know what you said. Yeah. Not 30. 269. Mm -hmm. To me. I don't. I don't like the streetcar. So, I mean, there's your money. What I'm making, Mr. Chairman, <laughs> is that 200. May I? May I finish this? Yes. That in Ward 7 and 8, home ownership 
in Ward 8 is 25% of the total families, 82%, 80% are home rentals. And I would, I'm not going to make any motions or anything, but I would just point out to the council members that 269 is all right, maybe, but that makes it, it doesn't make a debt in home ownership. Whereas, we were talking about dependency, whereas the more money you put into rental units, the more it keeps in the price people of the ability to own something. That's May I just thing. add, there is also in this budget um, a, a $300,000 investment in a Ward 7 and 8 home ownership center that is, pro, you know, promoting home ownership and applying for all the various programs that people qualify for. Well, you know, and I know, if you had it center, it's a center, it's welcome. If you don't have the money, to help people purchase, it's not a thing. But I, I, I'm off of that one. Mary, are you done? No, I got one more question. Well, you. Okay, I am. Mary, um, this is your role as a uh, Metro uh, member, and Mrs. Shay's role as a transportation. I believe that it's inequitable and wrong to have free bus rides for buses and not have free bus rides for Metro. That, that's inequity. That's discrimination. Not knowingly, but how much would it cost for, for the city to subsidize free Metro rides to stewards in District of Columbia? I think we got it um, estimated at 15 to 20 million. Well, I, I think the... It continues to be a reduced fare for the rail, so that's but unchanged. It's not free. It's not free. Okay. So what is and free? If, you, if you're talking discrimination oh, and you mean um, economic, poor people tend to use the bus and the rail, and that's of course that's not irrelevant. absolute. That's irrelevant. Well, so we are discrimination between black students who can now ride free on the buses, but can't ride free on the metro rail. I've gotten that complaint consistently everywhere I, I go. Okay, well, you interrupted me. Yeah. Poor people tend to ride the bus more often than take the rail. That's not exclusive, absolutely not exclusive. Well, wow. So there is progressivity, if you will, in our benefits in that the bus is free. Rich kids tend to be taking the rail more likely than the bus. I mean, I, I just think practically speaking as the author of the legislation, I would love for them all the most to be free to students. That would be great. But practically speaking, we had to we had to figure out what was going to be the most feasible to get started and get funded, um, and then most feasible to implement. And that's that's where we landed here. So what is the what is, $12 million is for what kids ride free is costing us on the bus. And we another fifteen to twenty million um, on the rail. Well, we added rail. Very clear that the majority of you are support that idea of free metro because you want to help get the money to do it. So, uh, do well, it's a question of priorities yeah, as well. I mean, what's more important, H H panel, or free free bus rides? That, that free bus rides are important. Uh, I didn't say they're not important. I said which is more no. important, the TANF debate or or free bus it's rides? It's not either. Or. But it is. It is not. It's in your mind. <laughs> well, find the money for me, Mary. That's not my responsibility. You're the chairman of the council. Well, it is. <laughs> you know what I'm It's the chairman. I'm, I'm telling you, we all have to make a choice, and your answer is no. I just find the you money. You mean that an $11 billion budget? We can identify mm -hmm. $12, million, $15 million? Come on. Mary, what would you suggest we mm -hmm. do without? He doesn't. He wants me to do that. That's not true. Yes, well, they pay that is not true. Mm -hmm. What I put on the table, like all of you put on the table, various concerns that you have. And I'm reflecting what I get from people who ride the metro at Howard Road. A lot of students are riding who come in at Howard Road. So much so that it's because there's a lot of fights down there. But I talked to them about, wouldn't it be, would you, would you want to ride free? Of course, I'd say yes. So what I was saying, I raised a question as a point of thought that it may provoke some of you all 
to relook at what we've done and put money there. Now, don't get me started on a street car. Don't get me on that, that crazy. No, but what about, you know, Mary, I don't really want to go here, but the, the, the movie fund, and Mary made the point about the movie fund. Well, that's what I'm saying. I guess just that within the committee, we will support what the committee recommended because that was within the committee. The issue that Mary brings up is between committees, which is a little bit more at play. But that's a choice. Yep. You know, we, we, we have to put probably about $100 million a year in the metro that we're not doing right now to fund momentum. And if we do that, then we have a rail system and a bus system that your kids can take. And if we don't do that, then we have an increasingly unreliable bus and rail system that your kids can't take. So, do we do we find the dollars for that? Yes. Okay. Well, then it comes from something else. And what does it come from? <laughs> I, I but we have to. But we need to do an age cap. Uh, you said a hundred million dollars a year, or two year, over two years, fifty million dollars a year for age cap. That's right. Where does this money come from? Where does this money come from? Where does this it's money come ship. from? I thought this was seven. I thought the three point five million for youth homelessness was your priority. No, that's so where does that money come from? Once been filed and made a report. I did. I've talked to her about this, about age cap. I've talked with Mayor Gray about H. Bell. He, he's moving backward on that. He, he's going down with funding as opposed to up. I've talked to Eric Goulet about that and trying to figure out why he don't put more money in the home ownership. You know, particularly in War 7 and 8. Our home ownership in 7 and 8. I'm just saying there are a lot of choices here. David, you, have to, you were next. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to note and maybe ask the chairwoman to see if she might be willing to change her mind on something that was in the committee report that you guys have already voted on but I think has a pretty big impact. Uh, it comes from the mayor. It's not something that I think came directly out of the committee. Um, and this is the H Street Retail Priority Area Incentive Amendment Act, which, as you know, um, takes the TIF money uh, that has been preserved in the H Street Retail Priority Area Grant Fund, um, that extra money, and spreads it out over 10 or 11 other areas. And the reality is, is that the original intent and the original you know, purpose of the law when this was passed was that this money would be used specifically for revitalization along the H Street corridor. And now, as you know, we've expanded that to reach out to Benning Road and up Brentwood Road. Um, and so it would really undermine the effort if we were to take that money and now spread it out to all these other retail priority areas. Um, and in fact, each one of those retail priority areas, I think, would have the opportunity to succeed on their own and build this opportunity. And we can go out and set up programs for them as well. So um, I think it would be unfair and a penalty against the hard work that's been done on H Street if we were to um, allow this recommendation by the mayor to continue forward, and I'm wondering if you might be willing to speak to it and maybe change it. Sure. Um, well, here, here's the kind of bottom line. So for the remaining retail priority areas, like there was $6.9 million for all of them. Um, that was 100% expended last year. For H Street, uh, there was only 80, is, they only spent 11% of the money dedicated to H Street. So the question is, is there really enough demand to, to spend that money, or is it just sitting there when it could be used uh, on the other corridors? I've, you know, I've, I've spoken at length with them down there, and I believe that they're, you know, we have to give them a, at least another year or two to expend this money. Normally, these kinds of projects take four to five years to see full fruition, and and I think it's important for us to stand by the corridor there while the streetcar is still delayed and, and hopefully opening up. And, and, and the fact that it goes all the way down now to the bridge, there's a lot of businesses along there that could use this kind of support and this money investment, um, especially also with the construction there and everything that's going on. So I hear what you're saying, and we should watch it closely, and maybe next year or the year after, you know, maybe take the money back from there if need be. But this, I think, was set up specifically to support their work and they haven't really had a chance to roll it out entirely. If I could add to this, I'm pretty sure we've added Bladensburg, uh, Bladensburg and Benning Road right. to oh, this. Bladensburg. I always call it Brown. So it's still um, part of the 8th Street kind of corridor, but these are underdeveloped areas that probably are just now able to, uh, didn't we do, just do it last year that we extended up um, Bladensburg. We, and do, we extended to Bladensburg, uh, 
uh, uh, Betty Rose, little father, as well. So we got. But there's uh, money in there. Yeah. How much money are you leaving in there to West Virginia? We should no, say you. It's the mayor, the mayor yeah. recommended yeah. making making the grant just available. So it's always going to be available to H Street in those corridors. It'll just be available to all of the retail areas. So H Street right. will, you know, if if they need it, they're going to apply and then they'll get it. Um, what this yeah. what this does is it opens up the categories of kind of applicants, which on H Street I think is more restricted. So it opens that up. Um, and it, it, it prevents it from sitting there if it's not being used. Now, I, I hear what A Street businesses are saying. They don't want it to be used up someplace else, and when they're ready, it won't be there. Um, but it just it prevents that money from sitting there not being used when there are applicants that are waiting yeah. at other places. Well, I just think it hasn't been ripe to be used just yet, and they've been building this reserve through the increment financing you know, that goes into this particular this fund. Tip? And these... Well, so it it's, it's a tip, it's a tip, tip but it goes into a grant fund it's that's it's now... A grant, just, just right. call it a grant. It's, it's not a tip. Well, but well, well, how the money got there was through a tip. It was not through a grant. I think, so I think two things. Thing. One is... It's is, unique. Is that the idea, as you know, is to try to get retail there rather than just bars and restaurants. But the second is, we've only this year opened it up to Benning Road and Bladensburg. And those are areas also that are part of the H Street corridor generating the funds to be used. And so I don't know how good of a job we've done with the businesses along Bladensburg and Benning Road right. for them to participate in the retail grant program. But what I'm saying is this, with this change, and I'm, and I'm certainly open to the discussion or maybe even figuring out how to preference A Street while still opening it up. I think that's an idea that we can explore. Um, but those businesses could still apply they're, when they're ready, they, they all apply, and they, they will get a grant just like Rhode Island Avenue, just like Georgia Avenue. Just like, I think part of the street. difficulty is, is that it's telling them that they're funding the TIFs for around the city when it was created for that area. <laughs> but the TIF would be the taxes that they pay mm -hmm. go into a segregated fund. But they would pay those taxes regardless. Of course. So it's not like they put in an extra dollar for their street, which is now being taken away. It's that we have decided to designate certain dollars, which you say is now basically a grant. They had been converted tiff. from TIF to right. so yeah. they could get, because right. that wasn't and, getting I know it wasn't like that, because that's how it works. It's not like there was extra taxes being paid, like in Noma or somewhere else like that, where there was. but. The fact is still that this was sold to that community as an opportunity for them to revitalize their neighborhood uh, through this kind of savings and through this kind of but program. For some reason, they haven't stepped was up. Was that H Street? Was the only thing? I mean, it's not I mean, ripe yet. The, was the only the H Street tip was used for the giant? Is that the only one? Well, no. no. There is a, a, uh, uh, a locally owned um, pharmacy. <laughs> there was a um, bike store. There was. It's been used um, for a number of places on there. Julie, how many guys can get in there? But it was 25, it wasn't, a, this was a 25 million tip that was converted into operational dollars of about $5 million a year. And it just may be... There's about, it's, what, 18 left? You can't use it up. I have a, I have a question. Yeah. I'm a serious question, but how do you respond to, to perhaps the, the suggestion that some of the things on A Street as opposed to some of the other retail priorities areas, are happening more organically now than they're happening in other places. So here's two problems. One is I think the mayor can uh, clarify this. I'm pretty sure that the way it's being redefined, it's now can be used for a lot more purposes than just retail. And it was. It'll include bars and restaurants. And so the idea was because the bars and restaurants were jacking up the um, square footage cost so much, like you did in Adams Morgan and elsewhere, that you weren't getting retail. So the first thing was, was a way to help the indigenous retail, you know, do better and, and be able to stay there, expand, but then also get new retail there. And that, th that same phenomenon is now happening toward uh, Bladensburg and down Benning Road, where you're not going to be able to put in retail because bars and restaurants would command the highest square footage cost. And so it's a way to try to get balanced growth 
that's generated from the popularity of 8th Street, like what happened. So what has, what, what's the condition precedent for it to be right? I mean, because the money's been there for quite some time, and it's not being... Well, so they have been using it. They have been using it. It's not that they haven't been using it. The expansion. But as soon as you expansion, expand what it can be used for, like you can use it for street improvements, you can use it for things that are not necessarily related just to retail, we move away from the purpose of it is to try to be sure that our neighborhoods grow with retail, along with bars, restaurants. And now the focus is still on the, the business, the business owner. So I, th I think the big difference is there were restrictions on 8th Street, no restaurants, liquor stores, nightclubs, phone stores, or national chains. And the retail priority is a larger goal of, and it says most hard goods stores, restaurants, and services get geared towards families. That's right. But so, there are a lot of broad, ex broad discretion. But, but you're exactly right. That's how it was targeted to try to get those amenities beyond just bars, restaurants, and chains. To try to promote local businesses. Can, can you talk about how the money started? Yeah. I see have the language from the bill that was passed. I can read it real quick. It's just a paragraph. It says that all funds deposited and they created the 8th Street Retail Priority Area Grant Fund. And any interest on those funds shall not revert to the unrestricted fund balance of the general fund at the end of the fiscal year at any other time, but shall be continually available for the uses and purposes set forth in the subsection C of this section without regard to fiscal year limitations. So I think you guys did this, what year was it, Jen? Two years ago, three years ago? 2010. Great Streets TIF program, it was around $92 million, and they had all the various retail priority areas, like Georgia Avenue got $20 million, you know, MLK, South Cap got a certain $15 million, and H Street got $25 million. And the way the CFO budgets it is that they they, you know, assume that, you know, it's just going to be uh, deduct from the general fund. So they had what they assumed would be the debt service on the $25 million budgeted into the budget and budgeted into the debt cap. What council member, what I think council member Wells, when he introduced it, what this, this mechanism is it basically took that money that had been budgeted for debt service and just converted it into a grant over 10 years, and a portion of it was to be used for the giant and the remainder for the businesses along that corridor. I believe last year in the budget, the mayor converted the remainder of that line item that was supposed to be used for debt service to be a fund for, um, right. This was debt service on the... On the borrowing? Well, no, there was never any borrowing. So basically, money was budgeted for it as if it had been, there had been a tip note issued, but no notes were ever issued. So they just took the money that was set aside to pay debt service if it had actually happened and just converted it into a grant because it's it actually wound up, and and that's how the money. I just want to make sure purposes, but one of them is is that the a lot of the indigenous businesses get driven out of these areas as they change. It's really going to help them change their business. Like if you do hair. This would give you $85,000 to help give you a retail product and inventory to change your business model to where you can keep up with the cost of, of increasing um, taxes and your triple net leases. So one thing that it does is that we know that when the streetcar runs down Benning Road, that the, the cost of being on Benning Road is going to go straight up. It's a way to help the indigenous businesses get a grant to retool their, their business. The other is, is that it does incentivize to try to keep a retail use in an area that's going um, just to clubs and nightclubs. And that's what's happening at Benning Road towards the Atlas Flats, is that that's about to just all turn towards. Well, Tommy, did they ever consider having a moratorium on liquor license? I mean, this is to avoid having to go through to do it that way. You're exactly right. There was a proposal to do a moratorium liquor license in age, and this was the alternative to that. Actually, the moratorium or the zoning overlay that restricts. Uh, huh? But, but we do have some to restrict the number, the, the percentage concentration. That's far more effective than this because there's no way that we can. And that, that's not to argue against the H Street Fund. It's just to say that if the issue is you want to preserve indigenous businesses, as you put it, 
and try to prevent them being driven out by the This is one of the purposes, Phil. I understand. But with regard to that purpose, if it's a concern, then you want to either do a zoning overlay or an ABC moratorium, because the economics won't do it. Why don't we even call it a TIF in the first place? It has nothing to do with a TIF. It was originally TIF that was included in the concept. Well, the idea was to borrow the money. See, the idea was to lend. Not to lend. It's to lend. If I had 25 million dollars in interest payments, we could have borrowed about 20 million dollars. So we never borrowed the money. We just put the money in. We just put the 25 and lost out on the 2 million. I'm not sure where it was directed. It was still on ABC. Yeah, it was still on ABC. 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 It was any other questions or comments from the members? Anita? I just want to make sure I understand this um, H Street um, TIF grant. Um, well, grant, as it's called now. Um, I wanted to understand the boundaries. Earlier today, I think you told me that there's a boundary down Benning Road all the way to, um, I think, the shrimp boat, someone said. No, not that far. Where does it go? To the river. To the bridge. So it's okay. So it just goes to the bridge. So it does not go into Ward Seven. Well, that's part of Ward Seven. Not much, but just into. Yeah. No, I just, I just want to understand the boundaries. Between Ward Seven and Ward Five. Okay. Thank you. I think two questions or comments. Um, one of them is the um, redirecting from the DHCD HPTF Lead Safe Program the one and a half million dollars to the Committee on Human Services for Rapids Rehousing. Sure. We're going to do a technical fix so that it does not come out of the HPTF. Okay. It'll come out of another fund in the HPTF. It'll be it'll be a shift of money. And I'm just bringing that up here because one of the principles that the coalition has said, we insisted on repeatedly, is that we want to, we don't want to be using HPTF dollars for non-eligible uses. And that's what uh, rapid rehousing is, is a not an eligible use. The money will still transfer, but okay. it'll be, um, the budget office will do this. Okay. It'll be a, uh, a, basically a swap. Okay. But I wanted to mention it here to emphasize the point that we, we ought to be keeping the HPTF for HPTF eligible purposes. Um, I had a question concerning the um, EITC education grant. I understand this is a, a uh, what am I saying, ongoing every year thing, am I right? Yes. What is it? Why, why does DEMPED do education on um, EITC? Well, you know they have the, the bank on program, so they have some other financial education programs that would they could add this on to. And they do this well? Yeah. Well. Yeah. <laughs> That's a fair question. It could, go, it could go someplace else, but I think they could, it could go to Disby, but I think this is probably the best place. Mm -hmm. Jack, did you want to say anything on that? Uh, and the other is, um, just personally, I um, I had a reaction when I saw the $731,000 for um, the youth transit subsidies. This is for the summer youth employment, mm -hmm. and we've never done that before. Mm -hmm. And um, if anything, we have a need with the, I'm looking at Marion, what he was saying about the rail and the kids going to school during the school year. Uh, but just in this discussion, where we were talking about, for example, uh, HPAP or the um, homeless for the um, youth, the youth homeless, would you be willing to looking, look at um, one of those as a different priority? Well, I actually think I would prefer to have the kids be able to ride the bus all summer. Um, this is actually a compromise position that instead of funding their entire um, summer youth employment, which is six weeks, it funds the first three weeks, and then they, they pay for, for the remainder. I think it's going to be important not to have a hard break for their transit ridership when school ends or if they're not in summer school. 
um, so that they can continue to be able to get to job activities and activities during the summer. Well, it just strikes me as an issue of priority here, and I'm not going to push it too hard. Mm -hmm. But um, I mean, we got a lot of other needs, and certainly it's come up in this discussion here. And uh, we already help these kids by getting them a job in the summer. That's what the Summer Youth Employment Program is. And unlike school, they're actually earning money. Well, they don't actually earn money for the first month. Well, three, they do, three but to they four get weeks. paid, as yeah, everybody and, does. And, 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 many get, of, and many times they can't get to, to their job sites, especially when we have some kids going out into the various federal agencies all over the region. I'm not going to push any further. Uh, David? Do we know whether or not we're funding all the positions for summer jobs? Young people who want them. In other words, if there are thousands of kids who are wanting summer jobs and we're not, we don't have the money to fund them, does it make sense to give a transit subsidy to those we've given jobs to who are earning an income to take the $700,000 and rather than give it to subsidize transportation, make more summer job opportunities available. Yeah, I, don't, I know BO is not here, and this is actually in um, this sorry. committee. But I, I can tell you what I know, um, and that is just even just based on our experience on Ward 4, that everybody who signed up by the deadline, the sign-up deadline, got a job. This is FY15, so we have not a clue what the program will look like in FY15. Exactly, and so um, it was just something to against consider that, you know, in years in the recent years, we've limited access to the program. And so, again, I, I think it might make more sense to give more opportunities available, or more opportunities to young people, than to give free transportation on top of a job. It's only for the first month, because, again, the... Three weeks till they get money. Right. Well, I think, uh, but, but, but Muriel was suggesting she wanted free transportation for the whole summer for them. I, that that would be that would be my my first my first goal because I, I actually think that the um, interruption the kind of heartbreak when school ends is going to be difficult for families to adjust to. I don't necessarily think the demand or the need for the kids to get around goes away. Um, but this is this is what we were. So able is this to a fund. metro rail and metro bus subsidy? It's just the bus subsidy. It's just an extension of kids ride free on bus. But, you know, again, I would see uh, if we have subsidy funds, um, uh, we were able to, through the Committee on Education, actually give a subsidy for kids 18 to 21 who were carved out of the process. And as a result, we've seen dramatic reductions in truancy at Washington Metropolitan and at Luke C. Moore, which are our older schools as well as our charter schools. Uh, but 21 doesn't go far enough. If you, uh, if you, we should actually go to 24. Um, you know, because we have a lot of young people who are in, from 21 to 24 who are in our adult education uh, programs, our adult education, um, uh, both DCPS and Charter, who have no subsidy whatsoever. And so, again, if, if, if this is a matter of the greatest need, uh, when people are 21 to 24 who have zero subsidy to even get to their basic educational need, I think that money might be better spent helping people stay in school. Anything that would be else? my preference. Anything else on um, economic development? All right, we're going to go back to um, Committee on Health. <coughs> oh, then let's do BCRA. Jean? funding for the uh, Film DC Economic Incentive Fund, uh, and those, uh, um, that breakout of where the money's coming from, 
is $1.2 million from the adult job training at the Department of Employment Services. And then we have $300,000 from year-round youth employment program. And we have a correction here. Instead of $641,000 from reductions at DCRA, that should read $541,000. And also it should read a reduction of $100,000 of employer's services at the Department of Employment Services. Yes. Someone call? Okay. And then we received $500,000 from the Committee on Economic Development. We've added $778,000 to Department of Small and Local Business Development for clean teams and main streets from the following sources. $278,000 from existing funds within DSLBD. $200,000 from the Committee on Government Operations for H Street Main Streets, primarily to deal with Bladensburg Road business activities and commercial development. And $300,000 from the Committee on Transportation Environment to expand clean teams in Wards 3, 5, and 7. We've also accepted a transfer of $96,000 from the Committee on Human Services for the Office of Tenant Advocate to add an attorney advisor's position in the Policy Advocacy Program under OTA. For Budget Support Act recommendations, we support all the Budget Support Act of the Mayor with the exception of the Ward 4 full service grocery store amendment. We disapproved for the reasons that the Committee Chairman thought we needed the input of Ward 4 residents on that. And we also consulted with the Council Member from Ward 4 and her staff. And then we disapproved the Film DC Economic Incentive Amendment title, which is what it does is replace the DC Film Incentive Fund with a grant program. We feel like the Committee Chairman felt like that this needs to be scrutinized a little bit further. Do you make the grant program competitive, non-competitive? And it was what we understand from the administration is designed to promote the local, build the local film industry. But just in our brief budget hearings, we had representatives from the local film industry and there was not a lot of, it was not well received. And we feel like it needs to be, the proposal needs to be fleshed out a little bit further. And that's the summary of the Committee actions. Questions or comments from members? Anita? Yes. I'd like to know if there is a place within this budget for the processing of permits that we need for many of the festivals that we think are important to the city. That's in HCMA, I believe, or DDOT. I don't know. That's why I'm asking. HCMA. It's in HCMA. Yeah. I will, if I may address the Council Member just for a second. That is an issue we have raised in the past with DCRA about special events licensing. And we maintain an ongoing discussion on that. And especially with regard to fall festivals and what have you. We really haven't come to a resolution, but we think that the one city portal that is being proposed in the budget will help out with the licensing where the software program will interface with a number of agencies which are required for cross-agency licensing for those kinds of events. Okay. So does that mean that the hope is that the processing will be faster or smoother or? The goal is for both. Okay. Yes. 
smoother and, and Not just make it more expeditious. Yeah. Yes, yes, we did legislation on this a couple of years ago, and uh, several other members were involved. I think, Mary, you might have been. Um, it was because of eczema, but uh, DDOT is a major player in this. Is that and block yes, did you introduce that bill? And it was for the uh, for the block parties. Are you talking about the no, block parties? No, I'm there? talking about I'm, yeah, I'm talking about festivals that bring um, revenue to the city or to a neighborhood um, because we like the H Street Festival, for instance. Uh, where you have uh, thousands of people that yeah, come out that and okay. that you would not normally okay. have. Um, well, I uh, think that's HCMA, isn't it? Where it comes to the cost of agencies to do things like police and um, the others, those yeah, are big costs. Part of but it. it's only for nonprofits, and the 8th Street Quarter Festival is a nonprofit activity, but it's for nonprofits. It's not for like a for profit race, mm -hmm. for example, through the city. Something like that, but it's it's intended for local nonprofits when they do what you're talking about. Okay, good. It's to defray the cost of things like police. Right. I, I wanted that on the record because we get a lot of inquiries, and people need to understand, you know, that there are categories of festivals and events. Since we we have one every weekend in the District of Columbia in the warm weather. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I know that uh, Councilmember Orange is not here, but I want to again direct attention to this um, increase in the uh, filler fund. Uh, and uh, you may remember that at the committee hearing, the first two items directed away from adult job training and youth employment, um, there was a motion to remove that, but it failed f for lack of a majority. It was two to two with one member. Uh, voting present, but I want to renew my objections here um, because I think this is, you know, a, a misallocation of, of money. Uh, and on top of that, I also want to say again that the committee did not take up items three or four. The $641,000 reductions from DCRA was not brought up at all and $500,000 from the Committee on Economic Development. Now, Councilmember Bowser explained why that was not included, but uh, is there any reason why the $641,000 reductions from DCRA? In fact, I think at the committee there, was, there were no reductions in DCRA. So how did that come to be in this, uh, in the report? And, uh, as, as you know, during the uh, March, there was a discussion about uh, having uh, certifications of fund, which, which was, uh, I, I certainly an issue of uh, with our committee and that we had had uh, uh, we had had our uh, we were waiting certification from DCRA on a couple of accounts and we got that frankly after uh, after the markup we got the uh, certification of those funds if you're after referring the to the uh, getting authorization from um, the CFO on uh, FTE lapses, is, is that what you're talking about? Uh, because if that is the discussion, then during the committee, it was never mentioned where that would come from, but it was mentioned that if that were obtained, that would eliminate the need for taking money from job training and youth employment at DOES. There was never any notion that you'd go um, casting about for additional monies and then add it to this field of fund. I mean, it, it actually makes the situation worse. So I just, I, we can't do anything about it because the council member's not here, but I would like uh, all of that money um, removed from this fill fund and placed in areas where we need it, or returned to areas from whence it came. Mr. Yes, thank you. I, I just want to echo uh, what Councilmember Che has said on this. I, you know, we have, um, you know, put a lot of effort into job training, into adult job training, especially around adult literacy, the basics. And um, for me to take the money out of there now uh, is, I think, a huge mistake uh, from a policy perspective and something that I expressed at the committee and will certainly be hoping that we can move this money back. Uh, to these appropriate programs um, at, the, at the right time. I do also recall that there was a discussion about certification from uh, 
somebody in the agency or at the CFO's office for FTEs or some vacancies or something. And the conversation, I think, did go along the lines of if, if this money comes in, we will replace these reductions in adult literacy or adult training and uh, youth employment um, and other employee services uh, for workforce development um, with that money. And so to see an additional amount of money, I think, is just a little disingenuous to the entire committee. It's not what we voted on, and it's not what we ultimately would have expected from the committee. So I'll just put that on the record. I also know we're kind of short here without having the chairman here, and uh, um, you know perhaps we can discuss this further at the committee of the whole. Uh, but I think it should be uh, put back into those programs. Um, I just had a question for Mary. Is that um, your your objection is that the money where the money was moved from, not in the creation of the fund? Or that my objection is to take money, yes, from these uh, okay. places, but now in addition to add these additional monies, and there was also, uh, as I said, I know you weren't there, so. But we had this discussion about these uh, vacancies, and if they were approved, how they would go perhaps toward this fund, and may maybe that could be justified, so maybe that's not objectionable. But the idea was that if that were the case, then the money would be put back into job training or the youth employment. Uh, David Catania. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Gene, can you uh, tell us uh, what are the anticipated incentives? Pardon me, sir. What are the presuming that the 2.6 million? Uh, this is I'm uh, I'm guessing this is on top of what is already a fund for the DC uh, Film Fund and Cine Fund, correct? Correct, sir. So how much? What's the current budget for the fund? Well, they did have uh, 4.27 million. It still has 4.27 million in there, but it has been there's a proposal in the FY14 supplemental to sweep that uh, that amount of money. So this is so that's quite alright. I'm not on the committee, so I appreciate yes, sir. if you just if you could help me. So we budgeted in the original FY14 budget. Uh, 4.27 million. Correct. Sir. And, and what you're also suggesting is that there is either a reprogramming or a supplemental on top of that for FY14. I'm saying that the money's going, the uh, money that's currently there in FY, for FY14 funds there. Right. No. is there now, but it's being swept up once uh, in the FY uh, in the supplemental. Oh, I see. So the funds were unspent, and they are being. Uh, there, that account is being cleared and reprogrammed to other areas. Correct, sir. Because we were, for whatever reason, unable to spend the 4.27 million, either unable or the executive was Correct, unwilling. Sir. All right. And so, having not succeeded in 14, and I appreciate this, you're standing in for the chairman. I appreciate it very much. The chairman is suggesting that we put 2.641 million into this fund for 15. Uh, that's correct, sir. All right. Have we identified particular projects? Are there people that are counting on these dollars as a condition proceeding to doing business in our city? Uh, as of today? The, the only thing that I'm, I, I have not been privy to uh, the discussions that the uh, committee chairman has had with uh, 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 various film producers or what have you, but I do know that there is House of Cards. So, so, uh, I would gladly defer to the uh, council member for more too, since he may know more about this than I do. All right. Well, let me, if, with all due respect, uh, Jack, I might get to you in a second. I'm just trying to understand. He's also the lineup after you. Just trying to get to understanding. So, um, what precisely would these funds be used for? Are do you envision them to be used for? Are these offsets against? Um, you know, are, these, are these personal property tax reductions? Are these real property tax reductions? Are these sales tax reductions? Or do we just cut a check? The, uh, under the uh, film incentive uh, program, as it's currently established, there is a menu of items for which tax, uh, tax deductions uh, can, or tax rebates can occur and other uh, 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 subsidies as well according to a pre-approved plan. And um, uh, now that is basically the way the program operates. I can't, I, I don't have the legislation in front of me, so I can't go through the whole 
menu of uh, eligible items that are. Uh, and just and finally, you know, um, you know, I, I for one don't object to having incentive funds. Uh, some jurisdictions do them quite adroitly, and specifically as seed money for long-term and reoccurring institutions, Correct, like sir. when the state of Virginia swept, uh, you know, the corporate executive board out from under us with a million dollars. That incentive actually yielded additional monies down the road, so I could, that makes mm -hmm. sense. But simply giving away two point six million dollars with no expectation of residual or long-term benefit doesn't seem like an investment as much as it seems like personally a giveaway uh, with no uh, multiplier effect whatsoever what and again gee this isn't directed at you but it strikes me as a giant vanity project a way to lure the rich and famous here so we can all hang out with them and look swell at cafe milano it is not a strategy for economic development I find this very hard to support, but thank you for okay, the explanation. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, let me explain the strategy for economic development behind this. Um, Washington, D.C., more than any other city in the country, is a basis for TV shows and movies. I can name them, starting with the House of Cards with Scandal with Homeland. Uh, the movie Lincoln, when that was filmed, none of those were done in the District of Columbia because Virginia and Maryland and other jurisdictions had incentive funds which they paid to the movie people or the TV people who then filmed in their jurisdictions, producing literally millions of dollars of revenue for those jurisdictions. It's my long-term philosophy that the following. If we can lure some of those movies and TV shows to our city and build an infrastructure, build a movie industry here, so whereby any time someone comes to film here, we will have local people working in local jobs to provide the infrastructure to do the filming. We can produce an industry that not only employs people here, but makes millions of dollars for the city. House of Cards is the best example. House of Cards bid against us. Um, Governor O'Malley put, uh, at the time, I think it was 10 or $11 million on the table. We put $250,000 on the table. House of Cards now spends $110 million in the state of Maryland every year, and they built a giant studio out there that, if you go to it, is a replica of Washington, D.C. The White House is there, the Oval Office, there's a street in Georgetown. All of that is in this building. Now, two-thirds of the show is filmed in that building. One third is filmed outside on the streets of Baltimore, which is why when you watch it, a lot of it doesn't make sense because you don't recognize anything. They have said to us that in return for an incentive, and we'll work out an agreement, they'll film their one third of the show, which they film outside, on the streets of DC versus the streets of Baltimore. And so I think that is the purpose of this first $2 million. I think it was $1.2 million Vince was talking about. He could give you better numbers. We're looking at, at talking to Scandal, at Homeland, and these other shows who would like to be in Washington, but they're not going to come here unless they get the same incentive package that they're now getting, I think, in North Carolina is where uh, Scandal's being filmed, and other places like that. So you have to buy into the proposition that we can build a film industry here, which we once had. Um, or if you want to not buy into it and not try and build an industry, but rather just spend money and give it away to programs that, uh, as you said yourself, David, uh, jobs training. I've sat, that discussion that went on for two hours bordered on abs absurdity. I've sat here for 10 years and listened to us roll over program after program and complain that there's no jobs because the job training doesn't work. We've spent literally three or four billion dollars on job training in the last 10 years and produce no jobs. It, it's almost like the definition of insanity. You, build, you keep hitting your head against the wall hoping for a different result and then for the same result. So that discussion was something I've heard over and over and over and then we're going to buy into it again this year and just roll everything over again in the hopes that jobs will be produced next year when we fully know they won't be. But if you try to create an industry, that might work. But you can see the reaction at this table. Everyone, everybody poo poos it. So there you let, me, let me ask you a question on that because I mean I've heard that argument that you made a lot. And I find it fairly compelling, and so I've done some thinking about this, and I've gone to the hearings, and I also hear an equally strong argument on the other side that says that that spinoff is really not a reality, and that the investment that the cities make or that the jurisdictions make is really lost, and that the next year the you know the same show or whatever comes back and holds their feet to the fire for more and more and more or say they're going to run away with the money. So um, one of the things I found compelling about what was being offered by the mayor this year 
which is a little different than in the past, was that he was going to try to invest in the local industry and try to build it up from the grassroots up rather than trying to attract the bright, shining star to come here and do a little bit of business. He was going to try to continue to nurture the businesses from the ground up, and that was with you know, more uh, intentional grant making directly into the city. Now, I, you know, that sounds compelling to me too. So how do you justify one or the other? In the end, it seems like it would be smarter to invest in our potential uh, future, uh, you know, shows built right here in the District of Columbia by people that live here, and we can get the spinoff from their income and from the, what they're doing here, as opposed to a quick dive in from Maryland for a couple of shows on the street, which is going to cost more than a couple hundred thousand. The investment there is a lot of money. It's millions. You can't get them to come here for less than that. And then how do they not have us over a barrel the next year and the next year and the next year? So I get really nervous about it when I think about it from that perspective. I'd rather us build a fund that actually is going to give grants to local grassroots organizations and businesses and, and people. And furthermore, I'd like to invest in education opportunities that will teach our residents not just how to uh, build a set or clean up a, a set, but actually how to make film and how to make you know digital enterprises and things of that sort. So how do you answer that? It's a tough one. Yeah, well, I think you do both. I think what you're talking about is what we want to what we want to do is teach our residents how to do the whole film thing. So when a company comes here to film a movie, we have the infrastructure that they can use, so they don't have to hire people from other jurisdictions and come here. So what do you do first, the chicken or the egg? I mean, in I the think end. you do them both. Yeah, because but we're going to bring companies here, not going to hire our local residents. I mean, that's been proven. So we train our local residents as we have the movies no. here. Oh, All I was thinking was we would start with that. That's that's what I would say. But I, I mean, look, you know, if you want to spend money on something else and never have any, and watch movies and TV programs that are, that highlight Washington D.C. as the main point of it, and make not one penny. If anybody, I don't think anybody watches House of Cards, but if you ever did, you can see the initial credits. But then uh, the initial credits are nothing but Washington, D.C. Right? Well, Mary, right? The initial credits are nothing but Washington, D.C. Yet not a portion of that whole show was ever filmed here. And so, but anyone might think it was. And when they spend 110, why do you think Maryland went to such extremes to keep them there this year? They were ready to shut them down. There was a law that was in a to try to shut it down because of the same reasons that I'm talking about. No, but they were ready to walk. Yeah, well, you know, Maryland went on to the extreme. Got over the barrel and got a lot of money out. And for what benefit? I don't know. I can't see the benefit. But again, here, here would be my final point. I'm, and Vince can probably make this argument better. You know, we're talking about two, three million dollars in a fund. Well, I was listening to these discussions where we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars in other programs to produce nothing. I mean, if in, as in the words of Marion Barry. With a $12 billion budget, are you kidding me? We can't find $2.5 million for an incentive fund for movies that might work, as opposed to the hundreds of millions of dollars that I listened to today being spent on everything that never works? I mean, come on. Uh, Kenyon, did you want to say anything? Um, well, that's a question. Oh, I do have a question. Uh, how, how's the, how, how the Maryland, how's the state of Maryland actually paying for the incentive fund they have? What are they funded from? I, I assume it's from their taxes. Their general fund goes into an incentive fund, and it's a fairly large one. It goes from the taxes that people from Maryland make, yeah. I mean, in the city that go back to Annapolis. Yeah. Right. I mean, so let's be clear. We are funding the incentives for the state of Maryland through revenue earned here by Maryland residents. It goes back. But in any event, that, I'm sure that's how it's funded. Uh, but I don't know the answer to that, so I can find that out for you. Well, there are a couple of issues here. One of them is the fund, the dollar amount in the fund. And what I'm hearing from members is resistance to the funding. My imp and the second issue is the subtitle. Talking about the fund first, um, I kind of have this sense, and I don't want to put you on the spot, Gene, that your, your member is thinking about reversing the job training cut. Um. This, uh, at this point in time, uh, no, he is not. Uh, the, um, uh, we had that discussion, and he's uh, firm on this uh, position right now. Okay. Um, with regard to the subtitle, the issue there, and I'm speaking now having uh, met yesterday with the mayor's people, who want to keep the subtitle in there. This is what they say. 
The subtitle is the original language for the film incentive program or initiative that was the law until, I don't know, 2010, 2011. And uh, that law was changed. And um, they simply want to go back to that earlier law. The I don't know the details of it, except that the earlier law somehow was tied to, if I remember correctly, the incentive went up the more DC residents who were employed. That's what's in the subtitle. That was the original law. That got changed a couple of years ago. If we disapprove the subtitle, then we continue with the current law, which, as I understand it, is not tied, doesn't have incentives tied to DC revenue. When I say DC revenue, DC residents who are employed, because they can't take the money back to Annapolis, or to uh, purchases made in DC, which then, of course, works to our advantage in terms of sales tax or um, franchise tax. Um, that those are arguments for for the subtitle. Uh, again, uh, the um, discussions that I had with the committee chairman is that he thought that uh, this needed to be vetted out a little bit. Uh, a bit more, because we got into discussions about the grant program, uh, whether it be competitive, discretionary, what have you, and you know we have not uh, uh, we have not addressed those questions, um, and we um, the um, committee felt the committee chairman felt that it was worth a second look um, uh, and a more. Full, uh, under the regular hearing process. Well, I'm, you might take back to him, I'm probably going to leave this in for first reading. And um, the committee always has the ability to have a hearing quickly, which is what uh, Human Services did last year on the Homeless Services Amendment Act. Um, and of course, the committee as a whole had a hearing on the entire BSA yes. a week ago, two weeks ago. So there have been some opportunities to look at this. The, the other thing I want to say, I guess it, it's sort of compound. Um, I get that we want to encourage this as a new line of business in the district. I'm sort of looking at Jack because that's the point you were making. Yes. Um, and I also get that if we want to attract this business here to the district, that um, because everybody provides incentives, that we would have to provide incentives. But there's an equation at work, and I don't know the numbers in that equation. But, uh, you know, the incentive has got to be less than the uh, revenues that we get. Otherwise, we're just paying money. What I'm told is that there was a movie done under the original law, the same as the subtitle, in which the district did make some money. Now, my source here is the mayor's people, and I don't know the specifics. But the we actually made money on it. Really long time ago. It's not a lot of money. No, no. Uh, but we made money on it. Oh. And since then, under the current law, we haven't made money on anything. Uh, state of play, I think one was state of pl play. There, there, are two, there were three movies that were cited in a feasibility study that was funded through the film and set of fun. State of play was one. Was it Terminator? How about Dave? <laughs> no, uh, no, this is, this is re uh, the state of play and, 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 and another movie. Two lines. It was two lines where they went into Georgetown on the horse. Well, I, the, the, the title of the other movie escapes me. There was a net return on those two movies, which followed the program established in the film in Center Fun. There was a third movie, and I don't know the history of, of, of the bill, but there was legislation passed specifically on the previous administration that bypassed the conditions of the uh, Film incentive fund, and we lost money on it. And he lost money on it. Yeah. So there are three, there are three, three films provided subsidies. Two were net gains, small amounts, small amounts. Under the net language, gain. it's in the subtitle. The, under the language of the law, that I'm told is the same as the subtitle. My understanding. Uh, that's not my understanding. And I have to, I have to, uh, I'll, I'll get together with the mayor's people and okay. discuss that with them. But that was. Uh, the trade off here is not. That's all I'm saying. 
you got adult training and adult programs here and youth programs and you're going to put it into film incentives. That's that's the perverse trade-off that I can't support. And, and then we're going to move on. I think. And at a minimum, um, I think it's appropriate to strike from the recommendations the $641,000 uh, reduction from DCRA uh, because the committee never approved that. They never did. Of course, never the $500,000 transfer either, but they never approved that. And indeed, the discussion, which I remember, uh, was that if those uh, um, salary lapses uh, were allowed, that they would go to offset the money being taken from the uh, job training. And in fact, it's opposite of that. It's being added to the uh, a fund. So that's at a minimum. But in any event, the, the others, we, uh, we, I guess we can address on the dais. Uh, if I just may address, I, I think the reference to the DCRA that was made was in an effort to try and um, um, find $1.7 million out of DCRA in terms of vacancies. Those were never, uh, the, that never materialized. And um, uh, we went into the, um, what was being worked on at the time of our markup, uh, and we needed certification, was 541000 was uh, uh, $350,000 from the uh, telephone account, and 191000 is from uh, two vacant positions. That we but it was pretty do. clear, I thought, and whoever else was there can confirm, that uh, the chairman was saying that let's leave this in now, and he was going to find other money so that this money could be put back. Uh, is that not you I, there? I, I, would, I, was, I was sitting beside him, yes, ma'am. Um, the reference, I believe, was still to the $1.7 million. Uh, that, that was, I was, and following that discussion, I was interpreting that as $1.7 million. We're trying to get certified at DCRA from a number of vacancies. But in any event, the committee didn't approve that. Uh, anything else on um, the uh, Committee on Business, Consumer, and Regulatory Affairs? Just clarification. Yes. Phil, you stated you're going to support um, keeping that funding in there as it is. No, I did not say that. Okay. I don't know what I'm going to do on that. I know this issue is very important to Councilmember Orange. I'm also reading the members here that they're not feeling very supportive of the fund. Uh, but what I said was that uh, with regard to the subtitle, I'm inclined to keep the subtitle in. Um, and uh, I've said that so that uh, you can go back and talk to the council member and that issue will get clarified. Yep. We'll move on to uh, Committee on Health. Thank you, Gene. Gene, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, the Committee on Health approved the Mayor's proposed budget with the following changes to the agencies under its jurisdiction. We reallocated $2.2 million within DOH to be used as follows. $2 million to support teen pregnancy prevention programs, $150,000 for clinical nutritional home delivery services for individuals living with cancer and other life-threatening diseases, $50,000 to encourage corner stores to offer produce and to provide nutritional education, we redirected $817,000 from Department of Behavioral Health to Department of Health to be used as follows. $100,000 to support teen peer educators to provide sexual health information and condoms to other youth. $717,000, of which $517,000 is reoccurring, to prevent and address chronic disease. Redirected $1 million from healthcare finance to DC Office on Aging to enhance services provided to seniors in the district, including senior housing and community-based services accepted a transfer of $250,000 from the Committee on Transportation and Environment to support senior transportation services at DCOA. Uh, the committee approved the mayor's capital budget within the following, with the following major changes to the agencies under its jurisdiction. We directed $11,950,000 of 
Department of Healthcare Finance East End Medical Center budget as follows. $5.75 million to the Committee on Transportation and the Environment for the DPR Therapeutic Recreation Center, Hillcrest Recreation Center, and Kelly Miller Tennis Courts. $5 million to the Committee on Education for DGS for Ward 7 Application School. $1.2 million to the Committee on Economic Development for the DEMPED New Communities Project. And attempted to redirect $10 million of existing PAYGO allotment that was subsequently redirected by the Mayor um, post our um, markup. Recommend changes to the Mayor's proposed BSA include adding an Insurance Regulatory Trust Fund Bureau subtitle, which authorizes the Bureau to conduct audits and review the annual budget for the Health Benefit Exchange Authority, and add a Teen Pregnancy Prevention Fund um, establishment subtitle, which establishes a fund to provide subgrants to nonprofit organizations. Mr. Chairman. Uh, can we just get an explanation on the record about this uh, attempt to redirect $10 million. What happened with that? I know there were two, uh, there were two, I believe, two priorities that were funded by the committee with that money. Um, one, which was pretty important. I don't know about the other as much as the one. This was the money for the Humane Society that the committee had voted on $4.75 million to go for their relocation efforts, uh, which if we all know that the, the particular facility they're in right now on New York Avenue is an absolute disaster um, and from every, every aspect of it. It is district owned um, and they would like to move. They've located a spot to move. Um, this money was to go to help them to secure that land. We would retain an interest in however much money we invested in that land and then they would be able to build through private donations and continue to be the contracted uh, animal control you know, company for our city. So I just need an explanation of how this money got taken on the record um, and what on earth is this? Like, why would this happen? We have, we voted for this. The money was there and we voted and then we turn around and it's gone. Um, and I, I'm just, it really pisses me off. Can you, can you explain it maybe or somebody else? Well, you, you should be angry about it. Um, this is a problem that we have every year. Uh, this is a variation of a problem that we have every year. Uh, we've seen it in the past with regard to uh, capital dollars where a committee will um, get close to or will actually vote on moving some capital dollars and then as the budget office works with the budget and when I say works with the budget you go into the computer system to make sure that everything's balancing and that we're not doing something we can't do we find out that the dollars have been <coughs> obligated or encumbered or whatever the word is in this case um, they, um, they did, um, and they can do this without a reprogramming that comes to the council. The dollars, they were PAYGO dollars and they were swapped with GEO bond dollars. And the GEO bond dollars are not eligible for these purposes. So they basically made the money ineligible. After we and voted. We have, I had a conversation with the CFO last week, not about this 10 million, but about this kind of tactic. It also happened to us with the errata letter. The um, Education Committee had identified money from non-public tuition, which it was going to use for certain purposes. And in the errata letter, um, those dollars, which I believe were identified by the Education Committee, that is not that the executive found them and you said, oh, we'll use them for this. Rather, you found them and the executive said, oh, we don't want them. You, we don't want Mr. Catania to be able to use them. So. Um, they, uh, in the uh, errata letter, direct them to something else. Uh, the committee's action will probably be respected, and uh, therefore, however they redirect it, we'll have to figure that out. The point being that um, this is a problem we've had every year uh, where the executive has control over money, and they can make changes, and in making those changes, to what we're trying to do. Um, I talked to the CFO about it last week. He is in a uh, difficult position because he doesn't answer to us and he doesn't answer to the mayor. And uh, when the mayor is doing something the mayor is able to do, he may not be able to stop that. Um, and I intend to talk to the mayor about it directly. Well, but I, that's you know. basically what happened to the dollars. Okay. So he, he did what he's, he's allowed to do under the law. Uh, and there are other ways that, uh, I mean, this is going a little bit further, but. Uh, the whole situation with the super cans. I'm looking at Mary as if she's responsible for this, and she's not. Nice job. Good. 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 Um, 
Yeah, and uh, we had a process. The um, the contingency reserves. You were at the uh, the um, the committee of the whole hearing on May 9th, and I brought this up. Um, the super cans we adopted in the budget last year for a replacement over several years. Um, the mayor identified through reprogramming from the other post employment benefit retirement fund dollars for the super cans. The council disapproved that reprogramming. I think some folks were a little uneasy about that, but we disapproved that reprogramming. And then the mayor went to the contingency reserves, which he can do. And um, this mayor has been good about repaying the contingency reserves in the same year. So every draw from contingency reserves is addressed in the errata letter. Uh, but he doesn't have to. He can pay it back over two years, which basically reduces how much we can budget next year and the following year. And these are powers that the mayor has that the council cannot affect. Well, Mr. Chairman, you know, I appreciate that, and I and I think I understand it. And I talked to the CFO as well about this and expressed my uh, kind of discontent with the fact that this money can be moved after we do a markup. In fact. We went through a public process here. This was not just a random markup. We had testimony, we had hearings, we had lots of input from the public and the Committee on Health and uh, came to the conclusions that we came to with, that, with, a great, with a great deal of thought. And so when I turn around and I see this money being taken, I think it undermines the legislative process. It is a direct affront to the legislative branch of this government. And we should do something to make sure that those priorities are maintained in our budget in spite of what the mayor has decided to do. So um, I would argue that we should find in this budget as quickly as possible the money to replace these priorities. Um, I will advocate very strongly on behalf of the Humane Society because this is an emergency situation. This is not something that can be done next year. It's not something that can be done two years from now. It's something that has to be done this year, or I believe we will be in a very difficult situation when it comes to taking care of um, the animal control issues that we have in the District of Columbia. And people should recognize that this is different than the wildlife thing. This is, we're talking 40,000 animals a year, not a couple hundred animals a year, or 400 animals a year. This is a big deal, and if we don't want stray dogs running down the street uh, in the District of Columbia, we need to live up to our obligation here and invest in this, this particular project. Um, so hopefully the Committee of the Whole can spend some time to find this money and replace the effort that was done in the Committee on Health. I don't have the money in my pocket, but it would be nice if you could figure this out. Um, what were the two projects? One was Humane Society. There was a tennis there. foundation as well that was a priority of the committees. I don't know as much about that one. Yeah, it's the Washington Tennis and Education Foundation. David, could you explain a little further about the Humane Society project? Is this a project where they're looking at locating a new facility? That's correct. They, yes, and they're going to no. southeast actually. They're going to consolidate their other uh, their other facilities into one facility. It will free up the New York Avenue site for development. It's, it's, uh, a, it's a great project. So you're saying that the committee funded it and the mayor found a way to unfund it? That's correct. And that the mayor used He, he found city. a way to take the money so it was not eligible for the... He unfunded it. But he was able to do that through... We were all told that that project yes. could only be funded with PAYGO funds. And so we allocated the PAYGO money that we did have towards that project. When he swapped it out with GEO IT bonds, we no longer were able to de uh, devote that. For some priority that he had uh, somewhere else. So he right. did this after the committee action, after this. and he got the CFO to do his bidding to do it. The next and he did, his, did he have to go through the CFO? No, he didn't have to. Well, everything goes through the CFO. He didn't have to go through the CFO. He has the ability to. Um, he has the ability to redesignate capital dollars. Actually, it's, it's incredibly important. Mary? Yes, I, I wanted to bring this up as well. If anybody has been over to that facility, it's it's a total mess. It's been kept together with bubble gum and <coughs> tape, basically. And, uh, and David's right. The number of animals that go through there every year are in the thousands and thousands. And so it's a critical facility for the district, for public health. And so I, I don't know what the justification for this was, but this is really wrong-headed. My question is this. Is there no way, Phil, uh, on an emergency basis or something where we can, in some sense, get the money back? There's just, like, no way that we can, nothing? 
<laughs> we can do to like get how he's looking at me. Um, I have a trick up my sleeve from the uh, Washington Humane Society. Okay, and then failing that, um, can we attempt to look elsewhere? I mean, I will certainly scrub things a bit, and we could all chip in. But I'll wait for your trick. I, I'm mm -hmm. hoping for the trick. Um, How much more is up that sleeve? Yeah. <laughs> To separate it out, how much um, is for the tennis? There's five million five. to sleep for that trick. Okay. Um, and five million for the. You might just well, the tennis center is more of a problem, as I understand. That's on federal land, and so it's an earmark to a uh, earmark to oh, okay. a uh, specific uh, organization. That's more problematic. And my sense from members and my sense from my time on the council is that the council is very sympathetic to the Humane Society. There's, I, I can't imagine there's anybody who's opposed to our trying to help the Humane Society. Oh, and then David mentioned, well, this is not the wildlife thing, which it certainly is not. But I will tell you, they have wildlife there, in a sense. I've been over there. They have an extraordinary number of rats living in the ceiling. They sometimes drop down from the ceiling into rough places. The place is a complete Disaster. mess. Um, right. Now these rats, they were, they were eating you. Thank you, David. Let me add this as well. And I'm looking at David Grasso just because we were arguing about this, arguing for this. Um, there probably has to be a BSA subtitle that accompanies this. These are capital dollars, even though they're PAYGO dollars. And um, I'm... Um, and even if we were to use operating dollars, this would still be for capital purpose. And uh, the district has got to have an interest in it. And uh, my understanding is that the property doesn't cost $5 million. It costs more than $5 million. It's about $6.8 million for the property that they're looking at. So we, um, we, uh, we just have to make sure that the, there's BSA language that ensures that we have an interest in this And property. I spoke to the Humane Society about this, and they are they're ready to work that deal out to make sure we have the same interests that we have put in there. Yeah. If for some reason they're not our vendor down the road in 20 or 30 years, uh, we have to have a retained interest in the value that we put in uh, to the property itself. And yes. so that's what we would do. And, yes. But we have to put that into the BSA somehow, and we need to work with them to make that happen. Um, okay. Is there uh, anybody else wants to speak on um, health? There you go. I have a, did you want to, uh, I had a couple of things. Um, one is I'm just going to repeat the point because I think this may apply, maybe not with regard to the pregnancy prevention programs. We can't do earmarks and the language that we do and that we've done in the past is that basically the dollars are available and they have to be competitively um, bid. And I recognize that there's maybe one organization in the district that does, does a great work with regard to preg um, pregnancy prevention. And the other um, is that uh, the uh, $1.2 million for new communities, to DEMPED for new communities, my understanding is that that's for a specific project. And um, that's, uh, I've heard objections about that from a number of sources. This is the development that was completed a couple of years ago on Nanny Helen Burroughs Road Avenue. And uh, we've already put a million dollars into that project after the fact. It was a private developer. He's basically looking for us to bail him out after the fact. And that's uh, problematic. <laughs> I know that's the argument that the developer makes, that somehow it's our fault. But developers are responsible for their economics and not to, um, not to screw up their economics and then ask the city to bail them out. We gave them an $800,000 loan after the project was completed. Then we converted that to a grant. We gave them another $200,000 last year. Oh, they're doing great. Uh, and each time we thought that was the total amount that was necessary. No, I think that there was some, um, some change in, involving wage rates. So the, the initial fix was I know that's the argument fix. now, but, um, you know, a developer I don't need to say this to you like this. No, I a developer, know. what a developer does, among other things, is, is figure out the economics of a deal. This guy was an electrician. 
or had an electrical company, and he absolutely he tried to do a good thing in building a uh, affordable housing project. He put up his own business as security. Uh, the project cost much more than he thought it would cost, and uh, he's in economic difficulty. But to come to us to bail him out specifically is uh, a very, very bad practice for the government or for the council. And this is not new housing. This is not a new project. This is not something going forward. It is a new project. No, it's done. No, it's done. But it's new. It's, it's part of the new community. Who is, who is this, by the way? It is uh, the Nanny Helen Burroughs. Yeah. Um, it's a project who? by AWASH. AWASH. Who? AWASH. Um, is that a name of the company? Anthony AWASH. Why are we bailing people out if they make mistakes? I don't know. I don't know the details of the agreement, but it was an agreement made several years ago. Yeah. The data is made from what you were miscalculated the numbers that were provided, um, and the negotiations with Dempet, um, and there was some back and forth between Dempet. He decided to forego part of his uh, developer fee uh, under the good faith talks that they would, you know, we come back and, and kind of rectify it after the fact. Um, this is the only affordable housing project that's been done in Ward 7 uh, that had, with new communities. There's 23 new communities families in there. It's 100% affordable housing, 77 units. There's a career enrichment center there uh, with programs that are ongoing. But the building right now is pretty much operating pretty when much at a loss. I'm sorry. Just sure. When he was uh, submitting his proposal for us, he failed to include the Davis-Bacon wages were miscalculated. Um, and, and that's uh, that suggests no one is responsible. They didn't, who miscalculated the numbers? It's my belief that the, the numbers were provided to him from Dimpad, certain numbers. There was uh, the Davis Bacon wages kick in once you hit four stories. This building is, I believe, four stories. The numbers that he was provided calculated at below the four story rate. And that's. But if this was an issue, why wasn't this an issue last year when we did the 200,000? If this was an issue, why wasn't it raised two years ago when we did 800,000? It's very tricky if we start um, essentially indemnifying people for their own mistakes. Whether or not Dimpad provided him with, you know, I mean, he if he is going to participate in a process, you know, and I'm, I'm sympathetic, but we can't indemnify people for their own mistakes. We just can't. He should know. I'm not inclined. Anthony Walsh. And what I hear is that, A, he's a very nice guy. B, he tried to do a very nice thing. Um, C, that the building is a very nice building, and D, that he is uh, hurting economically, and his company, I don't even know that his company is still in business, his electrical company, because he put his barely. company up as, uh, for security. It's barely still in business. And I think, you know, all of that is really unfortunate, but, uh, uh, and I've raised this issue with regard to other economic development projects, some of them going forward, which is uh, is the role of the government to act as indemnifier, to use uh, David's language? Or when people take a risk, do they take a risk? Hmm? Oh, was there anything else on uh, from members on um, health? Can you just answer what the, the impact is if we don't give the money to the SNEAP communities? I mean, what is the impact? Is what it would happen? New communities or it's basically the impact. It's, it is new communities. So yes, I mean, it was it was funded out of new communities to for replacement units from Lincoln Heights. I think the original deal must be four years old. Was that not right? Yeah. It's about about four years old. So the the units have delivered last year, I think. The units so the the units are already delivered. I think the units are the, all yeah, all the all At least a year ago, I think. So the Davis Bacon thing is a reach back? The yes. Davis Bacon uh, thing came after, or uh, before the units okay. delivered, so or the, before the project was completed. How did that come about? How did he find out? Was he paying Davis Bacon wages at the time of construction? 
or did he fail to pay vacant wages and he had a Department of Labor investigation? No, I don't think so. I think he found, I think it became clear after he made an agreement with the government that they didn't calculate the right wage. And, I, you know, there's this, this open question about whether Davis Bacon applies to certain economic development projects. He did pay. He did pay. He did pay. Yes, he did pay. So what he's asking for is to be made full. Yes. Um, why would he, you know, and let me, if I, if I could, if, if in the midst of construction, he realizes that he's paying something that he's not going to get uh, compensated for, why did he proceed with construction? Why didn't he exercise rights that exist under construction contracts to, uh, to, to halt construction, to seek some kind of a remedy? Uh, at that point. I think that they were negotiating. This is this goes yeah. back I to mean, the we've, we've had countless meetings with the Hoskins and Before and that, though, because yeah. I think this went back to Kwame was here. Right. So he took a chance uh, that somehow, some way, somebody would make up the mistake, and it he got it wrong. To be, to be honest, yes, he did, and, and he wanted to get the project done. He, he wanted to make sure that he built this building and provide that for the folks to be here. He was going to see it through. There's nothing else on the um, committee. The committee did approve it. The, I think it came out of health. So, um, right, we're going to move on to um, the committee as a whole. That's the last committee. And uh, something to just the uh, power of um, you all were present at the Committee of the Whole last week. We made very few changes with regard to the agencies under the Committee of the Whole. We added uh, $300,000 and two FTEs to the Contract Appeals Board. We took that $300,000 from the Office of Contracting and Procurement uh, in salary lapse. I met with the Director of OCP uh, yesterday, I believe, and he raised no concerns with regard to his budget. Um, the um, Innovation Fund, uh, the $15 million for 2015, the mayor redirected all of that in his errata letter, and so we, we zeroed that out in our markup. Uh, we reallocated $175,000 in capital funds from the council to the, re to the Office of Zoning for rewriting the zoning regulations. Uh, it's an IT project that's capital eligible. It was not funded. And I think members remember the debate. We transferred $250,000 for Emancipation Day activities from the council to the executive office of the mayor. Uh, with regard to Emancipation Day, I do want to circulate this just so that because the issue came up, although we didn't really discuss it on the amount, and I'm not proposing here to change the amount, the transfer was 250 And actually what I propose is that we have a subtitle that, among other things, says that agency costs have to be absorbed. This is an average of what was spent in the last two years on Emancipation Day. And um, if, if the total is $343,000, if you cut the concert in half, so that the concert costs $50,000, and you eliminate the agency costs, say that the agencies have to absorb it, um, you uh, come in within $250,000. And the reason why I put this together was so that members could see that there are components to the Emancipation Day celebration that can be um, added or subtracted. And that affects, of course, what the cost is. So I would certainly want to see a parade because I think that's an important part of the celebration. But if you want to reduce the cost by $40,000, eliminate the parade. Um, I'm just saying, for an example, the. Um, and I'm not proposing to do anything with this. I just wanted to circulate this to members so that you understand, have a better understanding of the cost. So what we're going to try to do is in the BSA have a subtitle that says the agency costs are absorbed. So that is no longer an issue with regard to the money we're transferring. And um, I will also work with Councilmember Orange with regard to ensuring that there is um, collaboration with the council. Are there any questions concerning the COW um, markup? Bill? Yes. You're proposing changes, moving um, budgets around for personnel and uh, for the council personnel for next year? Yes. 
Um, I don't think I have those notes in front of me. We're um, adding an FTE for a contract uh, analyst in the Office of the Budget, adding an FTE for an attorney to work on code revision and statutes at large in the General Counsel's Office. Members who chair committees will see no change. There will be a shift, though, of one person from committee to personal. Members who do not have a committee chair uh, will see uh, where they had, actually, most of them, I think, have had add-ons this year, but technically there were add-ons. Um, the add-ons will go away, and they'll see one additional person. So I forget what the many numbers are. Six and four. Seven. Seven, including the member on the personal staff. And four. So you, you so have. It's seven and four. Yeah. yeah. If, you the if you count the council members, yeah. so it's six and four. Yeah, and right now it's been five and five. And members may not know that. I've asked the secretary at some point give members. We used to get a breakdown that was um, okay. person. There's, a, there's kind of a budget. And the budget's for five people and dollars assigned to each person. And uh, the secretary doesn't distribute that monthly, but I've asked that she do that again at some point so that you all are reminded that there is some rationality behind this. Okay. Anything else on Community of the Whole? Uh, are there, are, is there anything that members want to bring up with regard to the Budget Support Act? Or do we want to meet tomorrow to talk about the Budget Support Act? The Budget Support Act. Yes. Well, there's a, for full disclosure, it's a Ward 6 business, but it brings up an issue of, um, of the sustainability of the city, and that is that we've got one last aggregate plant that remains in the city. And what this plant does is that when we take a building down, it crushes up the material into little rocks, and then when we do things like fill potholes, you mix tar with little rocks and you fill up the holes. Or if you build a building, you use the crushed aggregate for that. And what it does is it enables us to do that in the city instead of having to truck all the material out and then have to truck all the material in, which has, again, a sustainable impact. This um, plant, which can operate on a brownfield, it's fairly versatile, but the plant is Florida, well, it's, I think it's, D, is it Florida Rock or D.C. Rock? I don't think it's Florida Rock, it's D.C. Rock. Uh, I think it's Florida Rock down in um, Puzzix Point. All right, so it's Florida Rock. They're being displaced because of the end of South Capitol Bridge. Things are moving around. I think they're on um, Guy Stewart's property down there. So it doesn't necessarily mean that I would want to write anything that specifically says help this business, but it does mean that um, that we ought to have, I think, an aggregate plant. Just like it's not exactly the same, but it's just like we have one at Fort Totten. Do we? I think there is one up there, and that's not to say that we shouldn't have them. I mean, that's the issue with industrial zoning, and Kenyon's been looking at that in Ward Five. Right, right uh, on the CSX. Oh, right on the CSX. Uh, I'll, I'll do the, the yeah, background, but I thought this was the last one. Well, but the point is that you want them in the city. It's like a hotel has to have a back office. You you want you need industrial, you need warehouses and aggregate plants in in the city. Just that my understanding, and let me verify it, is that this was the last one, and so it would be guarantee us that we'd have to truck this stuff out and truck this stuff in which is not good for our roads, not good for our air, it just moves us away from being a sustainable city. Just one of the pieces. Um, I don't know if this is appropriate at all for the Budget Support Act, but I do think that it's, um, it could be an issue for us, and I kind of want to get a sense of what you guys think. Well, what would you propose? I would propose saying that, um, that a site be found that D.C. finds a site for um, being able to have an aggregate plant within D.C. Um, well, we could do that. It would be directing the deputy mayor or the mayor to um, give this some attention. That, that's what it would be. And you can report back. You could have a reporting deadline. 
Okay. What, what exactly is an aggregate plant, you know, Tom? Again, it's like when you take down a, a, a large building that you bring the big stuff there and it breaks it up into, you know, separates materials. It's a really technical explanation. It takes big stuff into big stuff. Construction debris? No, they keep um, water on top of it. And so what it means is that you don't truck it all out of the district. And then you have rock from that, or aggregate. And the aggregate is used as the base of buildings, base of roads. It's used for um, filling potholes. We use it. Well. We use it. We should maybe need more of it for filling potholes. But um, we, it avoids having to truck this stuff in, which does come through Ward 5, obviously. So just, just for a record, though, you know, I would love to visit the site where it is currently. Yep. But you know that in Ward 5, we had our issues with industrial land and, and the, the businesses associated with that. In some cases, nuisance businesses associated with industrial properties. And I've been working over the last year and some months on the Industrial Land Transformation Task Force to make recommendations for attracting different kinds of businesses. Now, I will say that I, I understand where you're coming from that suggests that it's being, potentially being displaced, but then there's also a scrapyard down at the site for where uh, the proposed soccer stadium would be that's going to be displaced. And if all these places uh, need to be relocated, uh, they're going to be looking for other, other industrial areas. Uh, and that presents problems, potential problems for War 5. Well, definitely. The degree to which we have a sustainable city, some of these things have to be considered. There's just the last plant. We've displaced all the others, apparently. Maybe not if there's one at Fort Totten. Just one at Fort Totten. On Fort Totten Drive. Yeah. Well, I, don't they, they, I don't know if they pounded well, the well, rock well, out. Well, this is a recycle, recyclable aggregate plant. And are there any potential sites in War 6? Well, f first thing is, is that, you know, when we had the stuff at the strip clubs, you're exactly right. I brought it up for Ward 6. Let's zone Ward 6 be part of this. We're looking all over Ward 6 for this. I've really tried to move it down to a brownfield site, but th it's not going to work. The um, one site that had been looked at is out by um, Blue Plains that, um, because it doesn't take a whole lot of room, and it, and it can be used, again, on top of a... Um, of a brownfield site. So it, it works pretty well. But the problem is Pepco needed more land than what was expected. Now, if you want me to to um, annex part of Ward 5 and Ward 6 so that that it's of industrial land, if that's the yeah, way to do to it. We have to unpopulated. Otherwise, we have to do redistricting and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, if you have some unpopulated land, it doesn't have to be contiguous. Then um, you want to transfer to Ward Six? Happy to do it. Yes. But um, I don't think just because of political boundaries, political boundaries cannot determine all the zoning for the city. I'm not going to argue that with you right now, Kenyon. But I do think that we need to have a sustain sustainability issues for the city, and that running these trucks over our roads with this much weight and with this frequency has a negative impact on the whole city. But to, to have them run over roads that have already been run over by other trucks in other parts of the city is another issue that I think we need to be considerate of as we contemplate what you're proposing. That's all I'm suggesting really? is that there, there is a war five that already I can't help it if, if all the new trucks carrying the aggregate go out New York Avenue in order to search for no, the I'm aggregate. I'm talking about the, 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 the concrete and other um, the, the, the businesses that already exist like off of Fort Totten Drive, the, the the heavy uh, equipment from the salt domes and snow removal that's already over in Brentwood Road, the, the dump trucks and trash trucks that are already going to Brentwood Road and over to uh, Queen's Chapel in, in, in Langdon. Uh, it's a huge issue. Uh, and and if you want to go to one of the Civic Association I'm meetings. I'm not proposing Ward 5. Initially, a site was found elsewhere. But I do think, again, that um, we do have some things in the city that contribute to keeping our, our city a better city. Yeah. Um, and we'll draft some language. Okay. And um, that reminds me. I'm and I'd love to see it, if it's okay. At some point. Show it to everybody except Ken. Yeah. <laughs> For the record, absolutely. Um, show it to Ken and not anybody else. The, um, I meant to ask this earlier. The uh, Judiciary Committee in years past 
has had a subtitle in the BSA regarding fire and EMS overtime. <laughs> Why did you not include that this year? I'm just surprised it took so long for you to bring that up. The issue that Phil brought up is a um, cap on how much money an individual can earn in overtime per month at, in fire and EMS. And so I've talked to the, the rank and file, I've talked to the leadership of the fire department. They say that this is a problem. Removing the cap on the individuals will be the help to the function of the agency. There's no savings. I mean, there's no budget impact by, by this um, BSA language that you put in there. So it's re revenue neutral. It does not increase the amount of overtime used. It's just who can do the overtime. So currently what happens is that if, you, if someone doesn't show up from work or for work because they're sick or otherwise, the chief has to hold people over. And so if someone says, look, I'd like to work some extra overtime, but they've reached their cap, they don't have that option to do it. And so it goes really, especially um, around the summer areas where, you know, but this, or the summertime is most difficult. I realize this doesn't help with this summer. But um, it's, um, well, let me tell you why it's been in there. Uh, there's been a lot of abuse around overtime. And I believe the reality is in fire and EMS that there are certain people who figure out how they can maximize the overtime that they earn. Um, Phil, I inherited that problem with the maintenance repair shop. We had a couple of folks, including one guy, where this did not apply, made $97,000 in overtime on top of a $57,000 salary. Correct. He was persistent enough with three or four folks doing that. I referred it to the IG's office, and through oversight, I changed that abuse. I don't think that it needs to be a legislated fix. I think that it can be done through oversight. Well, we did a legislative fix because in spite of our having, as some people like to remind me, monthly hearings on overtime, uh, there continued to be abuse in fire and EMS. This was under the f previous fire chief. But it happened under the previous fire chief because there is, this, there is an attitude within fire and EMS uh, among the firefighters that some of them can uh, rack up enormous mm -hmm. overtime. And what we saw was that, for example, there were battalion chiefs, now that's clearly management, who were earning overtime and thousands and thousands of dollars of overtime. And in my view, management should not be receiving overtime. And then there were people who were sick during a pay period and then getting overtime on top of that. And remember, these folks work, uh, what is it, eight days a month? And yet they were able to figure out how to get be sick in their, during their, their week and still get overtime. And um, so we put those limitations in there to prevent that abuse and to force the chief to spread around the overtime. And I believe that without those restrictions, we will go back because this is the attitude in many of the firehouses. Because remember, a lot of this is done, the time attendant, all that's done and the picking up overtime is done uh, by the captain in the firehouse. Uh, without those limitations, we will we will see going back to the old practices of a few people who are just specializing in overtime. Some overtime <coughs> is necessary, but we also saw that without the limitation, that that department was going way over its budget in terms of uh, overtime. And it could do that, and you'll appreciate this, Tommy, because they had a large number of vacancies. And so they had vacancy savings, which I understand the CFO would not let you take. and. Um, but they will use those vacancy savings to, uh, to uh, offset the overtime. And so we saw a $6 million budget for overtime that was uh, being spent at $13 million, $13 million, $1.2 million in one pay period uh, when there was a snowstorm, because everybody had to work 24-hour <coughs> shift overtime. Um, and a lot of that went away with this subtitle restriction. That's why I think it's important. You know, in connection with what you're saying, I don't understand then how it could be revenue neutral. Isn't it an incentive to maximize your overtime so that it wouldn't be revenue neutral? In other words, we would be actually paying more in overtime? Well, according to, um, you know, the budget folks, and I defer to anyone else with, that knows more about the budget, leaving it out because there's no budget 
for this, leaving this out, is revenue neutral. That's technically correct, but it does reduce their overspending in that category. They're not budgeted to overspend in the category. Of course they're not budgeted to overspend in the category. But by having those limitations, it's harder for them to overspend. Would you be willing to... The point I didn't make, which was that um, fire and EMS is... The, 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 uh, the sworn agencies are a little bit different than the rest of the world with regard to overtime. They get straight time for part of the time over 80 hours that they work. I believe they, at 205 or 215 hours in a pay period, which is two weeks, they then get time and a half. And so this, there was also in that subtitle, title, a limitation, so that nobody could go over that. I think it was a 205, 200 what? 204 hours. Well, currently what's happening in terms of a demoralized D.C. Fire and EMS is that people are being involuntarily held over to force to work overtime. It's not easy to do in other agencies, but an involuntary mandatory service agency like this you can do that. So someone reaches the ends of their shift, like a paramedic, and if there's not someone else, if the other paramedics have maximized their overtime, then you just tell them you've got to work another shift. It's dangerous, it's demoralizing, and um, we've got a demoralized department. So this is a management tool. When used right, it certainly can, an agency can run better. I'd be willing to work with you to come up with a fine tuning that if you've had, if you're taking sick leave, if you're um, at a certain level, battalion chief or something like that. But I think just a blanket, no one can work over this amount, really um, because again, it's really how many agencies where they say, I'm sorry, it's the end of the day, but you have to stay another shift. Well, they do the corrections Right. And they cancel. But you know, it's committee staff. The solution to the management issue is management. I agree. We changed the management at the Department of Correction and the force drafting ended. I agree with you, it's a management issue. Okay. This is a blunt instrument by the council that's demoralizing to the well, agency. My staff will be happy to work with your staff. Is there anything else on the Budget Support Act, Jack, that you want to bring up anything? No. No, I'd like to call. Who's the rules to close the meeting? Um, well, we won't meet tomorrow, if unless members want to. Is there any other business? Um, we're going to circulate on Tuesday the 27th. And uh, even though there may possibly be two readings on the Budget Request Act, members should be looking at Wednesday as being the final vote. And um, the BSA will come up for first reading on Wednesday as well. And uh, between now and then, the budget office is working overtime without getting time to hand. They're being forced. We're circulating on Tuesday. Being forced yeah. to work overtime? Yes. So how do we know what you're going to do? Well, we'll have, like, overnight to figure it out. Yeah. We'll have an hour to see. We were hoping you would bring a fresh start. We were hoping you would bring a fresh start. We were hoping you would bring a fresh start. 10 o'clock in the morning to vote. Well, I, I told you. We have 24 hours. At least. We will try. You and I are going to work out. What I said was that my staff will work with your staff. Well, this was fun, everybody.